with the chest, and use that key to open the padlock. And then lifted the heavy lid of that chest, and inside the chest, was the most beautiful gem. And they took that gem, but as they did, so something appeared before them. It looked almost like a ghost, but they had this sense that this was a projection somehow created by whoever left this gem here. And the ghostly person told them that they're going to have to make a decision between wealth and happiness. They'll have to make a decision between focusing on wanting to take that gem and to be granted access to vast amounts of wealth. But that would come with a price. Or to leave that gem where it is. And have access to a book of knowledge that will share with them how to gain happiness. And they are a treasure hunter. They came for this treasure. They didn't know what other treasure, what other wealth they might be presented with. And just as the apparition finished speaking, so the wall at the side of this cave slid down to reveal vast amounts of gold coins, an entire chamber full of gold coins. offering them more wealth than they could possibly carry out of here. But what they saw in that chamber wasn't just gold coins, but what looked like some skeletons of people who perhaps had chosen the wealth before. And they had no explanation one way or the other about why those skeletons are there. And they didn't know what decision they should make should they take this gold. They were thinking to themselves that just because some people struggle with all this wealth doesn't mean that they would become corrupted by the wealth, or that they would have their sole focus on the money. And they wondered what the catch was. And as they wondered, they just had this sense that there must be a greater catch than just being able to leave here with all this wealth. And so they decided that the fun of being a treasure hunter isn't in finding the treasure and turning that treasure into money. It's in the hunt for the treasure, the excitement of solving clues, the journey is far more fun than the destination. They thought about their experiences and how the destination each time 
has been to get an object, or some gold, or some rare stones, to take that back with them, to cash it in, get some money, and there's no real emotional reward for it. It always ends up seeming anticlimactic. So they decide that there's obviously a catch here and that the journey is more fun than the destination. And so they place the gem back in the chest. They close that chest and lock the chest. And the wall raises up again and seals. And then another wall drops down and reveals a plinth with a book on it. And they go over to that book. And they open the book. And it just says, you found the path to happiness. And they turn the page and it says, you found the path to happiness. They turn the page and it says you found the path to happiness. And on the very last page, there's just a mirror on the inside back cover. They can just see themselves in that mirror. And they close that book, smile. Put it down on the plinth again. And as they leave this cave, so that cave wall closes up again, they take the key back where they found it, place it back in place for the next person who's curious, and leave the cave knowing they have this story to tell and they can continue enjoying the journey and moving on to the next treasure to find. And the woman closes her book there and decides to stop reading for a while and to allow her eyes to close and relax and just drift into a meditation for a little bit, to relax in a meditation before she gets on with the rest of her day. And she likes to take a 20 minute meditation before continuing with her day. And as she drifts into this meditation, So she begins to have this sense of viewing a world, viewing a world where she can see some mice playing in a field, just really tiny little mice, and she feels how cute those mice are, just playing in a field. And she watches them as they scurry around, playing, jumping, climbing, wheat, having something to eat. And as she has a sense of viewing this world, so she notices around the field there are other animals. There's some birds that land in the field and take off and flock together and fly, making the most beautiful patterns in the sky, managing to fly with such synchrony. And some rabbits just eating grass around the outside of the field. And 
she has this sense of almost transcending reality for a while, almost stepping outside of herself, of space and time, as if she can move herself to view different moments here and now. And she floats above the countryside and enjoys watching how nature seems to all just work together, seems to just fit together. How the different animals seem to just go about their business, how none of them are worrying about the past or the future. How when everything's working right, none of the animals seem to be particularly stressed as they go about their day-to-day -day lives. And she watches as plants grow, as trees grow, as seasons come and go, hovering over her landscape that's so familiar to her. knowing that this meditation is helping to teach her to be able to make the best of each day, to be able to enjoy life to the full, and to be who she wants to be, and how she wants to be. And she has this sense of almost floating above the environment, watching how things come and go, seasons change, and she notices a chessboard floating in space, and almost psychically moves the pieces around the board, and notices the opposing pieces moving in synchrony as if her mind is practicing, learning to put patterns in place, learning what moves to make in life, and how to adapt to changes that occur in life. And then after 20 minutes or so of having a meditation, She gradually drifts back to the room, ready to carry on with her day. And that evening, like every evening, she goes to bed, allows her mind to focus on pleasant thoughts. She allows those pleasant thoughts to develop, paying attention to what she can see hear and feel in those pleasant thoughts as her breathing relaxes and she becomes more still and drifts and floats so comfortably relaxed asleep okay so as you listen to this story, just take a moment to close your eyes, allow yourself to get comfortable, and begin to relax. And I don't know whether you'll drift off asleep faster with the spaces between my words or with the sound of my words. And as you listen to me talk in the background, so you can relax and drift asleep. So this is a story about a woman who's travelling across the Arctic. It's something that she's always wanted to do. She's always seen it as something that would challenge her. Something that would give her a sense of accomplishment. And she also liked the idea of being out 
in nature. She liked the idea of being able to see the northern lights. And to test her abilities. So as this woman was travelling. And so one morning this woman woke up in her tent. And she could hear the sides of the tent flapping and vibrating in the wind. She could hear the sound of that wind outside the tent. She could notice the way the snow was packed up part way up the side of the tent. While she lay in that tent, in a sleeping bag, wrapped up so comfortable, so warm, with the light just right, illuminating that tent as the sun shines through the tent. And after getting ready for the morning, she opens the tent, pushes out through the snow, walks out into that snow. She clears the snow away from in front of the tent, builds the snow up a little bit around the edge, stopping the wind from blowing directly into the tent. creating a wall of snow, directing that wind up and over the tent. And she has a special camping stove which she uses to make herself some food and have a warm drink as she relaxes in the entrance to the tent enjoying that food and drink before clearing everything away, packing it all away, ready to continue her journey. And she packs it all away, puts it on the back of a trailer being towed by the snowmobile. gets on to that snowmobile and travels following the compass in the direction she's heading and as she heads along so she notices that out here most of what she sees around her is just snow in whatever direction she looks it was a few days earlier where she last passed trees. And she often finds herself thinking back to the pine forests. To how much calmer the wind was back then. But she's aware that she's making this journey to achieve something for herself. And she's doing this journey on her own, but a few times every day, she uses a satellite phone to contact people, let them know her progress, let them know she's okay. She also has GPS tracker on her and knows that people can monitor her on their computers. They can see where she is, what progress she's making. They can monitor the weather. They can give her updates as she needs them. And as she continues traveling, so she plans on going straight through the North Pole and then straight over to go the other side. 
and most of her journey is made on this snowmobile. And so she continues her journey, crossing that snow. And currently, the sun doesn't stay up. And as she crosses that snow, so she thinks about the journey she's had so far. She thinks about other experiences. She often finds herself thinking about being with friends in coffee shops. Thinking about wandering around parks. Thinking about quite mundane things that she's missing out on while she's out here. Things which, when everything is just so white and plain, she happens to end up missing. Things she never would have thought of missing and never would have necessarily said if someone said, what would you miss if you went travelling? And as she continues, so the sun begins to set again. And she's been travelling for many hours. And as the sun sets, so she sets up camp again. She sets up a tent. And she packs some snow around the tent. To help insulate the tent. And she faces the entrance to the tent. The opposite direction to the wind. And she goes into her tent. And she's surprised at how quiet it is. When she enters the tent. And that she gets so used to the volume of the wind, of all the sounds outside, that she's travelling along thinking that it's quiet because there's nothing around. And yet actually, there's a lot of noise given off. Yet actually, there's a lot of noise and you only notice that difference when you change environments. You get so used to one thing that you stop noticing it. And she relaxes down in that tent. And before she closes the tent and settles down fully, she makes herself some food, some drink on her stove. She then closes that tent, lies back, wrapped up in a sleeping bag, closes her eyes and just listens to the sounds, the sound of the wind on the tent. And after a little while, still wrapped in her sleeping bag. The sun has long set. And so she decides just to have a peek out at the northern lights. She opens the tent a little bit and gazes out and up at the lights in the sky sight of the occasional shooting star and she notices how the wind has really died down now how everything seems so calm so relaxed almost like you could probably hear a pin drop a mile away Everything has become incredibly quiet. 
with no wind and no sounds at all other than any sounds that she makes when she moves and there are no street lights there's no other artificial lights so the only light here is the light from the stars, from the aurora. And she has this feeling almost like she can hear the aurora moving. And after many days of travelling, passing through the North Pole, travelling on beyond the North Pole, She eventually starts to see the occasional tree and then a few more trees and a bit more life. And she continues to travel to a small town and this is as far as she can go with her snowmobile. So she leaves her snowmobile at this town she takes her inflatable raft off the back of the snowmobile. She inflates that with air. She puts her belongings into the raft. And she has to row across a few miles to the next bit of land. And in the morning she sets off and starts rowing across that bit of ocean and she's pleased with how calm everything is, how calm the wind is, how calm the ocean is, just hearing the sloshing of the water against the underside of the raft. that scooping sound as she rows through the water. And she thinks to herself about how thick that water feels with those oars. That this cold water feels quite thick to push through. And she quite likes that fresh sea smell that this ice cold water produces. And as she moves further away from the shore into that still water, She notices the back of a whale and hears the outbreath of that whale and can smell that slight fish smell from that whale just slightly off in the distance. And she watches as the whale seems to swim closer turns slightly on its side as if to investigate her, dives down under the boat, pops up the other side, swims off a little way, before diving down out of sight. And she notices just stillness again, and looking around, there's the light blue sky, an almost perfectly reflective ocean. And then suddenly, halfway between her and the horizon, she sees that whale leap up out of the water turn sideways and splash down into the water. 
and a little while later she sees it pop its head up and then back down again. And she watches with interest as she continues to row, watching that whale. And then she sees another whale join it. And she thinks to herself that she bets that under the water now there'd be that whale song which she finds so relaxing. And she continues to row towards the shore. And when she eventually reaches the shore, it's a rocky shore with a pine forest, a dense pine forest, going almost all the way to the water's edge. And the water's so calm, it's just lapping incredibly gently on the stones at the edge of the shore. She rows that raft up onto the shore so that she can jump out of the front of the raft and pull it up onto the shore even further. She then takes all her stuff out of the raft and starts letting that raft down. And she has to make the rest of this journey on foot. So she needs to take the time to let that raft down fully, to make it as small, as compact as possible. And she only has limited supplies on her for this last leg of her journey. She has a backpack that's almost as large as she is. And the raft is attached to the bottom of that backpack. The oars to the sides. And the backpack fits so comfortably and is weighted just right. that she feels very comfortable walking with that backpack on her back. And she pushes through the pine forest. She's been rowing hard for most of the day. So what she wants to do is find a bit of a clearing so that she can set up a camp and rest for the night. And so as she pushes through that pine forest, she can hear the birds in the forest, hear the rustling leaves, hear each of her footsteps. She can smell that pine smell. And she pushes through until she finds a clearing. And in the clearing she sets up her tent. She sets up her stove. She relaxes in that tent, just sitting in the entrance of the tent. She makes herself some food and some drink. And watches as the sun sets. And the most beautiful night sky appears. Arching over the pine forest. And there's far less snow here. And yet it's still really cold. And after eating some food and drink. And relaxing for a bit, just enjoying the view. She tucks herself into her tent, closes the tent, and just relaxes in that tent, 
begin to drift and float comfortably asleep. And as she drifts off asleep, so she has the most beautiful dreams, the most calming and relaxing dreams. And during the night, She awakens once or twice, and in the morning, she awakens feeling so refreshed, so peaceful. She leaves the tent, has something to eat and drink, packs that tent away. She takes a moment to look around at where she'd camped for the night. So take a proper look at this area, at this tiny meadowy area, with hardy plants and grasses, and the pine forests circling this area. And she then just looks at the direction she has to travel and continues her journey. And she travels down out of this area back into the pine forest. She knows this is the last leg of her journey. To make it through this pine forest to a nearby town. And she set off from another pine forest days earlier. She's travelled up to the North Pole, through the North Pole, crossed the ocean, and is now travelling through this pine forest to get to her destination. And she's looking forward to arriving at that destination. Looking forward to completing her trek. And as she makes this final bit of trek, so she finds her mind wandering to different elements of the experience different things she's had to overcome, achieve, times she's had to push on, even when she'd want to quit. She focused on her strengths, what she's been proud of during this journey. And as this day draws to an end, so in the distance she can see the lights of a small town. And this spurs her on to keep going for this last leg of the journey. And as she arrives at that town, she's struck by how beautiful this town is. She thinks it looks like a winter postcard with the most beautiful lights in the dark. And she walks into that town. And she finds the hotel in this town, where she's due to check in. She checks in at that hotel, places all her belongings down in the room, The first thing she thinks is about how warm this room is, that she hadn't really noticed how cold she had been. She'd been comfortable, but didn't realise that she was still cold, compared to being in this room, which had a real log fire in the corner, crackling away. 
She could feel that warmth of the fire on her cheeks. She could feel her cheeks going red with that warmth. She warmed her hands, warmed her feet and sat down for a little while in her room before heading down heading to a nearby restaurant grabbing something to eat and eating a proper meal for the first time in days and really savouring that meal and having a drink with that meal and really savouring that drink and appreciating what she was eating and drinking being proud of herself for her accomplishments and she contacts people, lets them all know she's okay, she's made it to the destination but what she's really doing is looking forward to going to bed to sleeping in a proper bed for the first time in days. She knows that she's going to be collected and taken home in a couple of days time. So for now she decides to enjoy the experience of being in that hotel, that comfortable room, the great food, just exploring this town and so she goes to bed rests down in that bed feels how comfortable that real bed is compared to lying on something solid for the last few days sinking her head comfortably into the pillow and the warmth of that room and she drifts and floats comfortably and relaxed asleep so take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to relax, I'm just going to tell this sleep meditation in the background. And it's a sleep meditation about a man who wakes up one day to the sound of the grandfather clock downstairs chiming at 8 a.m. and every morning with the sound of that chiming he gets up he gets straight out of bed and he heads downstairs and as he heads downstairs so he hears the ticking of that grandfather clock And he always tries to get downstairs near the clock before all eight chimes have sounded. Then he walks through to the kitchen. He makes himself a drink and some breakfast. And he likes to jump straight up out of bed feeling alert and awake because he knows that when he was younger he used to sleep through alarms and used to allow himself to drift and float deeper asleep when an alarm sounded he would just reach over turn it off roll over and fall back asleep So now he has his routine where he wakes straight up 
leaves bed, walks downstairs and make sure that way he doesn't go back to bed and lie down. And for breakfast he always looks in the cupboards, to see what he can have today. And he'll sometimes have toast with a different spread, other times pancakes, other times cereal. Then he unlocks the back door, walks outside the back of his house, breathes in the fresh morning air, feels that air as it passes in through his nose, down into his lungs, almost feeling it passing through his body. He turns to face the sun, even on cloudy days, closes his eyes and allows the warmth of the sun to begin to wake up his body clock. He has a drink and then heads back inside. heads through to the living room where he often finds his dog just lying there sleeping in the corner of the living room. He sometimes thinks that his dog's lazier than he is and seems to want to sleep more than he wants to sleep. And so he goes over, he pets the dog, he sees the dog move around and he swears that he notices the dog's eyes close tighter, almost as if the dog is trying to say, don't wake me up, I want to sleep. And then he starts tickling the dog and then the dog always wakes up and joins in and has fun with him. And they sit and play for a while, before he then heads out on a walk with his dog. And when he leaves his house to go on a walk, he walks down the street, turns into a park, and as he walks through the park so he can notice other dog walkers, some being far more active than he is. Now at the other side of the park is a footpath that leads down to the beach. And so he cuts through that footpath, cuts through the overhanging trees the rustling leaves, noticing the colours of those trees, the brown of the bark, the green of the leaves, the crunching of each footstep that he takes. Before it opens up to a beautiful sandy beach, He then lets that dog off of the leash. And the dog rushes around, runs down to the sea. Instantly just leaps a wave and splashes down through another wave. And then runs and splashes, jumping waves, trying to bite waves rolling in the water before running back out onto the sand and rolling in the sand and the man throws a ball a few times and the dog runs after it and brings it back and to the man he's just having a leisurely stroll 
while his dog is just rushing around using so much energy. He's always surprised how much energy the dog seems to use given how lethargic the dog seems when they're at home. And as they walk along the beach, so they can see a father and a child building the most grand sand castle. They've dug a moat all the way from the seashore sloping down, guiding that water down that channel and around this grand castle. They've managed to fashion sand bridges over that water. And they've obviously used many buckets of sand to carefully build up that sand castle. And now they're going around that sand castle, carefully smoothing the edges, carefully smoothing the turrets, just making it just right. And just as that father and child step away from the sand castle to admire it, and the father gets his phone out to take a photo of the sandcastle and his child smiling next to it. And the dog leaps in the air, turns his back to the sandcastle to catch the flying ball, and skids straight through the sandcastle, rolling down the other side, and then proudly displaying the ball in its teeth. And the man was really distressed and upset and worried about what they might think and runs over to apologize. But as he gets there, so he notices the father laughing so hard and that the child looks sad, but the father is laughing so hard. And the man runs over, saying, sorry, 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 and is really apologetic. And the man turns his phone to the other man and shows the photo that he got of the dog with the most weird expression, reaching for the bull, cheeks flared open, some saliva going everywhere, legs flailing, with a cloud of sand spraying up from the sand castle. And this man just thought this was the funniest photo. And when he showed it to his son, his son couldn't help but keep laughing as well. And couldn't be angry at the dog when it came up, dropped the ball at his feet and started knocking its head against the child's leg and wrapping itself around the child's legs, wanting to play. And the father said that it's fine. It's only sand. They can rebuild it that what's been created here is greater than the sand castle. It's a memory that won't be forgotten. It's something that probably will never happen again. That they'll probably come to the beach, they'll probably build multiple sand castles. But now when they do that, they'll laugh and remember that time the dog flew through the castle. And they have the photo to prove it. They'll be able to tell the mother what happened 
and show the photo. They'll be able to tell friends, family. And all these people will laugh. And so that one event, that chance random event, will bring happiness and joy to so many people. Even though on the surface, the first reaction was that something that was worked so hard for was destroyed. And the man asked if he could be sent a copy of the photo that he'd like to be able to print it off. And the father said that that'd be fine. And the man apologized again about the sand castle and carried on walking along the beach with his dog. And while walking along, he was sure that his dog had a smug smile but he felt that dogs shouldn't be able to have smug smiles. He just felt that the way that dog was walking and looking, he knew the dog knew what it had done. And even though the father and the child were okay with what had happened, he still felt a bit guilty about it. And he still wanted to tell the dog off, but at the same time couldn't bring himself to do so. Because when he looked at his dog's face, he would just smile. And he couldn't be mad at him. And so they carried on walking along the beach. And from time to time that dog ran down into the water splashed around, tried to eat the waves, leapt over some, dived through others, seemed to always want to roll in the sand when it came out of the water, rather than just shaking itself off to dry itself off. And he was sure the dog did that again, just to be cheeky, knowing that it made him all dirty, and that when he then shakes himself off, it makes everyone jump back. And a little way along the path, they turned up from the beach, down another footpath, through into some more woodland. And they wandered through this woodland, gradually weaving up through the woodland, up a slight hill, until they came out into a meadow, up on top of a hill. And up here on this meadow, they could see a myriad of flowers, and grasses, all blowing in the breeze. They could see down over a small village. They could feel the warmth of the sun. Notice clouds in the sky. And the man took this moment to just place his coat on the ground and then sit on his coat and rest back on his arms. And he just rested there looking out over the meadow while his dog wandered around, sniffing at the plants, following scents that are unseen. jumping, rolling around, and then occasionally just lying down for a little bit, and resting also. 
and while he rested there he watched as swallows darted around in the sky. As some birds of prey circled high overhead. As the occasional dragonfly darted into view, hovered, and then made impossible seeming manoeuvres, jetting off in different directions, and could hear that wind blowing gently across the meadow, watching butterflies land on different flowers, having a drink, and then flying off to another flower, and bees going from plant to plant, and just relaxing and being in the moment, being out in nature, and while he rested here, he got his phone out and started reading a book on his phone, and he was a little way through this book, and as he read this book, so he began to get drawn into the story. drawn into a story about someone in space circling the earth in a shuttle and part way round the earth the shuttle encountered an anomaly and as it passed through that anomaly it vanished and as it vanished it reappeared elsewhere in the past. And it was still on its same journey around the earth. It's just the earth below wasn't at the same time as it was moments earlier. And the people on the shuttle suddenly lost contact with the ground control. And they couldn't hear anything. They couldn't pick up any signals coming from the planet below. They couldn't detect anything else in orbit with them. And they had to start working at trying to solve this problem, trying to work out what happened and how they can get back to their present time. And 90 minutes later, suddenly they encountered the anomaly again in space. And they passed through that anomaly again. And as they did, the earth below seemed to change again. It was as if they perhaps had gone back in time even further. And they realised that this anomaly seems to be transporting them back through time. And so they had to figure out how they could head through the anomaly, the opposite direction. But they knew that they couldn't just fire thrusters, turn around and fly back the other way. Because they're travelling thousands of miles an hour in one direction. But they need to know exactly where the anomaly is. And so they work out a way of just subtly changing their orbit so that the next time round they just miss the anomaly. And when they go round again, 
they're a few degrees further out of line with the anomaly. And over a number of weeks, they circle the Earth below. Each time moving a few degrees. Until eventually, they're facing the opposite direction. And now they're going to be coming at that anomaly from the opposite route. And this time as they pass through the anomaly, the planet below transforms back to how it was before. And then 90 minutes later, when they pass through the anomaly again, it transforms again. And they can suddenly hear ground control. They can suddenly hear and pick up other transmissions and recognize other stuff in space with them. And then they have a dilemma. Do they go through the anomaly to see if it'll take them into the future? Knowing how hard it is to turn around and go back through again. Or do they just steer now to avoid the anomaly. Warn others about this anomaly here. And then just carry out their normal mission and return to Earth as planned. And they decide that they're going to tell ground control what has occurred, share everything they know with ground control, and tell them that they're going to fly through the anomaly again, that they know there's a risk. And so they don't know how far they travel one direction or the other. They couldn't work out exactly how far into the past they had travelled, so they don't know exactly how far into the future they'll travel. But they tell ground control that if this works and they end up in the future, just to be prepared, to make sure that there's an alert that's permanently from this point forth, on every mission log that something could come from this direction until that event has occurred to make sure that when they pass through the anomaly there shouldn't be anything on the other side directly in line with them and then at the end of the 90 minutes they pass through that anomaly and they come out in the distant future. They see a giant hovering space station that looks like it's tethered, like a giant hammer tethered to the earth. And they can see lights zipping up and down from the earth up to that space station and from the space station down to the earth. And they can see different kinds of lights, lights going up and down almost like a lift in a tube. And then there's larger circles or donut shapes that seem to be rising up, carrying more stuff up to that space station. 
before lowering back down again. And not long after they pass through and come out in the future. And they receive a message telling them how far they've travelled into the future. Telling them that people have been ready and waiting and avoiding the anomaly through time. And that they already knew when they were going to appear because they made it back safely and were able to report back when they had appeared and what had happened. And so although they don't know right now what happened, there is a report existing of what happened that they wrote. And they find this a really unusual concept to know that there's a document that they wrote saying what their entire experience was here that they've not yet had and explaining the exact time that they've arrived that they don't yet know that was shared because they know they make it safely back but they don't know yet that they are going to make it safely back and they get told that here now it's so far in the future that it's easy for their shuttle to have some small unmanned drones put alongside it and they'll fire thrusters in different directions that can help the shuttle turn around and face back to the anomaly without it having to repeatedly circle the earth gradually changing direction and so they talk about this time period without revealing much about the technologies other than what they can see from the shuttle and they share how far in the future this is and the astronauts are impressed with how much will be achieved and pleased that something gets achieved And they have a mission here, something they can do that others can't. Because others have developed thinking styles that have stopped them thinking quite so basic. And yet these astronauts from the past think far more basic. And so there's certain problem solving that they do well. And so they help these future people with that before heading back home. And as they head back home and the story reaches a, a natural point to stop reading that man drifts out of the story and back to the meadow and back in the meadow he glances over to his dog makes sure the dog is still behaving and still there he listens to those rustling leaves of the trees And after a little bit, he stands up, walks through the meadow, whistles for his dog, who comes running over, bounding across the meadow. And they walk down the hill, down that meadow, down towards that village down there. And as they near the village, so... They wander into a pedestrianised street with some nice quaint shops on either side 
and the smells of the butchers, of the bakers, and the other smells of florists, the market, the sounds of church bell ringing at the end of the village. Heading down and over a bridge, over a river, following that river bank. And while following that riverbank, the man often does this walk and heads to where he grew up as a child, to some woodland he used to play in. And he arrives at that bit of woodland just off the riverbank, walks into the woods, and he can see his zip wire that he built years earlier that he connected to trees up high on the hills, all the way down to the trees at the bottom of the hills. And it was made out of wire. And it's been there for decades. And he knows that children frequently stumble across this and then use it. And sometimes you have to remove some branches that have crossed the path of the zip wire. But it doesn't take a lot of effort and then you can use it. And so he pulls it all the way to the top with his dog following him all the way up to the top of the hill. And the zip wire has a small bit of wood to sit on. He places that between his legs, jumps up, lifts his legs up, and feels the bounce of the wire as he lands back onto the seat, and the pulley travels down that wire, hitting a rubber tyre at the end, throwing him up in the air a little bit. before bouncing him back a little bit away from that tree. And he feels as exhilarated now doing this as he used to as a child. And he does that a few more times, recapturing his youth in his mind. And he's pleased that something he put together so many years ago is still here and still able to be used and still able to bring fun to many people. And as it zips down the hill, the dog often chases after him, barking and panting, and then skidding to a halt as he suddenly stops at the bottom And then he continues his walk. He often follows this path down the river, down to the second bridge, crosses that bridge, and walks back up the other side of the river, almost like walking in a large circle. He finds not only is this good for giving his dog a walk and giving him some exercise, but it also helps with his mental health and helps to make sure that he gets some fresh air and he finds many needs met from this walk where he wanders through countryside down to the beach and through countryside he stops and reads and relaxes for a while then recaptures some childhood memories before continuing his walk along the river over the bridge and back up the other side of the river following that other side of the river 
and then over another bridge. And then heading back towards the woodland. And as he heads back towards the woodland, he passes under a silver arch sculpture. And on top of that silver arch sculpture is what looks like a silver jet plane. And out the back of that silver jet plane is a silver trail heading down, joining with the top of the arch and then passing off the side of the arch almost as if that jet has flown towards the arch turned up to avoid the arch and just skimmed the tip of the arch almost as if it's barely touching the silver arch itself and it's been sculpted with so much detail and so much movement in its work that it just looks like it could have been flying right there and it seems to be barely touching that arch so much so that you could almost be convinced if you just glanced that it was something flying past an arch almost like it's defying gravity over the arch. Where the point of contact between the trail from behind the jet and the point not even on the top of the arch but just near the side of it just makes contact, doesn't look enough contact to hold the weight of that jet. And he always walks through the arch and has this sense of the importance of this arch to this area, to those who have fought in many conflicts and are being remembered. And so he feels that it's important to walk through that arch. And that fighter he always thinks of as looking like it's trying to do a victory lap in the sky as if it's circling around and releasing some smoke behind it in celebration. like the end of some difficult times. And he continues along that path into the woodland. As he walks into the woodland, so he notices this part of the woodland is deeper and denser. Sound is more muffled. And the rustling of the leaves overhead take on a slightly deeper tone. And it's darker in this part of the woodland. And even less breeze can make it into the woodland here. And so he feels a deeper sense of peace, a deeper sense of solitude. a greater opportunity to think about things and process things in his mind as he walks through this part of the woodland. And this is his healing journey. This is his healing walk that he makes every day where anything playing on his mind when he gets to here. This is when he takes his time to think about it, to process that, so that when he arrives home, 
he can arrive home clear-headed. He can arrive home leaving anything he doesn't want to arrive home with behind him. Where here he can process those things. And as he walks through here, so his mind wanders and starts processing. He starts to have a sense of pacing in a measured way through a Zen garden. He can notice the peace. He can notice the rhythm. He can notice the order in this garden and notice the way that as sand is raked, so order can be created. Knots in life can be undone. And as stones are placed strategically, they can have tremendous meaning. Meaning what stone and where. And then how it's placed. And then sitting on a large black stone. Carefully reached, walking across sand. Raking behind where you're walking. As he sits, crosses his legs on that stone, in his mind's eye, and takes some deep, purposeful breaths, breathing out longer than breathing in, being present and in the moment, being aware of where he is aware of where sounds are, almost like making time here stand still. And as he's aware of here and his eyes close. It's as if his eyes are open, as if he's got a third eye that can see when his eyes are shut. That can see a representation of the world around him as he rises outside of himself and can see himself sat there meditating rising above himself, seeing mountains in the distance and floating as a mind to the mountains, floating, drifting through space and time over to those mountains and settling down in front of a cave high up in the mountains. perched just in the entrance of a small cave, just big enough to camp in. And thinking about a fire outside that cave and seeing a small wood campfire appear. And thinking about something comfortable to wrap up snuggle down in and noticing that appear the most comfy fluffy blankets that he wraps around himself 
as he sits in the entrance to that cave, hearing the wind whistle with the most beautiful note behind him and back out of that cave past his ears, and that crackling of the fire while he gazes down and can see himself sat all the way over there in the distance in the Zen garden and can see everything in between and can recognize this as his mind where the connection between the him walking through the woods and him up here in this mountain is that him down there in the Zen garden where here he can look down and survey his mind surveying a metaphorical landscape of his mind all the worries darkness all the light and pleasures and everything in between and from up here and just like controlling a lucid dream or programming a computer game he can work on programming and influencing the landscape below from this position up high above that landscape from this relaxed calm position Rewinding areas of darkness to bring light and comfort. Adding more light and movement and excitement to other areas. Creating easy paths through woodland, through dense forest, to areas of pleasure and happiness. and making forest thicker and harder to travel through to areas of pain to areas that it's preferable not to travel to while seeing the animals in the forest seeing the animals in the rivers seeing the birds overhead working in harmony with this world seeing the plants, the trees, all working in harmony that even those dark forests those dark areas become brighter and more appealing as time goes on as that work continues as they get tended to by animals and then up here they have a sense of relaxing by this fire and drifting into their own deep meditation almost like a deep spiritual meditation that this person up here is having connecting with the world around them being able to lower their hands down to the ground beneath them and as those hands touch the ground so they feel a deep connection, almost like their hands and the ground beneath them become one and fuse on some level. As a purple healing glow spreads out through every atom of this land from those hands 
even spreading into the sky, beginning to give the sky a slight purple tinge. And then as the fire burns down to embers, so they have a sense of opening their eyes and launching from the cave and flying back to that them in the Zen garden and then leaving that Zen garden and finding themselves reaching the end of the woods walking out of those woods with their dog alongside them heading out of the woods following that path past a park seeing some children playing back towards the street on the way home and then arriving home the dog feeling satisfied with the long walk instantly going in and lying back down in bed the man going in hearing the ticking of that grandfather clock and seeing that it's now 11 o'clock and a couple of hours have passed since waking up. And making a drink. And sitting down in the back garden. To relax briefly before carrying on with the day. And then on this day. They carry out a few chores, they lead a normal day, they grab some lunch, they watch some TV in the afternoon, they spend a lot of time in their garden, and they do a bit of gardening, and they see what looks like a diamond hanging on a thread from a tree at the end of the garden, just gently spinning at the end of the garden. They head down to that diamond. They don't know whether it's a diamond or not, or whether it's just another crystal. But they spin it in their hand, and as they do, they see rainbow shards of light dance from that crystal as the sun catches it while it spins and while that happens so the tree appears to move and as that tree moves they find a portal opening up and they're curious what's happening but comfortable as well and they walk through the portal and as they walk through that portal so they descend some steps they walk down those steps and as they walk deeper down the steps, they realize that there's some secret place here under the end of their garden. They realize that that tree has never been a real tree. But they don't remember seeing that crystal hanging from the tree before and they don't know why turning that crystal and having that light reflect off it has opened this portal opened this pathway
and they realize that deep under where they live there seems to be a whole other world a whole secret area like a civilization living under a civilization and they can see animals and trees they can see what looks like people and they go to talk to some of these people and they find out that this area was built many decades earlier when there was conflict in this area then they thought that the conflict may not go in their favour and so they had built this area they'd built some secret ways down into this area and ever since it's been kept active and many of these people down here are scientists military personnel and they can see what looks like the most incredible aeroplanes and they talk about how there's tunnels going off many miles that head out to cliffs that can launch these planes through fake cliffs if needed and that they do so when testing those planes at times And they say that they're going to have to wipe the mind of this person. And he doesn't want his mind wiped. And they tell him that if he can be of help to them, then his mind won't have to be wiped if he agrees to continue to keep it a secret and perhaps even work with them on some of their projects and they hand him a box and they tell him if you can access that box we won't wipe your mind and they explain that it takes a lot of training and knowledge to be able to access that box to know what the right pattern is and to recognize the kind of pattern and while they're telling him this and he's watching and listening to them his hands absent-mindedly ping open the box to reveal a golden key and he takes that key and they're surprised at how fast he managed to access that box that others take years of training they then take him to a building and tell him that if he can make his way round the maze in this building, blindfolded, then he can prove himself and open the door with the key at the other end of the maze. And so he walks into the maze blindfolded, and he puts his left hand on the nearest wall and he starts walking and he walks and he walks keeping his left hand on the wall and he doesn't take his left hand off of the wall and he walks and he walks and he walks until he finds the exit
and he uses the key, opens the door, and even through his blindfold, he can notice the bright light. And he takes off the blindfold, and he sees the most incredible sight. What looks like a vast UFO in a highly illuminated room. And the person that saw him into the maze is stood there, surprised that he'd managed to navigate a maze blindfolded. And he said that it's easy. I just kept my hand on the wall. And they say there'll definitely be a position for you here. That we're working on incredible things for the future. And they asked what he does currently. And he explains that he walks his dog. That he reads. That he learns and studies the world that he gets lost in thought and fantasies, and that he sees the world differently to most others. He sees beauty and wonder, but at the same time gets surprised and down because of his overthinking. And he explains that he used to be a musician, but he lost all confidence. And so he still makes some money from his music that's out there, but doesn't really do anything else with his life. He's felt lost felt without a purpose for a while. And he's wondered what that purpose would end up being, what would give him new purpose, what would give him a challenge and something to work for. And now this opportunity has presented itself. And they're quick to hire someone who thinks how he thinks. And he gets shown back out of this base. And it just happens that that portal to here is in his garden. And he'd never noticed it until today. He'd never discovered that portal, even though it was always there. And as the sun sets, so he settles down for the evening before heading to bed, wrapping himself up comfortably under his quilt, sinking his head deep into the pillow and drifting and floating into the most beautiful dream and then on into the most healing deep sleep sleeping well through the night so as you take a moment to listen to me telling this story you can begin to get yourself comfortable close your eyes and start to drift off asleep. And as you drift asleep, I don't know whether you'll drift asleep faster with the sound of my words or the spaces between my words. And as you drift asleep, so I'll just be telling this story in the background. 
and there was a woman who went up to bed, turning off the lights as she went. And she sat in her bed, with just a light on beside her bed. And she sat there in her bed, back resting deeply in some comfortable pillows, feeling calm, feeling just the right temperature for drifting and floating asleep in bed. And she sat in bed a while, under the relaxing light of the lamp, reading a book. And she calmly and peacefully read one page, and then turned the page and read the next page, and the next page. and then turned the page and read the next page. And she sat there for a little while, absorbed in the story in the book. And after a little while, she closed up that book, placed the book beside the bed, turned off the light, plumped up the pillows a little bit, slid down in the bed, pulled the covers up higher, around her chin, tucked herself in comfortably, and began to drift and float asleep. And as she began to drift asleep, she was aware there was just the slightest bit of moonlight shining into her room. She was aware that she could hear the slight breeze outside on the window, some distant sounds outside as she continued to feel comfortable drifting asleep in bed. And while she was drifting asleep in bed, so she started to feel like her body was relaxing, getting heavier. And she would occasionally see little glimmers of shapes and colours in her mind's eye. And then as she began to drift into a dream, she found herself walking toward a pyramid in Egypt. And it wasn't Egypt as she had seen on TV. It was Egypt as she imagined it probably was centuries earlier. There was lots of greenery, lots of plant life. And she walked through it all, walking towards a pyramid. And the pyramid stood so tall, and she was aware that it was probably taller than it appeared as she walked toward it. And the sides of the pyramid looked so smooth and almost pure white, with the sun shining and reflecting off the side that's facing it. And the pyramid stood out, being such a pure white, 
compared to the green of the plants around it. And as she continued to drift deeper asleep, so she continued to drift deeper into this dream. And the deeper she began to go into the dream, the more she began to hear hustle and bustle of people going about their lives. And she walked all the way to the pyramid, walked to its entrance. And she took a torch from beside the pyramid and walked into the pyramid. And unlike pyramids that she had seen on TV, this pyramid had a large entrance. Almost like a large entrance hall that led into a room. And so she walked down that entrance hall hearing her footsteps echoing as she went, noticing the way shadows danced on the walls, hearing the sound of the flame of the torch, as the breeze that blew through this pyramid blew that flame and made that flame dance on the stick. And she noticed that there was a coolness to being in the pyramid compared to being outside the pyramid. And she walked all the way through to a room, to a vast chamber. And this chamber was so large that the light from the torch barely reached the sides or the ceiling. And she walked to one side and noticed that deep in this pyramid, in this chamber, there seemed to be water. And she walked down the side of the pyramid, down the side of this chamber. And she saw that there was a boat beside her resting on the water. She climbed into that boat. She placed the torch in a holder at the front of the boat, picked up an oar, pushed off the side, unsure what she was going to find, and started rowing through the water with the sound of that oar as it pushed through the water on one side and then she would cross it over the boat and push it on the other side and then cross it over the boat and push it on the other side and she assumed that she would just be on this boat to the back of the pyramid, perhaps to the back of this chamber. But she noticed that the boat was subtly getting pulled in one direction. And she was unsure where she was going, but decided to go with the flow. And so she went with the flow, and she could see that she was approaching the back wall of the chamber. And see that over in the corner was a gap large enough for the boat to fit through. And over at that gap, as she approached it, she could hear the water getting louder. 
almost like rapids. And as the boat reached that corner, suddenly it began to speed up and started flowing down these rapids, down a secret tunnel at the back of this chamber, almost like being in a water slide at a theme park. And the boat increased in speed as it travelled around these tunnels, curving one way, following that water, and then curving down another way, descending somewhere deep under the pyramid, before eventually leaping out the end over a small waterfall and landing in a calmer lake, in an area that appeared to be lit up like daylight. And yet she was aware that she's deep underground. And she could hear birds singing. She could see trees, plants, grass, shrubs. And so she rowed that boat ashore climbed out of the boat pulled the boat up onto the bank and decided to explore this area she didn't know where she was but there seemed to be a whole world down here somewhere deep under these pyramids And she didn't know how the sky was being lit up in this cave. When she looked up, it just looked almost like a normal blue sky. And she walked along the side of the lake. And she could see something glistening off in the distance something that was reflective and catching her gaze as she moved. And so she walked towards that. She circled around the lake, headed off across a meadow between some trees. and arrived at what seemed to be a giant golden temple covered in purple and blue stones making out pictures around this golden temple and she walked around this temple seeing what seemed like the largest piece of gold she'd ever seen in her life. And this temple was almost like perhaps half the size of one of the pyramids that she had seen outside. And she navigated her way round the temple and then found an entrance and walked into that entrance. And light from outside the temple was bounced around inside the temple from crystals that seemed to line it. And so, walking into the temple, she noticed how her footsteps had a weird echo a kind of echo that had a certain dullness to it as she walked. 
and she found her way, easily directed, following the path into the temple, through to the centre of this temple. And in the centre of the temple was a sarcophagus. And this sarcophagus was made of pure gold. With the most beautiful depiction of the person inside. And she read what it said along the outside of the sarcophagus. That here lies the master of all masters. The one who created the land. And that they lie in the land beneath the land. To be a master of their own land, while others inherit what they've left behind. And she finds this fascinating. And she leaves the tomb and decides to explore further. And she knows that there's got to be some kind of ecosystem down here. Because she doesn't know how long this has been here. But she knows it's obviously been here a very long time. And she can hear birds and there's obviously plants. And there may well be other animals. So she decides to explore. She's sure that she can't be the only one who knows of this place. And as she explores, so she sees what looks like a village in the distance. And wherever this is that she is, is such a huge space. That if this is in a cave underground, she can't see the sides of the cave, despite it being well lit. The land just seems to go on in every direction. And so she starts to walk towards that village, taking in the sounds of the birds. Feeling long grass at her fingertips as she walks through that grass. Feeling a slight breeze on her face. And the comfortable temperature of this area. And finding this to be such a tranquil location. And as she nears that village, so she notices there are people milling around. There are people farming, people making things. There's a whole community down here, wherever here is. And she goes over to one of the villagers and begins to talk to them. And by surprise, they seem to understand her and she seems to be able to understand them. And she asks them where this place is, what they're all doing here, how long they've been here. And they explain that they're the guardians of the tomb. That their ancestors came here 
with the first pharaoh. And they've been here ever since, looking after the tomb, tending to the tomb, looking after this land, ensuring the survival of this land. And that generation after generation of them have lived down here, And that down here they live in peace and harmony. And the woman gets invited to eat with them. And so she eats with these people. And down here it was almost like the sun beginning to set. And yet she sees no sun in the sky. And she's curious where this is, how it all works. And one of the villagers explains that none of them really know. That this place was created at the death of the first pharaoh. That their ancestors may well have known how it was created. But they don't believe that it was a man-made place. And she looks around and thinks to herself that she also doesn't believe it's man-made. That thought of being able to create a space this large underground and to make it so full of life and an entire ecosystem just wouldn't be possible. And she asked them how far they've travelled. And they said that they've travelled all over the land. They've never found a boundary. And she's curious about this. How you can never find a boundary. How this space can be that large. And that evening, they invite her to stay the night. And she settles down in a chair, relaxing in a room with a flickering fire in the corner of the room. And a little kitten playing on the ground, rolling around with something, kicking it around, holding it with its front paws, kicking it with its back legs, flipping on its back. And then after a little bit that kitten gets bored. And walks over to the woman sat in that seat. And jumps up and climbs up her legs. And onto her lap. And the kitten slumps itself down like a limp weight in her lap. And she instinctively begins to gently stroke that kitten. As the kitten sits in her lap, purring and relaxing, with its eyes closed, resting on her lap. And she can feel the breathing of that kitten, its body moving in and out with each breath. 
that kitten relaxes and purrs and she can feel the vibrating purring of that kitten resting on her lap and while the kitten drifts asleep purring on her lap so she drifts comfortably and relaxed asleep And then the next morning, she awakens and can see that kitten playing on the floor again. She has some breakfast, leaves the building, and says she's going to have a little look around before heading back to where she came from. And she didn't know for sure how she was going to get back. Because the route here was all downhill. But she thought she'd figure that out. And so she began to look around. And as she looked around, so she just noticed a tree that stood out among the others as being that much taller and looking so healthy she walked over to that tree ran her fingers round the bark of the tree felt that tree and felt there was something unusual about the tree And she noticed that there was a small hole in the bottom of the tree. And it just looked like a natural hole you get in many trees. But she felt compelled to take a closer look. And when she did, she saw a box hidden in that hole. She took the box out from that hole. carefully opened the box and as she did so what looked like a hologram of a person appeared before her and she was startled for a moment and then they began talking to her Asking her who she is, why she's opened the box. And she explained who she was and that she stumbled across this box and is curious about this place. And they explained what this place was, that this was a message from that first civilization. that was a technologically advanced civilization and that what had happened was that the river the rapids that the woman had come down on and come into this place on actually lead to an alternative world It's actually a portal through space to a different place, to a different world. A world that this first civilization started their civilization on, but had left long ago to become a spacefaring civilization where some of the civilizations settled on earth and the first of their kind on any planet 
always make sure that there's a portal they take with them that they can place somewhere that will lead them home. And that that portal had been placed and led to here. And the woman wondered how she was going to get back. And they said that although she can't take that boat back, she can climb back through the portal climb up the side of the waterfall, up the side of the rapids, that it'll be possible to climb up to where she came from. And she knew this would be a hard task. And so she closed that box and the hologram disappeared. She placed that box back where she found it. And she headed back to where she came from. She climbed up the waterfall, entered the tunnel, and carrying the torch to light her way, she scrambled her way all the way back to the pyramid. And came out in the pyramid. Waded through that water. Over to near where she got the boat from. exited the pyramid and walked out into the heat of Egypt and as she felt herself drying off in the Egyptian sun so she felt this dream drifting floating away as she drifted and relaxed into a deeper, more profound sleep. So as you listen to me and begin to comfortably fall asleep, I'm just going to tell you a story in the background. And while you listen along to the story, I don't know whether you'll fall asleep faster with the sounds of my words or whether it'll be with the spaces between my words. But as you begin to fall asleep, so you can drift and dream and relax through the night. And there was a dragon who had worked and helped this man for many, many years. This man and this dragon have been searching for something. And to the man, it feels like he's been searching for a lifetime. And the man was an elderly man. And yet, dragons' lives are so much longer. The dragon felt like it had barely aged. But many, many, many years earlier, the two of them had their paths cross, setting them on this journey. And once upon a time in this land, dragons were commonplace. 
that something had been making them disappear. And as the dragons disappeared, so dreams disappeared. And as dreams disappeared, hope disappeared, change disappeared. And young people coming along were growing up in a world unaware of the world that came before them. And yet this elderly man knew that world, lived through that time, and wanted to help to solve the riddle of where the dragons had gone, to bring back hope to the land. And the dragon would fly from place to place, often searching for what it didn't know feeling driven by vague thoughts and clues. Feeling sometimes like it was chasing a shadow. And the dragon landed on the side of a mountain. And the man and the dragon knew they just had to rest. And the dragon thudded down to the ground. Thudding its body down, its neck, its chin. And letting out a long breath. As it hit the ground and relaxed. And the elderly man walked around. He looked out at the view he could see. Distant hills and forests. See the way the cloud was hovering lower than he was. And the way the setting sun was casting such long shadows. And the man went into a nearby cave to settle down for the night. He lit a fire and made some food. and set up a bed. He ate his food, wondering what the day will bring tomorrow, forever searching, forever curious. He lay down in the bed as the fire burned down to embers. He watched the way the light danced on the walls of the cave, while his eyes got heavier and heavier and gradually his eyes closed. He knew that at this time he just needed somewhere to rest, somewhere to relax, to gain his thoughts about the way forward. He didn't know what it was that he would have to discover. He just knew that he couldn't rest properly until he found it.
And while he rested in that cave, he could hear the way the wind was whistling into the cave, feeling the slight cool breeze on his face. Breathing in that cool air as he fell into a comfortable sleep. And as he drifted into that comfortable sleep, he imagined himself walking along a street and there's a slight bit of rain. And he imagined himself getting an umbrella out, protecting himself from the rain, while at the same time enjoying the rain, enjoying the sound of the rain on the umbrella, the smell of the air, the way the world seemed quieter and more peaceful when it was raining lightly like this. And he felt this dream was teaching him something about what he needed to find and do. And he walked down deserted street in the evening rain, aware no one else seemed to be around, just a man and his umbrella. And as he walked along, just the man and his umbrella, he noticed the curious way that the raindrops seemed to be slowing right down. And as the raindrops began to slow right down, it was as if time began to slow right down. His attention focused more intensely on the raindrop. And the more intensely his attention focused on the raindrops, the slower and slower they seemed to get. And as the raindrops seemed to get slower and slower, so his attention got drawn even more to them. To the point where the raindrops seemed to be suspended in midair, and yet he was still able to walk around. And he walked around and he circled around and he looked at the raindrops from many different angles, and he found something fascinating about the raindrops. They had always looked like they were teardrop shaped or perhaps straight lines. And now they were just circles, almost perfect spheres of water just hovering in the air. And he knew that somehow this was supposed to be teaching him something related to his quest. And he saw across the other side of the road what started out looking a bit like a shadowy figure and then morphed into looking a bit like him just slightly different, 
like an older version of himself. And he started walking towards that older version of himself. And as he approached, they got younger and younger until when he reached them, they were a child. And just as he reached them and they became a child, they vanished and the rain carried on at normal speed. And then people started walking into view, walking up and down the street. And he found himself drifting deeper and more comfortably asleep. And after a little while of drifting and dreaming, he began to awaken in the cave. At first he noticed the slight occasional crackling of the fire, and then the sound of the wind outside, and gradually became more aware in the cave. And he left the cave and joined the dragon to continue their journey. He climbed onto the back of the dragon and the dragon launched itself up into the air, giving a strong flap of its wings and then flying, curious about where the elderly man was going to take them today. And the elderly man shared about his dream, about frozen time. How he didn't know what this meant, but he was sure this was their next clue. And the dragon didn't know where it had to go, but trusted that now their focus was on this clue they would find a way. And as they flew over forest, over hills, over grassland, over lakes and rivers, through clouds, under clouds, over clouds, The man gazed around, noticing how little other life they saw. That perhaps with a loss of hope, the world was beginning to disappear. And the man started to recall decades earlier an old time, an old place, an old way of being, a time when dragons were believed in and dragons existed. And dragons and man coexisted. Where everyone just got on. And while the dragon flew, the man wondered about these things, pondered about them. with no real idea where his wandering and pondering would take him. And as he wondered, he started to realize 
from the back of his mind to the front that maybe that was the message maybe that was the learning he was supposed to take that it was about a moment in time it was about having a moment in time and capturing that moment in time and exploring that moment in time and exploring the lost feelings and the lost thoughts and the man recalled his childhood where he first became friends with this dragon and how he's grown up and grown old but he's remained with the dragon yet many of his friends grew up and moved on they had other things they wanted to do they moved away from the lands with the dragons and they would have children and those children may hear stories of dragons but they grew up without the dragons and then they would have children and they may hear the occasional story of dragons but they would grow up without dragons. And with every passing generation, people are forgetting the dragons. They're forgetting the land of the dragons. The relationship between the people and the dragons, the friendships that are formed, And yet, this elderly man held on to the friendships, grew old with this dragon. And he realised what it was that needed to be taught. He realised that it was about an abundance and about how there's now a lack of abundance or a different abundance there's now an abundance of focus on the wrong things not on the connections with those around you and that what needs to happen is to build that connection between dragons and man And he was unsure exactly how to do that, given that dragons have been disappearing because man have been leaving the dragons and heading to different lands. And so he wondered what the way forward would be. And he realised one thing has never ever happened. Dragons have never left their land. That they're disappearing now, but they're not leaving the land. Nobody knows where they're disappearing to. And yet people have been leaving their land and finding new land to live in. And he realised if he flew with his dragon and landed in places of people, it would be undeniable evidence that dragons exist. People would start believing again and maybe it would recapture that old time. 
and dragons would start to come back. And as they come back, they become more abundant. And friendships would form. And there's no reason why the dragons had to remain confined to their land. It's just what they were familiar with. They always stuck with what they knew. But maybe now it's time to go beyond what you know and try something new. And so the elderly man flew the dragon out to one of the new big cities. He landed the dragon right in the centre of the city, surrounded by people. And there was shock and awe and wonder and curiosity as he introduced them to the dragons. He showed off his dragon. And as he did so, more dragons flew into view and landed in the city. And then people on those dragons and the elderly man on his dragon flew to other cities, landed in those cities, showing off the dragons, which led to even more dragons appearing back, finding their way to the cities and doing the same. And as this happened, something incredible started happening. Something he never expected. He started to feel more youthful. He had a feeling he was going to feel like he recaptured his youth. But this was different. He wasn't just recapturing his youth. He was starting to de-age. And he realized that there was almost like a symbiotic relationship between the humans and the dragons. But it's not just the dragons that age really slowly. Perhaps they don't age at all. Because as people were introduced to dragons, people started to de-age, not all the way back, to childhood. But back to a time where they'd found contentment in life. A certain acceptance of the ups and downs and of the friendship. An age when they felt they'd learned enough to be classed as someone with enough wisdom to be that age. And as the dragons came back, people realised that they could get on with their lives. They could do all the things they currently do, and yet they could do more. They had friendships with these other races, with these other species, with other creatures. And they all came back. Balance began to be restored.
Growing up became a thing. Growing old stopped being a thing. It was almost like somehow there was a fountain of youth. a kind of connection where all living things create a balance between them. Where they have more control over their destiny by sharing that destiny with others. And the elderly man, who was now just middle-aged, felt content with his achievements, having spent years trying to achieve this. And for the first time in many years, he went home. He saw the land he remembered of kindness, of friendship, full of dragons and other wonderful creatures. He went to bed and relaxed down and drifted into the most peaceful, wonderful sleep he'd had in many, many years. And just take a moment to get yourself comfortable and allow your eyes to close. And with your eyes closed, I'll tell you a story in the background. And I don't know whether you'll fall asleep faster to the sound of my words or the spaces between my words. But as you begin to drift asleep, so I'll just tell this story. And it's a story about a person who lives in the woods in a cabin. And those woods, it's a, a vast pine wooded area, all snow covered, mountains in the distance. And just down from the cabin is a lake And this person relaxes in that cabin, in the most comfortable chair, feeling the warmth of a roaring log fire, feeling that warmth on their cheeks. And as they relax, in that chair. So they pick up a book off the table next to the chair and they just start reading through that book, just slowly reading through the book. And although they're reading through the book, a part of them is almost like it's drifted elsewhere. And so they're reading through the book, but at the same time they're almost not reading through the book. Almost unaware of what's going on page by page. And yet they feel themselves still reading, still turning those pages, 
still relaxing. And out the corner of their eye they can notice the way the log fire flickers and the way shadows dance on the walls. And they're sitting in this room with low lighting, making this room feel so cosy and comfortable. And they can look over at the window and notice the snow piled up against the window pane. And they can see the snow falling outside. And the way the light from the fire glows in the room as they continue reading that book, drifting and relaxing deeper into the moment. And every now and then they have this feeling like they're starting to nod off in the chair, almost like their head gets a bit heavier, their shoulders and neck relax, their arms relax, their breathing slows and calms. And then they bring their attention to the book again only to find that happen again and again. And they realise after a while that, despite trying to read, they're not really taking it in right now. That watching those words as they scan the pages seems to just help them feel more tired and drift inside their mind. And so they close the book, put it on the table, and they walk over to the window. And they touch the glass with the palm of their hand. They can feel the coolness moving from outside to inside, feeling that coolness at their fingertips, their palm, moving into their hand and noticing that as they move their hand so they've left a slightly damp handprint on the window And they sit back down in the chair. They have a nice warm drink as they feel more relaxed. They can hear the way the fire's crackling in the background. And they just enjoy being in the moment, knowing they're so warm and comfortable here, while outside is cold. And everything's covered with a layer of snow. And they feel themselves beginning to drift inside the mind. They feel their eyes getting heavier with each blink until eventually their eyes blink and don't open again. They just continue to drift deeper inside 
and relax further. And as they drift inside the mind so they can notice the way lights dancing outside their eyelids. They can hear what sounds like an owl hooting in a nearby tree. And with their eyes closed, they begin to focus their attention on that sound of the owl. Focusing on where in space that owl is. And as they focus on that owl, so they begin to have a sense of being that owl, seeing what that owl can see. Hearing the wind whistle past their ears, feeling the movement of the feathers as the wind blows through the tree. And as the owl, they gaze out over the vast white expanse down towards the lake. And they can't see as far as the lake because of the snow, but they gaze in that direction. They notice some movement out there of other animals out here in this pine woodland. And as the wind dies down a little, so the snow begins to fall softly downwards. And as that snow falls softly downwards, so the owl decides to launch silently off that branch, stretch its wings, and glide down and swirl and swoop around. Circling, exploring, listening. And as that owl circles, so easily and effortlessly, and so quietly, so it can move its head and hear the footsteps of different animals, And it can see different animals. And the owl notices an unusual animal. An animal it's never seen before. It seems to be the wrong colour for being out here in the snow. And the owl circles around that animal, trying to figure out what it is. It's a small animal, and it looks cold. And the owl doesn't know what it is, doesn't realise that that animal is a gerbil. But it wants to help and it swoops down 
picks up that gerbil. And flies it up into its tree, placing it on a branch. And the gerbil appears scared and cold. And the owl explains that in this weather, at this time, it's here to help. It's wise, it often knows what to do. It's often called upon to help. And the gerbil, with a bit of a chatter, explains that they'd wandered off out of their home, decided to go exploring and then got lost. And that for a while it wasn't too bad. They could find things to eat they were able to explore and they thought they'd eventually find their own way home but then this snow came and the snow seemed to come out of nowhere and everything went white and cold And they didn't know how to find their way back home. But with it being so cold, they panicked and just tried their best. And the owl asked them what their home is like. And they said that it was a warm place. With a crackling log fire. some large animal walking around, not talking much, often lost in thought. And looking at different things and sitting in a chair. And the owl realized this animal must have come from the cabin in these woods. So the owl picked up that gerbil, leapt off the branch, stretched its wings, and flew with such silence through the snowy sky. Until it could see the glow of orangey yellow light. And then the outline of the cabin. And the gerbil said, that's my home. That's where I came from. And the owl took that gerbil. Up to the door. Placed it on the snow. And the gerbil was so light it didn't sink into the snow. And the owl sunk a little bit into the snow. And then the owl fluttered against the door and knocked its beak on the door until it could hear movement coming from inside the cabin. And then the owl turned and took off, 
and flew out of sight. And the person in the cabin was in his reverie, still trying to pinpoint that owl, still focusing on trying to see what the owl sees. And this experience he's just had feels confusing. The experience feels confusing because he's sure he's just imagined himself as the owl, picking up a gerbil, talking to a gerbil, and flying his pet gerbil back to his cabin. And then at the point that he's imagined this happening, he hears what's in his mind's eye happening at his door. And he's unsure whether the sound he hears at his door is also in his mind. And so he opens his eyes, breaking his connection with the owl. And he still hears the noise at the door. So he gets out of the chair. He walks to the door, opens the door, feels that cold air as it rushes in, and sees his gerbil shivering in the snow. And he reaches down and he picks his gerbil up. And he'd wondered where the gerbil had gone. And he goes and stands near the fire, holding that cold gerbil, stroking the gerbil, holding it against him, letting his body warmth warm that gerbil. And then sits down in the chair and just has it resting on his lap. As it rests there, relaxing, and he strokes that gerbil. And back outside, that owl flies back to its tree. and continues to just watch this evening unfold. And while the owl watches the evening unfold, so the snow begins to pass. And as the clouds clear, so the owl notices the sky. notices a blanket of twinkling stars, notices that now the clouds are clearing, that not only are there lights in the sky from an aurora, but there's also shooting stars heading in all directions. And the owl is sure that they hear those shooting stars fizzing as they travel across the sky. And some of those shooting stars are quite large and bright. But most are just like someone drawing a line in the sky that's being erased almost as far as it's drawn. Drawing that line in the sky, being erased almost as fast as it's being drawn. And the owl just watches and relaxes. 
and admires the beauty of where they live. And while the owl relaxes in the tree, so elsewhere in the forest, elsewhere in these woods, another animal is out walking through the snow. And it's a thickly coated snow fox. pushing through the powdery snow, occasionally crunching through some slightly squished down top surface snow. It's almost like snow with a shell. And this snow fox isn't particularly bothered by this cold. It pushes through chin deep through this snow, occasionally finding bits to eat. And then it finds its way to a tree and the tree has a hole in the bottom and that snow fox decides to explore inside that tree and as it enters that tree so it's surprised to see another fox sleeping A fox that's the most beautiful red colour. And that fox seems to be sleeping among leaves. Another vegetation. Making this quite a warm area to sleep. And that snow fox is curious about this red fox. The snow fox had never seen a fox of that colour, had only ever seen other white foxes. And it didn't know whether to wake that fox or not. And so for now it decided it would mark this tree, let the fox sleep, and then come back as the snow begins to clear, at the point where it would normally travel off elsewhere. It'll come back here to meet this fox. And the person in that cabin puts that gerbil back into its cage, decides it's going to have to be more careful this time, and hope that gerbil won't walk off and wander off and get lost again. The person didn't even want to think about how that gerbil came to arrive home, back at the cabin. Didn't want to think about the fact that there could be talking animals out there. And that they could have had a connection with those animals. And they had to go out and gather some bits from down by the lake. And run a few errands. So they wrapped up in 
a warm, thick jacket. Thick trousers, and boots, and gloves. They left the cabin, crunched through the snow, walking round the side of the cabin. They got on to their snowmobile, turned that snowmobile on. and rode it down towards the lake. And they pulled it up near the lake, grabbed some firewood from a shed near the lake, placed that firewood on the back of the snowmobile. Before then setting off into the woods, following a track into the woods. And snow was spraying up behind the snowmobile. And they wished that the snowmobile was quieter. And they would have walked running these errands. But the snowmobile is so much easier than dragging firewood up to your cabin and running errands on foot in this weather. And as they travelled through the woods, so the full moon in the sky sent silver shards of light dancing through the trees on the path in front of them. And as they found a clearing, they came to a halt for a while to admire the view of that bright full moon in the sky. The way it illuminated the snow made the snow appear to sparkle like the surface of that snow is covered in millions of diamonds. And they looked around and they looked in the other direction. They could see the aurora in the sky shooting stars and all the normal stars up there twinkling. And they sat themselves down on the snow for a moment and then lay back on the snow just looking up so warm in their coat and trousers gazing up at the sky noticing their breath rise from their mouth with each out breath as they gaze up at that night sky and while gazing up at the night sky So they started thinking about these animals, thinking about how the owl and the gerbil seemed to talk to each other, thinking about whether that could be real and just coincidence that the gerbil was dropped off on the doorstep, or whether what they imagined actually happened. And they continued their journey back on that snowmobile, heading down to a small village, not far from where they live. And 
and they followed this track through some clearing, through woodland, until it reached what could almost be described as a road. And they continued to follow this, and they could see the small village in the distance, and as they were heading down towards it, they imagined it would make a perfect Christmas card, taking a photo from here of that village. The lights on in the village, the glow of the village. And they headed down into that village. And they pulled up in a snowmobile near a village hall and went into that village hall where there are other villagers here other locals from places near this village and they're all here to put on a bit of a show And this person's job was to play a xylophone as part of a musical act. And a part of his mind was still spent wondering about those animals, about his experiences from earlier in the evening. But he went and set himself up with a xylophone. He took off his outerwear. And different people had done different performances. And then it was his turn with a couple of others. And so he started playing out some music. Initially something really easy, almost like just doing chopsticks on that xylophone. Whenever he played the xylophone and his reasons the reasons for getting into playing the xylophone is that they thought it sounded like children's cartoon interpretations of skeletons and their bones and that had always made them laugh and so they couldn't help themselves, they had to learn to play And so they initially played a couple of very simple tunes, making sure the audience didn't have high expectations. And then started surprising the audience by transitioning into fast paced rock and roll sounding tunes like traditional 1950s rock and roll on a xylophone and Johnny Be Good Blue Suede Shoes they knew this would stun the audience and hopefully entertain. They'd always work up a sweat to do this, but they'd worked hard to achieve this. And after they'd finished, the evening carried on. They mixed with others in the hall, chatted, laughed, socialized for a while. 
they felt uncomfortable with socialising, but felt that having an icebreaker, even something where people are laughing at something they've done intentionally, like at how surprised they are by that performance, would be an icebreaker that would help them to have a conversation starter, something to talk about. And they enjoyed bonding with this one person there, talking with this one person, sharing experiences, especially on nights like this, where it's cold and the desire is just to say sitting in a chair in front of a roaring log fire, reading and then drifting asleep. Nights like this would encourage them to go out to mix with others. And to encourage them to do things they ordinarily wouldn't, but know they would enjoy if they did. And after their evening of fun, so they went back, got on their snowmobile, and made the journey all the way back to their cabin. They carried in the wood, and they settled down in front of that fire. They had a warm drink. before heading off to bed and falling comfortably asleep. And as they drifted comfortably asleep, so they processed the day, processed their experiences, what they learned from the day. And they processed all this in their dreams, and as they processed this in their dreams, they began to have a sense of walking through somewhere warm, almost the polar opposite of their real environment. They had a sense of climbing up a ladder and walking into the Sphinx's mouth in the middle of a desert. And inside this Sphinx, they saw a lion and a tiger. both of which were almost as big as this person, was stood tall. And they were taken aback by this experience, as the lion and tiger just sat down, and then lied down, and then both rolled on their sides, and then on their back. And the person felt this sense of comfort around this lion and this tiger and couldn't explain why there was a lion and a tiger in the belly of the Sphinx, but walked up to the two of them, reached down and started stroking and scratching both their bellies at once. And was shocked by the bizarre purring sound of the lion and tiger. That it was deeper and nothing like the sound of a pet cat. And they could feel the warmth 
and that these animals seem to just want love and affection. And that they may appear scary, but actually, just because they're scary in one setting, doesn't mean they're evil or bad. They have their nature, and their nature includes wanting affection, wanting love and connection. And when the person lifted the hands off the lion and the tiger, both of them almost instantly made a noise that sounded like a disapproving low rumble. And they thought to themselves, just like when you scratch or stroke any animal, once you start, they just want you to keep going and get annoyed if you stop. So they sat down for a while on the floor with the cats, just stroking and rubbing the bellies of those cats, thinking this is the most unusual experience or dream. But they continued anyway, knowing this is teaching something. It's their mind's way of teaching them something. And eventually, the Sphinx began to disappear around them, and the cats beneath both their hands began to fade away, and the world began to extend out into the most beautiful, lush, green valley, with a lake, and a waterfall pouring down into that lake. And at the foot of the waterfall they could notice the way the sun was shining through the spray was creating a rainbow. And as they neared that waterfall they could feel the spray reaching their face. The coolness of that water And they went and sat down near the waterfall, sat down near the lake, and started gazing at the rainbow hovering in the spray. And as they gazed at that rainbow, so the waterfall appeared to be falling upwards whenever they looked at it directly, they could see that it was falling down. But when they gazed at the rainbow and had their peripheral vision noticing the water, the water seemed to be rising up, almost like time was in reverse. And they were highly curious about this. They didn't know if it was an optical illusion caused by the way they're viewing it out of the corner of their eye versus looking directly at it. And they picked up some sticks and they walked around near the waterfall, climbed their way up to the top of the waterfall, 
They walked some way along the river at the top of the waterfall. They then threw one stick in. They waited a minute and then threw the other stick in. And those sticks were far enough away that they were just moving very slowly in the direction of the waterfall. But they knew the closer the sticks get to the waterfall, the faster those sticks will move. And that gave them time to climb back down again. And they went and sat where they were before. And they watched the rainbow. And they watched as the first stick came over the waterfall. And they continued to watch the rainbow. And watch the stick fall out the corner of their eye. And they wondered what would happen, because if everything's moving backwards as it seems, for real, that stick shouldn't fall over the waterfall. But if it's an optical illusion, somehow that stick will fall over the waterfall. And they saw that stick appear at the top of the waterfall. As it falls over the waterfall. And the water continued to appear to flow upwards as that stick fell downwards. And then they looked at the waterfall. As the second stick arrived. And the waterfall was flowing downwards while they looked directly at it. And just as they expected, that stick came over the waterfall. Perfectly normal. And they thought to themselves, oh, that's okay. It was just a simple optical illusion. And as they thought that, so the colours from the rainbow fell out the water and started filling the lake and then flowing through the mist from the waterfall flowing through the spray and then spreading up the waterfall until the waterfall just looked like a solid rainbow with some translucency to it pouring down and into a lake and they knew this was no optical illusion. This was just odd. But they enjoyed watching. As they saw those colours spread. And start to make the whole meadow. All the grassland appear. Vibrant and colourful. as colourful birds took off in the distance and the sky started taking on multiple hues and they drifted deeper and deeper asleep And then they drifted into an even deeper sleep, drifting out of a dreaming sleep into their healing recuperative sleep, going through the usual stages of nightly sleep, 
from dreaming sleep to deep healing sleep. And then some more dreaming sleep. More deep healing sleep through the night. And the next day they awoke, feeling so refreshed and so wonderful, and carried on their usual day after day, as the season carried on. And as the season drew to a close, so the snow fox went back to that tree, waited at the tree for that red fox to awaken. And when the red fox awakened, that snow fox was there to greet it. And the red fox was surprised, had never seen a white fox before. And the snow fox explained who they are. What things have been like while they've been asleep. And the red fox explained who they are. And what things are like when that snow fox isn't around. And the two of them normally went about their lives, not really interacting with others, but found this unusual friendship. And worked out how they could look forward to seeing each other at certain times. And how, because they lead different lives, they have plenty to talk about. And plenty to build friendships around. And as snow cleared, so the woodland came alive with other birds and animals. And colours came back to the woodland. The lake became the most beautiful blue. And that person enjoyed going out on the lake, relaxing in a boat, fishing on the lake, more for the relaxation than the fishing. And enjoyed reaching the end of a day, sitting in the cabin, reading some book, playing with and petting his gerbil, and going to bed and comfortably relaxing asleep, enjoying different dreams and different experiences. Relaxing and drifting so deeply asleep. So as you listen to me tell this story in the background, you can allow yourself to get comfortable, to close your eyes and begin to relax comfortably asleep. And I don't know whether you'll relax deep or asleep to the sound of my voice or the spaces between my words, but as you drift comfortably asleep, you can just listen to me in the background and become absorbed in the story. 
and there was a young and interesting, incredibly creative girl. And she had the most incredible imagination. And she was sitting outside one day in her back garden. Resting on a bench. Looking out over her back garden. She could see the back of her house. She could hear rustling leaves of the trees in the garden, the way they moved in the breeze. She could see the way the grass was swaying and moving, and smell the flowers in the garden. And she found this so deeply relaxing and comforting to know this was her home, somewhere she felt safe and secure, somewhere she enjoyed being. And as she relaxed in her garden, so she lay back on that bench and watched the way clouds moved across the sky, the way shadows moved across her, and the way the sun would come out again. She closed her eyes and allowed herself to relax deeper, and as she did she could notice the way that as clouds passed across the sun, Everything would seem darker under her closed eyelids and she would feel cooler on her face and cheeks and then down across her body and then as the clouds passed so she would feel the warmth of the sun passing across her face, her cheeks she would notice under her eyelids that things got a little lighter and feel that warmth passing down the body, the arms, the legs. And with each passing of the shade and the light, she could feel herself drifting deeper and more comfortably into an experience. And as she drifted deeper, more comfortably, into the experience, she started to have this sense like she was standing in a building. A building she felt comfortable in, but that wasn't familiar to her. And in the corner of the building, in the corner of the room she was in, was a bird cage with a bird in it. And she walked over to that bird cage and watched that bird as it leapt from one place to another, as it occasionally flew around inside the cage and chirped and cheeped in that cage and ate some food and drank some water. And while she watched that bird, she wondered if it wondered about being free and what it might do and where it might go if it was and whether it was aware that it wasn't. And she gave this some deep thought. And while she was deep in thought, wondering this, she walked through this building and through the door leading outside. And she walked out into a garden that felt comfortable, yet unfamiliar. She walked through that garden. 
and at the end of the garden she could see a cave. And she was curious, she loved exploring. She had a deep sense of curiosity and adventure and wonder. And she walked towards that cave and she could feel the way the warmth of the sun was on her face, her body. And then the coolness as clouds passed across the sun. And she reached the cave. And she saw that on the entrance to this cave was an old torch in a frame on the edge of the cave. And it was lit and flickering. And she was curious who lit it why it was flickering. But she decided to take that torch and to walk into the cave. And as she did so, she noticed how the sound changes. How footsteps start echoing. The sound of the occasional drip of water in the distance. And the way the flickering light from the flame on the torch dances around the cave walls and the floor as she walked deeper and more comfortably into the cave. And the cave was initially like a long tunnel, but it then opened up into a cavern and the cavern was so large that the torch couldn't light the ceiling or the walls or the back wall. And she felt a sense of wonder, of curiosity, of excitement and intrigue as she walked deeper into this cave. And initially this cave, this cavern, seemed very empty. But then she noticed on the ground that there were some footprints. And so she followed those footprints. And the footprints led her towards what looked like a small room inside this cavern. And so she walked to that small room, opened a door that led into that small room, and was surprised to see somebody sat there in a meditative position with their eyes closed, breathing slowly, calmly, comfortably as if they're in their own world. And she quietly walked in. And they spoke to her and said, take a seat. As if her wandering in was perfectly natural and normal and expected. And she took a seat crossed her legs, and the person said, close your eyes, and so she closed her eyes, and they said, just breathe, breathe in, and breathe out, that's it, making each out breath longer than each in breath. As you relax deeper and more comfortably. And she followed along with curiosity 
and could feel herself relaxing deeper. She felt so safe and comfortable. Like there was a connection with whoever this person was. And yet she didn't know who they were. And she had dreamt all sorts of things in the past. She dreamt of exploring lands full of dinosaurs. She dreamt of exploring space. She dreamt of meeting her heroes. She dreamt of meeting people she knows in her dreams. But she'd never dreamt this before. And she followed along. And the person continued that as you continue to drift and dream and breathe in that special way, so you will relax deeper and more comfortably into the experience. And as you relax deeper and more comfortably into the experience, so you will begin to rise up in consciousness and discover something incredible. And then the person went silent for a while. And as the person was silent, so their mind deepened. And they began to have this sense of drifting and floating. And they found themselves to be beginning to see something forming in their mind's eye. Almost like a whole new reality. Discovering something forming in their mind's eye. Discovering themselves on a spaceship and they could see through the small windows of the spaceship as they floated within the spaceship that that spaceship was heading towards a vast spaceship in front of them and she was excited and curious about what that spaceship was and the person was with her here in space. And the spaceship floated to the larger spaceship. And both had a synchronized spinning. As this spaceship flew towards an opening in the large spaceship. And flew through that opening. And then the person with her pressed a few buttons and the ship landed itself inside this huge ship. And then they asked her to come with them and excitedly and with curiosity she did. And they left the ship onto the larger ship and there seemed to be no one around. And on this larger ship, there seemed to be gravity, where there was none as they approached the ship. Although she did seem to feel lighter than she knows she normally feels. And they walked through a door and started exploring the ship. And it was as she imagined a spaceship would be. There was lots of grey, lots of metal, and she couldn't see any windows. And they walked down a corridor. 
and then pushed a button to open a door to walk into a room and the door slid open with the sound of that sliding they walked into a room and explored around the room they ascended some stairs before eventually finding a much larger door and they walked through that door where they discovered that this ship had either a vast window in this room or a giant screen that looked like a window and out of that vast window it looked like it was looking down on the planet Earth. Like the ship was in orbit, circling the Earth. And she looked out the window and she could see the country her home is in. She could see storms over some places, wispy cloud in others. and vast amounts of blue and she was so transfixed looking down at the earth it wasn't even crossing her mind to explore anything else and it was almost like time stood still while she stood here she was just in a deep state of amazement wonder, excitement, curiosity gaining this perspective on the planet she lives on and then the person with her called her over to some consoles and she went over to the consoles and they were pressing different buttons and up on a screen she could see information that said about where this ship came from that were records of those who owned this ship and about those who owned this ship being a long lost ancient civilization that explored the galaxy and would find habitable worlds and then search for those habitable worlds which seemed to show signs of life and they would set up these research stations that could monitor that life and the progress of the life from the orbit of the planet. And compared to Earth lives, these aliens had significantly extended lives. They led very slow lives. And as such, they led very long lives. Lives that lasted what in earth times would be millennia. And so they had a different concept of time to us. They could spend 500,000 years of earth years watching humanity become what it became. And to them that wouldn't feel like a great deal of time. It would feel like a few years of their time. And the girl found it really curious, the idea of 
these really long lives and how that makes different periods of time feel like different types of experience. And then after they would monitor a civilization grow, they would monitor the life on a planet grow and develop. They would leave research stations around any relevant place that might be worth coming back to, monitoring again in the future. Before using local resources, creating new ships, to go out and explore other places. knowing that they can come back and visit and that the research centres would continue to monitor and transmit data even if there's no one physically present. And this girl found this deeply fascinating being deeply curious about how she's come up with this kind of dream she's never had before and wondering whether her dreams are ever linked to anything real whether in reality she's dreaming about being up on a spaceship looking down on the planet where down on that planet, perhaps, she's lying there, drifting and dreaming about being up on a spaceship looking down on a planet. And that maybe there's an element of truth or reality to it. Maybe she dreams the past, present or future. And at her young age, she was already having these insightful thoughts about what things could mean. About the nature of time, of reality. And she looked forward to a future where she could work on some of these ideas when she's grown up. And then she heads back with this person to their ship and the ship leaves this large ship. And then as it travels back towards the earth, she finds herself coming around in that room in the cave with the person talking to her, telling her to breathe the opposite to how she was breathing with the in-breaths being just slightly longer than the out-breaths to help her to reorientate back to wakefulness. And she was curious about the whole experience and wondered whether she would dream this again in the future. And she found her way back out of that dream to just being aware that she was just lying on a bench in her back garden with waves of darkness and slight coolness as shadows as the clouds passed over the sun and then waves of light and warmth as the sun revealed itself from behind the clouds and she just felt deeply relaxed there on that bench and decided she wanted to explore the creativity of her mind even further. To explore the positivity that she can create, the wonder, the deep curiosity. And so she opened her eyes, got off the bench, walked across the garden to a swinging chair at the back of the garden 
that was just out of the sun, but just in the nice cool breeze. And she stretched out and relaxed across that chair. And as it swung left and right, left and right, she noticed her breathing falling in time with that gentle swinging and swaying of the chair, and noticed herself drifting and floating comfortably and deeply asleep, where she let herself drift and dream some more, deeper and deeper, with curiosity and wonder and relaxing to those sounds in the garden. Just take a moment to allow your eyes to close. And with your eyes closed, you can just listen along to me in the background. And while you listen along to me in the background, I don't know whether you'll drift asleep deeper to the sound of my voice or to the spaces between my words. And as you listen along to me telling this deep sleep experience, you can just have a sense of lying in a hammock, lying in a hammock in a garden, and that hammock can just gently sway between two trees. And as that hammock gently sways, so the branches in the trees above can move with the breeze. And as they move with the breeze, the light of the sun shining down through the leaves can dance and twinkle and sparkle before your eyes. And while that light dances before your eyes, you can allow your eyes to close. And with your eyes closed, you can notice the light patches passing backwards and forwards across your eyelids of that twinkling light through the leaves. You can hear that breeze and you can feel the gentle rocking side to side of that hammock, rocking you gently and relaxed asleep. And as you rock so gently and calmly asleep, you begin to drift inside you begin to drift into a dream and you find yourself walking through the softest grass and everything around you are shades of dark blue, like you're walking through a field of soft grass at night time, just lit by the moonlight. And that grass is so soft that if you reach down and touch it with your fingertips, it feels almost like feathers brushing against your feet, your lower legs, and touching it with your fingertips. It can feel just like feathers running through your fingers, tickling through the insides of your fingers. And you can see the way the silver light of the moon dances and passes across the grass as it blows almost in waves with the breeze. Almost like silver waves passing silently across the field. And the slight rustling in the distance of the leaves in the trees. And you can see off in the distance a twinkling lake, noticing the way that silvery 
moonlight dances and sparkles like thousands of diamonds on the surface of the lake. And as you walk towards that lake, so you drift deeper and deeper asleep. And I don't know whether you relax deeper asleep with each footstep you take, or the spaces between each footstep. As you find drifting asleep, easier and more effortless walking down to that lake. And as you reach the lake, you can hear the sloshing of the water on the shore, of those small waves just gently lapping there. You can smell that fresh watery air. And you can climb into a rowboat. And the sound of lifting the oars out of the rowboat. Pushing away from the shore. And then the feeling of pushing the oars through the water. As you travel across the lake. And you push that water and you can hear that sound of the oars passing through the water. The dripping of the water off the oars as you pull them back. And the splosh as they go back down into the water. The feeling of pushing that water away. And the boat moving and travelling across the lake. can see the twinkling stars overhead, the moon brightly in the sky, and noticing how still everything is here, with just that gentle lapping of those small and subtle waves, and you travel across the lake on the far side of the lake. You climb out of the boat. And you walk across a slight gravelly area away from the lake. And then across some hardened mud. And you begin to walk into some woodland. And you can walk through that woodland, hearing those rustling leaves overhead. Feeling the bark of the trees under your fingertips. As you work your way around trees, under the branches. And you can see a light on in a cabin in these woods. And so you head towards that cabin. When you arrive at the cabin, you look through the window. And you can see somebody sat, rocking in a chair, in front of a comfortable fire. And that glow of the fire dancing around the room. You can see a cat resting on a rug in front of the fire, sprawled out, looking so peaceful, so comfortable. And you tap gently on the door. And the person comes to the door. They tell you they've been expecting you, and they invite you in. And you walk in, they close the door behind you. They gesture for you to sit down in the other seat by the fire. You walk over to that seat. 
you sit down deeply in the seat and you relax back into that seat so deeply, feeling almost like this was such a comfortable seat to sit in, surprisingly comfortable to sit in. And the cat just glances up at you before lowering its head again, closing its eyes and continuing to drift and dream. And the cat looks so relaxed on the rug that it almost looks like it's melting into the rug, becoming one with the rug. And the person tells you that you're here to go on a journey inside your mind. A journey of discovery, discovering how to relax deeply and profoundly and connect with the world around you. Almost like becoming one with the world around you. And that you didn't know you were going to be here, but they knew they've been expecting you. And that their role is to guide you through an experience. And you wonder what the experience will be. And they lean forward in their chair. They look at you with intent. And they say, just take a moment to close your eyes. And with your eyes closed, you can listen to the sound of my voice. You can hear the sound of that crackling fire in the background, the purring sound of the cat. You can notice that dancing light from the fire. as you continue to drift deeper inside your mind. And while you continue to drift deeper inside your mind, I'd like you just to have a sense of discovering yourself at the top of 10 steps down to the most beautiful beach and you can see down there that water lapping on the shore. You can see the sun setting in the distance. You can notice the colours of the sky. And you can take your time to walk down to that beach. And as you walk down to that beach, I'll count down from ten to one. And on the count of one, you can find yourself standing in that soft sand on the shore. And you can notice what that sand feels like under your feet. But don't find yourself standing on that soft sand until you reach the bottom of the steps. And you can reach the bottom of the steps when I've counted down from ten. And you understand. And you begin to follow along. As they count ten, nine, going deeper and deeper, eight, Deeper and deeper. Seven. Six. Five. And as the counting continues, you find yourself drifting deeper into the experience. You find yourself more absorbed in the beach. Four. Three. Two. 
one. And on the count of one, you find yourself on the beach. And you walk your way along that beach. You walk along the edge between the water and the shore. Those waves lapping over your feet. And then pulling back out past your feet again, out to sea. Before rolling in again, lapping over your feet again. Each time just gently tickling your feet. Almost like you're getting the most comfortable foot massage from the ocean. With the sand travelling backwards and forwards over your feet, through your toes. As you relax and drift even deeper. And while you walk along, they tell you that they want you to walk to the cave. And you look around and you see a cave a little way along the cliff. And so you begin to walk to that cave. And as you approach the cave, so you notice a slight orange glow. And you realise there's a small campfire set up in that cave. And as you get even nearer, you can see that person sitting cross-legged near the campfire. And you walk into the cave. They tell you to sit down comfortably. You sit down, cross your legs. You can hear the spitting, crackling fire. They tell you to close your eyes. And as you close your eyes, they tell you just to notice the way the light dances around in front of your closed eyelids. And as you notice that light dancing around, they're just going to pass their hand down in front of your eyes three times. And on the third time, you can drift and float even deeper asleep. And they say that with each pass, just say to yourself, when I feel tired and want to fall asleep, then I'll naturally just drift asleep. And they pass their hand over your eyes almost giving you a feeling like going down in a lift. And they say three. And you say to yourself, when I feel tired and want to fall asleep, then I'll naturally just drift asleep. And then you pass the hands in front of your face again, too. And you notice your shoulders beginning to slump. Your facial muscles beginning to relax. Your body beginning to relax. And you say to yourself, When I feel tired and want to fall asleep, then... I'll naturally just drift asleep. And then you notice that dark line passing across your face again as they move the hand across your face a third time. One. And with that third time, it's almost as if the sounds here quieten down. And you say to yourself, When I feel tired and want to fall asleep, then 
or naturally just drift asleep. And you begin to hear the sounds of birds in trees. And as you look around, you find yourself in a meadow on a summer's afternoon. And you notice as you stand up in this meadow that this person is still here with you. And they tell you that wherever you go, I'll go with you. My voice will go with you. It'll take whatever form you're comfortable with. Sometimes you may see me. Other times my voice may take the sound of the wind. It may take the rustling of the trees. My voice may be carried in each footstep that you take. But I'll go with you through your journey. Deep inside your mind. And they begin to walk, and you begin to follow. And as you follow them, they tell you to walk with intent, to focus entirely on just walking, just letting all of your awareness focus on just the process of walking, being one with the walking. And so you walk along, being absorbed in the process of comfortably following along behind this person. And you notice the rhythm they're walking with. You notice the rhythm of your breathing and your rhythms falling into sync with each other as you drift deeper asleep. And you follow them as they walk through the meadow. And they walk down to a river. And down at the river, they pick up a stick. They tell you to find a stick. And they tell you to place the stick in the water next to their stick. And you're both going to release those sticks at the same time. And then just watch as those sticks travel down that river. And so you both place your sticks in the river. And let go. And watch as those sticks travel down the river. Bobbing up and down on waves. Circling around little eddies that form in the water, occasionally travel lengthways, other times traveling sideways. As they travel and pick up speed, going further and further down the river, and then the sticks reach some rapids, and you watch as the sticks bob up and down manage those rapids and then continue on beyond the rapids and the person turns to you and says follow me and they begin to walk along the side of the river they have the hands behind their back and they say let's just walk a little deeper into the experience and they walk along to the rapids. They climb over onto one of the rocks that's in the middle of this rapid part of the river. They sit cross-legged on the rock. And they gesture for you to sit on the other rock. And they look over at you and they say, It's time now to go even deeper asleep. They say just take a deep breath in, close your eyes, and do a long breath out, making that out breath longer than the in breath. 
And as that breath out continues, just notice the top of the forehead relaxing. Notice your head relaxing, around the sides of your head relaxing. Relaxing your ears, the back of your head. And then breathing in and on your next out breath. Just noticing the muscles around your cheeks, around your eyes, around your nose, around your jaw, relaxing. And if there's any tension anywhere there, just take a moment to tense that area just for a moment, just safely and gently tensing that area before letting that relax with the next long out breath. Almost like the jaw is getting heavier and heavier. And the muscles around the face are just getting heavier and heavier. And just saying in your mind, soften, soften. Just telling the muscles through your mind and body. Just telling yourself, soften. And as the jaw gets heavier and the muscles relax and soften, with an out breath, allow the muscles around the neck, around the throat, to relax, to soften, to feel calm and peace. And then on the next out breath, allowing the muscles around the shoulders to relax. And then on the next out breath, allowing the muscles down both upper arms to relax, going deeper and deeper with each out breath, and then the muscles down the lower arms to relax, almost as if they become so heavy, so loose and limp. as if those arms were like wet rags just hanging beside you, so deeply relaxed. And on the next out breath, allowing that relaxation to spread to the hands, to the fingertips, all the way to the tips of your fingers, and the thumbs, And then on the next out breath, allowing relaxation to spread through and around the chest and the upper back. And those muscles just softening, relaxing, becoming heavy, loose and limp. And then on the next out breath, allowing that relaxation to spread down to the lower back, to the stomach, to the sides. And those muscles relaxing, softening so deeply, so comfortably. with the sound of that running water, of the rapids travelling around these stones. With the next out breath, that relaxation spreading down to your buttocks, and then down to the upper legs, 
getting heavier and heavier, softening deeper and deeper. With those muscles softening and relaxing deeply into the legs. And then on the next out breath, allowing the muscles in the lower legs to soften and relax so deeply, so heavy, so calm, all the way down to your feet. And then with your whole body physically relaxed. They tell you they're just going to reach over a moment and they're just going to touch you gently on the top of the head. And at the point that they touch you on the top of your head, as you breathe in, you can breathe in comfort and deep relaxation. And as you breathe out, you can breathe out any stress, tension, any worries. And you can find that almost becoming a cycle that you breathe in comfort, calmness, relaxation. You breathe out any stress, tension and worries. And you notice a calming light passing through your body as you do this, from the top of your head, passing down through your body to the tips of your toes almost like that healing light is filling your body with peace, calm and tranquility until you're totally full of that healing light. And then with each out breath, that healing light can begin to seem to almost emit from you, seem to emanate out of you and spread into the stone beneath you, spread and flow through the river, connect with the world around you, connecting you through your breathing in and out with the wider world and they guide you through this process of connecting, drifting deeper and more relaxed to sleep. And as you drift deeper asleep, seemingly so effortlessly and easily resting here, being guided. They tell you that now you're physically relaxed and physically prepared to begin to drift deeper asleep. that you may discover from time to time that my voice seems to fade away so much, it's almost like it's disappeared, like you've drifted so deeply asleep, you stop being aware of my voice here as I guide you, as you go even deeper and deeper relaxed. And that's okay. And it may be that my voice disappears for a moment or two at first and then gradually disappears for longer and longer until you fully fall asleep comfortably. And I don't know whether that'll take one minute, two minutes or four minutes or maybe somewhere in between. 
to happen automatically, easily and effortlessly. And as you drift asleep, so I'll guide you on an experience of relaxing the mind. And they tell you that to relax your mind, I'd like you to imagine a door in front of you. And you're standing up in front of that door. And you open the door and you step through the door. You turn and close the door behind you, finding yourself in a pitch black room. And you turn a light on in this room. And in every direction you look, all you can see is a comfortable light. You can't see the walls on any direction. You can't see the ceiling or the floor. And you can walk in this room and yet you can't feel the floor beneath your feet. And in this room you discover after a few steps, that there's no up, down, left, right, forward or backwards, whatever way you look, everything seems the same. There's no shading, no shadows. And you notice yourself beginning to float in this room, almost like floating in a flotation tank. And as you float, it's almost as if you're relaxing in space, in the most comfortable light. And while you float there, you become very still. And as you become very still, So you have a sense of beginning to see flashes of light, beginning to create something in your mind from the nothing that's there. And those flashes gradually turn into glimpses of pictures. And then occasional sounds and smells and then you find yourself at the top of the most beautiful garden. You notice there are ten steps between here and there. And you descend those ten steps. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five. Four, going deeper and deeper, three, two, one, reaching the bottom of the steps and walking deeply into the garden, smelling the flowers, seeing butterflies and bees flying around the different plants. touching the petals of a rose, feeling that waxiness, smelling the rose, walking on that soft grass around the garden, noticing the wide variety of colours of the plants, that slight breeze blowing the plants, blowing the trees walking through this garden. And as you walk through this garden, you feel drawn to a shed at the back of the garden. And when you open the shed door and walk into the shed, you discover that the other side of that shed door seems to be some kind of strange and secret land you come out on an inky purple ocean 
with the most beautiful dark blue sky and sparkling, swirling clouds in the sky. And the most incredible toadstools, the most incredible mushrooms dotted around this land. Mushrooms that are taller than you are. And you realize that many of these mushrooms seem to have windows with lights on. And you walk to one of them. And you see that these are inhabited. This seems to be a village made of mushrooms. And one of the friendly beings comes out of a mushroom. They tell you that they've been waiting for you. They guide you to a campfire surrounded by logs. They sit you on one of the logs. Then the entire village gathers around the campfire. Some of them sit in a location with drums. They begin to beat out a rhythm on the drums. And then others start dancing and chanting around the fire. And they tell you to beat out that rhythm. To feel that rhythm. As if that rhythm's in your heart. In your soul. As if that rhythm is in such a way that you almost can't help but move to the rhythm. And you find your feet wanting to move to the rhythm as you drift deeper asleep. And you know now that this is deep in your mind. Your body fell asleep long ago. You're now just making that journey through to a healing space where you can heal the mind and the body and go through the nightly process of healing and recuperation of the mind, body and spirit, ready to start the next day, feeling so alert and refreshed and revitalized. feeling like you've had the most perfect night's sleep. Knowing that when you wake, you wake up feeling like you've had the most perfect night's sleep. Setting you up just perfectly for the day. And you watch and follow the rhythm and watch that fire dancing Watch these beings dancing around the fire. Hear that rhythm. See the joy on the faces of all the beings. See the fun that they're having. And then you see that person walk over to you again. And they tell you, it's time to now sleep. And they guide you to a boat that's moored just off the shore. And they say, this boat's especially for you. That sleeping in this boat will give you a chance to travel to your sanctuary. Where you can drift to any dream. You can sleep deeply and soundly. You can sleep all night long. Doing inner healing on your mind, body and spirit. 
and they guide you onto that boat. You head to the bed on the boat. They leave you alone on that boat. They say good night. You settle down in that bed. You can feel that gentle side to side rocking of the boat, reminding you of the hammock, just gently rocking you, relaxed asleep. Almost like a parent rocking a child gently and relaxed asleep. And as you rock and relax asleep, you find yourself drifting to that sanctuary in your mind. You drift and float to that sanctuary in your mind. And discover what that's like, that this is your special place where dreams are made. that only you know every time you come here what you'll see here what you'll hear here what you'll do here and where here will be each time and here may be somewhere else in the future but here will always be here will always be your sanctuary will always be that safe place to know you've reached the point of sleep, to transition to your inner healing processes, to access all your deeper wisdom and knowledge, connecting with the knowledge of the universe around you, being one with the world, while you go on this healing journey of deep and profound sleep, knowing that this is a very private experience for you to have alone as you drift and float so deeply, so comfortably, so profoundly asleep, knowing this will trigger the most wonderful feeling of awakeness and alertness in the morning. And any time when you wake up, at appropriate times that you want to wake. And so you just drift and float, comfortably and relaxed, asleep. Okay, so take a moment to allow your eyes to close and to begin to comfortably drift asleep. And as you begin to comfortably drift asleep, you can listen to me talking to you in the background. And as you listen to me and follow along to this story, you can just drift and float and dream and comfortably fall asleep. And you can have a sense of somebody walking through some woodland. And as they walk through that woodland, they're following a wooded path. They've got trees towering overhead. The rustling of the leaves, the sound of each footstep they take. And as they take each footstep, so they go deeper and deeper into the woods. And while they're walking deeper and deeper into the woods, they can hear the sounds of birds around them, hearing the distant sound of some pheasants, walking deeper and deeper into the woodland, hearing scurrying sounds, smelling the sounds of the woodland. 
as they continue to walk deeper and deeper. And they notice the way that as the woodland becomes more dense, it becomes slightly darker and there's just the dancing light of the sun as it manages to grab a few shards through the leaves above dancing on the path as they walk and they feel so relaxed walking through this woodland just drifting and floating in their mind wandering having pleasant thoughts as they walk along and occasionally stopping just to touch a tree or two to run their fingers around the bark of the tree, notice the different textures, the different feelings of different bark on different trees, how some smooth and others are rougher, and that soft feeling of moss on trees. And while they continue walking, deeper into the woodland. They decide to take a turning off the path, heading into the denser wood. And they know there's some cliffs somewhere off in the distance. They decide to head off towards those cliffs. And so, as they walk into that denser woodland, they notice how the sounds change. How, with all this woodland around, the sounds seem to at the same time become more muffled, and yet some sounds seem to echo and reverberate through the woods. And they walk deeper and deeper until eventually they find their way to that cliff deep in the woodland. And apart from the natural sounds, when they're very still, there's just silence. A slight rustling of leaves as the wind blows across the tops of the trees. But other than that, just silence. And they notice that cliff. They notice how it appears to be made of chalk. And they walk along the side of the cliff. They know there's something they're looking for. And they're sure they're going to find it. And they walk along the side of that cliff until eventually they find what looks like a boulder resting against the cliff. And that it looks like that boulder has part of it embedded in the cliff. But they know from some research they did with some old texts about the area that this boulder isn't just something resting against the cliff or even something that is naturally embedded in the cliff. It's a boulder blocking an entrance into a cave. And so, with a tremendous amount of effort, they push and they pull on that boulder, pushing on one side, trying to loosen one side, pulling on the other, then pushing and pulling and gradually wiggling and worming that boulder out from that cliff until eventually they're able to rest their back against the cliff, give one last push with their feet on that boulder 
and move it just enough to allow themselves to notice that there's a gap behind that boulder. Not just a gap where the boulder was, but like a tunnel going deep into this cliff. And they get a torch out. And they shine that torch into the tunnel and they carefully squeeze themselves between the boulder and the cliff and into that gap and into that tunnel. And with excitement, they begin to walk inside that cliff face, following that tunnel, walking deeper and deeper. following that tunnel, walking deeper and deeper, noticing how the temperature changes slightly as they walk into the cliff, walk into that tunnel, noticing the darkness other than what's lit up by the torch, and the way the torch illuminates dust particles in the air, and the echoey sound of footsteps and the distant sound of dripping like dripping in a cave as they walk deeper and deeper and while they walk deeper into this tunnel they start to have this sense of something following them. And they don't know what, or even if something's following them. And they feel a little uncertain and unsure about this. They don't feel threatened, they just feel uncertain unsure about not knowing what's following them, or even if something's following them, whether it's just a sense that they have. And they walk deeper and deeper. And as they walk deeper, so the sound seems to fade away. Almost like all the sound is muted. Like somehow the sides of the tunnel have perhaps changed material and are absorbing the sound rather than allowing sound to echo. And they're sure they can hear the sound of footsteps behind them like a padding of feet. And they decide to stop and wait and face the uncertainty and see what might be there. And as they stop and wait and shine the torch back the way they came, so they notice something initially shadowy in the distance and then getting closer and closer, just calmly and comfortably walking towards them. And they notice it looks like a wolf, and as it gets closer and closer, they see that it is, that it's the most beautiful white wolf. And they feel calm around this wolf, they don't feel threatened in any way. Almost like somehow this was supposed to be a companion of theirs on this journey. And they're unsure why this wolf has followed them in here. Or why they feel like this wolf is supposed to be a companion to them. And the wolf sits at their feet. And then rests its head down demonstrating that it's not a threat.
and then the two of them carry on the journey, walking further down this tunnel. And they continue walking down this tunnel until they come to a crossroads and there are two paths to take. And the wolf walks down one side, stops a little way down, turns and sits down. And the person wonders which route to take and decides that the wolf obviously knows best and so continues following the wolf. And as they walk down that tunnel, so the tunnel splits again, and the wolf makes a decision. And then splits again, and the wolf makes another decision. And they just continue following that wolf, trusting the wolf, deeper and deeper, into this system of tunnels. And it feels like they've been walking for hours, deeper and deeper underground. Almost like they're walking through some kind of uh, maze underground that fortunately the wolf seems to know where they're going. And after what felt like hours of walking underground they come across what looks like a doorway with a heavy, solid, wooden door. And the wolf sits at the door and the person tries to push the door unsuccessfully, tries to pull on the door unsuccessfully and then realises they have to solve a puzzle. That there are bits around the room, bits around the outside of where they are. That they have to move around, and obviously there's some kind of a locking system. And so they start looking and working out what the pattern must be and then turning things and pushing things in and pulling things out and moving things around in this room until after a while they hear a click and the door naturally just slides open and they walk through that door to discover a grand cave lit up by some kind of a glowing stone that's covering the ceiling of the cave and in fissures down the walls creating a glow in this space and in the centre of the cave are some vast abandoned ruins of an ancient civilization. And this was what this person came looking for. They'd heard that there was an ancient civilization once here, in this area. And it was at a time that there was a lot of warring going on. And so this civilization had decided to build their civilization underground and hide it from the world. And they would rarely come out and interact with others. But then something happened that made the civilization die out and only a few of the civilization survived and those few went out and spread the word and spread knowledge of the civilization, of their advanced technology for their time. Their ability to build and keep themselves hidden from the world. 
and over thousands of years. It just drifted into legend and rumours. And people stopped believing in this civilization. And this person walked over to those ruins. And they're in pretty good condition. And they entered the ruins. And noticed how much gold was all over the walls in the ruins to bounce light around the corridors, around to the different rooms. There was artwork that could have been painted yesterday, that was as beautiful as Renaissance art, yet thousands of years earlier. And there were contraptions in some of the artwork, that looked unusual, but more modern, and definitely not things from thousands of years ago. And they were hunting for the Grand Library. They'd heard that this specific location, and this specific building, would contain a grand library, and the knowledge of the civilization, and the knowledge passed down from previous civilizations to that civilization, untouched for thousands of years. And after much searching from room to room, they discovered the Grand Library, containing thousands upon thousands of books, stretching up high above their head, and rows and rows of books, and all around the outside. And they could see at the far end of the library was a pedestal and on that pedestal was an ornate book. And they went to that book and they couldn't read the writing, they couldn't understand the text, but they could understand the images on the pages the freshly painted images as they looked, and they could see the tale of times gone by, of land beyond land, creating one huge land mass, before the last ice age, ended and flooded the vast plain between this land and the rest of the land of civilizations that lived and flourished within that plain and across the vast land And of how quickly that flood came. How a wall of ice gave way. And in an instant. Vast quantities of water. Flooded and cut off one land from another. Destroying everything in its path. And they managed to keep their civilization going, but with the smaller land, new, younger civilizations sprung up, tribes sprung up, 
they grabbed what land there was. They staked their claim. They said, this is mine. And they started clinging to things as if they belonged to them. They were no longer of the land. They were now commanding the land and saying the land is theirs. And yet this ancient civilization disagreed that that's the way to be, felt that everything should be open, shared, that more is achieved through peace and collaboration than trying to compete for resources and destroy each other. And so they hid their civilization away for thousands and thousands of years letting these other civilizations come and go, conquering, receding, being defeated, new conquerors would come in. And yet they would all have the same mentality, a mentality of ownership over the environment. And this was always their downfall. But this civilization remaining isolated was destined to gradually die out, very slowly, generation after generation. And so it ended with the last of the civilization going out to spread their word of peace, of love, of kindness and compassion of working together, bringing down barriers, of self-expression, of being who you want to be. And of being able to have an attitude of finding solutions to problems working together collaboratively and facilitating getting the best from each other and utilizing each other's strengths. And that's how such a small civilization had survived for so long here. And they brought down all barriers and wanted to share that knowledge with others, because they lived in peace, in harmony with the world around them. And the wolf and this person walked out of these ruins, out of that library, out of that building, and continued walking a bit further where they noticed a chamber opened up into an even more vast area that looked like an underground village. And they could see where this entire civilization had lived, seeing play areas, seeing what the buildings looked like, seeing parks, seeing how they'd managed to capture sunlight from outside and funnel it down to underground, just using natural resources and what can be learned from this civilization. And this person wondered what should they do? Should they tell others about this civilization? Or just record what they've discovered for future generations, but not reveal where. And they decided that they would take a few of the books of this civilization as something they can take back to help to educate others 
and they would just say that they found them somewhere up top, on the surface. And they wouldn't draw attention to where this civilization was. And they found their way all the way back out, the way they came. Following that wolf all the way back to the entrance. And once out of the entrance, they sealed that cave up again. And walked back through the woods. And they found their way back to the path, and the wolf remained with them. And the wolf walked with them as they walked all the way down to a lake. And they sat by that lake for a while. They pitched up a tent, cooked some food as the sun set. And the wolf never left them. It became a companion. It seemed to want to spend its time. Almost like it was watching over them. And they settled down for the night. With the flickering flames of the campfire as it. Burnt down to embers. And was just a glow. The lapping sound of water of the lake on the shore. The sound of the breeze on the tent. The distant sounds of nightlife. Of birds and bats. And other animals at night in the woods. As they relaxed down and drifted and floated deeper. And deeper asleep. Take a moment to get yourself comfortable and allow your eyes to close. And with your eyes closed, you can hear the sound of my voice in the background. And as you listen to the sound of my voice, I'm just going to tell a story. And I don't know whether you'll drift deeper asleep to the sound of my voice or perhaps the spaces between my words. And as you drift asleep, you can just imagine yourself walking along a cliff top. And as you walk along that cliff top, you can gaze out to sea. And as you gaze out to sea, you can notice way off in the distance is the tail end of a passing storm. You can see the way the rain is falling into the sea, way over on the horizon. See the occasional silent flashes of lightning in the clouds as those clouds continue to drift further and further away over the horizon. And you can notice what that sea looks like from up here on the cliff. Perhaps noticing the white water on the tops of the waves as they roll in towards the shore. Maybe even hearing the waves down on the shore below. And noticing some seabirds. Perhaps noisily flying in the sky having their first flight after the storm. And as you walk along that cliff top, you can head towards the lighthouse. And when you reach the lighthouse, you can notice 
the way that light beams out to sea, swings around the sea, and then pushes out again, circling around and around. And you can walk up to the door of the lighthouse, and hear the sound of that door as you open it, and walk inside. And you can notice what the furniture is like in here. There's always that curiosity of how someone will place the furniture in a lighthouse with curved walls. And notice the thickness of those walls, of the window sills. How deeply set in those windows are. And you can see that there's a hatch leading down under the lighthouse. And you can be curious about what's down there. But for now, decide to ascend, decide to follow that spiral staircase all the way up to the top of the lighthouse, walking around that spiral staircase, going higher and higher up that lighthouse. And at the top of the lighthouse, is a hatch that leads up to the light. You can open that hatch and climb up into the room with the light. And walk over to the window and stand looking out to sea, aware of how high up you are up here. And as that light continues to turn, you feel the warmth of that light on the back of your neck as it passes by you and you see your shadow stretched across the sea. And from up here, You can see that storm going off in the distance. And then you notice, way off on the horizon, almost like a light flashing back. And you don't know whether it's a boat or whether from this height you're able to see the shore of some land a long way away. And you climb back down from this light, go down the staircase. And when you're back on the ground floor, you decide to open that hat and see what's under this lighthouse. And you know you're up high on a cliff. And so you wonder whether this hatch leads down into the cliff. And you open the hatch, and you see a shaft beneath that hatch, and a ladder. And you follow that ladder down deeper under the lighthouse. And you feel like you're descending for such a long time. So long that you start getting curious about when you're going to reach the bottom. And the whole time you're descending, the light above you gets further and further away and everything around you gets darker and darker. 
and eventually you start to hear the distant echoey sound of the occasional drop in what sounds like an echoey cave. And then you finally reach the ground. And you see next to you on the ground with the light on a mobile phone. There are some matches and some candles and so you, you make a torch with those candles. You light a candle. And you notice the way the flickering flame of a candle dances. It's light on the walls. Shadows moving. The smell of that candle flame. You notice there seems to be a bit of a breeze down here from somewhere. The way that flame dances in your hand. And as you walk down this corridor, you notice it looks like it's been hand cut. Like someone's just been down here with a pickaxe. Hacking away, creating this space. And you see at regular intervals what looks like lights on the walls to be lit by the flame from the candle. And as you light each one with the flame, So, a little bit more area glows to life. And you start to see more and more of this space. And you're curious how deep you are. Whether you descended beyond the depth of the cliff, or whether you're just within the cliff. And you wonder why someone dug this space out. And as you continue exploring, so the sounds of dripping water increases. And then you start hearing just a distant faint rumble and you continue walking through the cavern walking down different corridors different tunnels exploring other caverns lighting the lights as you go And that rumbling sound increases. And eventually you find yourself in a vast cavern that seems to have a river flowing through it. It seems to be quite a wide river. That's just creating a low rumble as water from a waterfall pours in at one end. And as the rivers wide, so the rivers reasonably slow moving. And you see, tied to the shore, is a rowboat. And you decide to explore. You've come this far. So you decide to get into that rowboat and explore. So you untie it from the shore. Use an oar to push off from the side. And 
You hear that sloshing around the boat. You climb into the boat, feel the rocking as you get in, get settled in that boat. Pushing away from the shore. And then using the oars to direct yourself and to gently push yourself along the river. And you don't have to do much pushing. It's more just steering, keep yourself on track. And you still have that candle, which you've rested down in a gap that seemed to be designed specifically to hold a candle at the front of the boat. And as you head out of the cavern, following that river, So the ceiling of this cavern seems lower and you enter what seems like a channel created just by the flow of this water and the water speeds up slightly. You can see the way the light flickers around the walls on the ceiling and occasionally that water sprays up a little bit splashing on the boat splashing against the walls and you notice it has a salty smell and you realize that this river must be seawater that's flowed in here somehow. And then all of a sudden, that water begins to speed up. And the boat begins to speed up. And you feel yourself pushed back slightly in that rowboat with the acceleration. And then it feels almost like you're on a water ride. Suddenly it becomes more steep. And you feel like you're dropping down, following that water. As it seems to go steeply down. Before after quite a while, starting to straighten out more again. It seems to have a few turns, a few twists. And use the oars to reduce the amount you knock into the sides. Before ending up in another larger space with calmer water again. And you try and look around you, see where you are. And you can't really see much, just that faint glow on the cave walls. And you notice that you're gradually drifting towards another tunnel. And this one turns out to be steeper than the last. And you feel perfectly fine, perfectly safe. But you feel like you should just hang on a little bit and go with the flow. And the next time it comes out to another underground lake, you notice something different about this area. That it's much colder than where you left. And you notice the boat seems to be moving through the water, almost as if that water has become a little bit more syrup-like, a little bit thicker. And you put your hands into the water. And you feel how cold that water is. And 
And now the breeze down here has increased significantly to what it was like when you entered this area, when you came underground. And you pull the boat over to the side. You tie the boat to a rock. You climb out of that boat and you see a tunnel to follow. And you walk down that tunnel. And although this has felt like a long ride, You're curious how far you've come for it to be so cold and where you've ended up. And you start to hear a howling wind sound. And you find your way down a cave and you see a light at the end of the tunnel. And you head towards that light. And you notice, as you start getting closer to that light, that everything outside that light is white. And the closer that you get, the more you realize that it's snow. And you find yourself coming out in a snowy environment. And you can see a little way in the distance. There's a log cabin. And it doesn't look like there's any lights on in the log cabin. It doesn't look like there's anybody there. But you decide you want to get yourself warm and try and figure out where you are. And so you push through that snow towards the log cabin, pushing your feet through the snow, crunching on snow, walking through higher bits of powdery snow, having to push through some trees and the branches and the snow falling off those branches and that cold wind on your cheeks and eventually you reach that cabin you open the door enter the cabin, close that door behind you Notice the sudden drop in sound of that wind. And the first thing you do is find a way to warm yourself up. You see that there's some wood and there's a log fire. And you put wood in the fireplace. You start yourself a fire. You then go through to the bedroom. You notice there's loads of incredibly fluffy blankets. The softest blankets you could find. And you wrap a couple of blankets around you. Almost like those blankets are giving you a hug and you feel that warmth. And before doing anything else, you go and sit in a chair, an incredibly comfortable chair, by that log fire. And you relax in that chair wrapped in blankets. And you just calm down your breathing and relax and just watch the fire watch the way the flames dance in the fireplace 
hear that crackling, feeling the warmth of that fire on your cheeks, the warmth of the fire warming your legs and your feet and your hands. and feeling more comfortable as you relax in front of that fire. And after you've warmed up, you decide to take a moment to see if there's anything to eat. And you find a tin of carrots you find a bag of marshmallows. But you don't find much else here. And so you open the tin of carrots. You cook the carrots and you just eat them as they are. But the thing you're looking forward to is the marshmallows. you go back to your seat and you have a poker and you just sit next to the fire and while you relax you take marshmallows one at a time heating it up and then eating it and relaxing, then heating another one up, and then eating it, almost drifting into your own little world in your mind, while you just heat marshmallows and eat them, until you decide that perhaps you should be more productive. This is, after all, a strange experience. Because you don't know where you are and how a simple tunnel could transport you here. And so you start searching the cabin to try and figure out where you are. And you can't find any immediate clues. And so you look out the window to see if outside there are any clues. And then you notice that there's a polar bear and a polar bear cub just walking through the woods, through the trees. and heading out into the snow. And you think that's a curious sight, given that a little while ago you were stood in a lighthouse on a cliff. And you wonder whether that's a clue as to where you are. And the sky is blue. It's quite windy, but the sky is blue. And you notice the sun's beginning to set. And so you think when you see the stars, perhaps you'll recognize where you are. And as the sun begins to set, and you wait for that sun to set. You find yourself waiting and waiting. And the longer you wait, the more that sun seems to be rising again. And you notice that for some reason here, the sun isn't setting. It's reaching a sunset, but then it's 
turning into a sunrise. And you decide that you're going to get a good night's sleep. And you can go and explore in the morning. And so you take all those blankets to the bedroom. You make yourself the coziest, most comfortable bed you can. You wrap yourself up in that bed. And close your eyes. And drift and float comfortably asleep. And while you sleep, you begin to dream. And it doesn't surprise you that your dreams are a little unusual, given that your experience is a little unusual. Find yourself walking through a forest. And you notice there's something unusual about the plants here. They have these enormous leaves. And you watch as a squirrel climbs a tree. You watch the way it leaps from one tree to another. And then scampers its way around the trunk of a tree, pausing part way round, its legs stretched out, and then scampering around some more, high up into the tree. And as you watch that squirrel, so you hear thuds in the background. You can feel the ground shaking beneath your feet with each thud. You wonder whether there's a pile driver somewhere, perhaps trying to drive something into a deep hole. You decide to explore, to find out. And when you go to explore, suddenly you see what looks like a tree trunk lift off the ground, move forward, and then thud back down again, followed by what looks like another tree trunk and another and another. And then you notice even more and you follow those tree trunks up with your eyes and you realize that they're the legs of enormous dinosaur. And you look out towards the heads of the dinosaur and you see that they seem to be sweeping their heads from side to side, clearing the area around them of vegetation in arcs around their heads. They seem to have their necks stretched out and they eat some food and then they move their head along slightly, they eat some more food. And they do that until they've moved their head all the way from one side across to the other and then they take a step so they can reach some more vegetation and they do the same again and you perhaps think to yourself that you thought that these dinosaurs with these long necks would be reaching up high into canopies of trees eating the leaves from high up in trees, imagining it would be a bit like watching giraffe eating. 
but instead they seem to be sweeping their heads from side to side, just slowly eating what's in front of their head, then eating a bit further along, a bit further along. And this was behaviour you weren't expecting to see. And you wonder if there are these dinosaurs, what else is perhaps here? And you also wonder whether these dinosaurs would notice if you climbed up on their back. You felt that might help you to get a better view of things. And so you walk to the back end of one of the dinosaurs. You climb up on its tail while it's feeding. And you follow its tail up to its back. And it doesn't seem to notice you at all. You suspect that perhaps it doesn't have a lot of feeling for subtleties like a small creature like you climbing on it. And you look around and you realise that this is some kind of prehistoric land. And that it looks totally different to the kind of land you're used to, yet it has a certain familiarity. And you see off in the distance something twinkle or shine, like a light in the distance. And you decide that's the place to go and explore. That will perhaps give you answers about this dream and you're aware that this dream feels so lucid and so real. You're so aware that you're aware that you're actually fast asleep in a cabin. And so you climb down from the dinosaur. You dodge around and between the dinosaurs. As you run out of this area in the direction of that light. And you push on through different vegetation, hearing different sounds of unfamiliar animals. Eventually, hearing an electrical buzzing sound. And then seeing what looks like a blue portal, almost like it's got lightning or electricity buzzing around it and being sucked into the sides of it, creating a tunnel in space and time. And you decide that in this dream, you're going to go through that portal and see where it leads. And so you run and you jump through that portal. And you find yourself landing on the softest sand. On the most beautiful beach. With water gently lapping on a shore. And you see on the shore, just where the water meets the shore, that there's a bottle that seems to just be washed up and back on the shore, just bobbing onto the sand, being pulled a little way back out to sea, then being washed back onto the sand. And you pick up that bottle you find that there's a message inside the bottle. And you take the paper out of the bottle. And it looks like it could have been written yesterday. 
but you notice that there's a date in the top corner that shows it was actually written hundreds of years earlier. And that it talks about a ship carrying treasures. And that the ship is in trouble. And you wonder what happened to that ship. And you see there's coordinates. And the coordinates aren't too far. And the map that's scribbled onto this note shows that it isn't too far, if it's correct, to get to where that ship last was. You don't know what happened, whether anything would be where that ship was at the point of the bottle being thrown overboard. But you decide to explore anyway. And you see that there's a rowboat up on the beach. You take that rowboat down to the water. You row out to sea. Over the waves by the shore. And then you look down. Into that clear water. And you can see what looks like a wreck down there. And it doesn't look too far down. That it had hit rocks near enough to the shore. And that at the time it hit those rocks, perhaps they didn't realise how close to the shore they were. There's obviously no lighthouses around here. And so you decide to dive down. The water's really calm. So you decide to dive down, taking a deep breath. Being in a deeply relaxed state. And exploring and seeing if you can find what's down there. And you dive down and notice how, once you're underwater, sound changes, softens, deepens. Time seems to slow right down. As you swim down deeper and deeper. And you see a chest on the sea floor just inside the wreck of the boat. And it's only a small chest, but you decide to grab hold of that chest, push off the bottom and swim up to the surface. You place that chest in your rowboat. You then go round to the back of the rowboat, pulling yourself up and over the back of the rowboat. As the rowboat gently turns in the water and bobs up and down. And you row back towards the shore. And back at the shore. You open that chest. Curious what will be in there. And as you open that chest. You find a crystal. And you hold that crystal. And you're sure you can feel energy coming from the crystal. And this whole experience feels surprisingly lucid. 
and you feel that this crystal somehow has meaning. And you close that chest, keeping hold of the crystal. And as you do, so you start to hear sounds of robins and sounds of other birds. And you find yourself awakening in that cabin. And you find that there are bird sounds that you're familiar with even though you're in an unfamiliar place and you don't know where those sounds are coming from. It's almost like it was a natural alarm clock just telling you it was time to come back from that dream. And you notice that that crystal is sitting beside you on the side table next to the bed. And you start trying to think whether that crystal was always there. And that's why you dreamt it. Or whether somehow you took that crystal out of your dream. And you pick the crystal up and you decide to take that with you. As you explore this area, you know you have to watch out for the polar bears. So you keep an eye out for them. You look around before leaving the cabin. And you head into the woods, head into the trees. And you see an unusual sight. You see a squirrel climbing the trees, jumping from one tree to another, and with each landing, a puff of snow falls from the tree. And then you see that squirrel in a tree, and see it bashing a nut or some kind of object and then eating what it's just broken into. And you notice that it seems to be using tools. And you admire how intelligent the squirrels seem to be. And you wonder what other animals around here that you can't see And you can't stop here to drift into a meditation to find out. So you just continue to explore. And while you explore, you notice footprints in the snow. And you realize they look like human footprints. So you decide to follow those footprints, see who else is here. And you follow those footprints through the trees, coming out near some cliffs. And you keep following those footprints. And then you find a cave and you see there's a fire lit in the cave. And you notice someone sat cross-legged by that fire. And they're just chanting to themselves with their eyes closed. So focused on just chanting. Almost seemingly unaware of your arrival. And you sit down cross-legged the other side of the fire. Waiting for them to be aware of you. And you have this sense that they are aware of you. But what they're doing is more important to them 
than acknowledging your presence. And you find something about their chanting, almost hypnotic, almost seeming to draw you in, especially with the flickering of the fire between you and that sound of the wind just outside the cave, the way that wind seems to whistle slightly as it blows past the cave. And eventually, that person opens their eyes, and they say that you found a crystal on a beach, and that crystal belongs here, and you'll know where when you go there. And you felt this was a little cryptic. And you asked for more information. And they just repeated the same thing. You found a crystal here. And they tell you the same information that still makes little sense. And eventually, when you've asked three or four times, they tell you to go and explore the cave. And as they tell you to explore the cave, you hear the dripping of the water off of the icicles hanging in the cave entrance. And they draw your attention more so to that dripping. And they tell you to grab some water first. And they offer you a pot. And tell you to stand under an icicle until the pot is full. And so you stand under that icicle, holding that pot. And it seems to take so long to fill that pot with water. And you want to just put the pot down, let it fill itself. But they tell you, no, you need to stand there. And have the patience to fill that pot. And then they go back to meditating and chanting by the fire. And as they meditate and chant by the fire, so you gaze at that water, filling that pot. And eventually that pot fills to the top with water. And they tell you that that water you've just gathered is directly from nature. It's cycled around and it'll continue cycling around long after you've been and gone. But that that is a healing elixir. And it'll help you to heal yourself on many levels, spiritually, physically, emotionally, psychologically, and that that'll help you with your entire journey, and they encourage you to drink, and so you drink that ice cold water, you can feel that water it passes into your mouth, down your throat, and down through your body, and then you can feel it almost turning to a warmth as the healing begins to spread around your body, down to the tips of your toes, out to your fingertips, up to your cheeks, your head, round through your face and neck through your chest, your stomach, 
through the whole of your body. And you feel that healing passing through you and filling you up. And then they tell you you're ready now to head into the cave. And you walk into the cave. And as you walk into that cave, so you notice this cave is full of crystals that the tiniest bit of light reflects around the walls, making everything sparkle wherever you look. And that right in the middle of this cave is a space for your crystal. And you walk over, you place that crystal into that space. And as soon as you do, it's almost like it turns on a projector here. It's almost like a holographic projector projecting 3D images that surround you. You notice children having a snowball fight. You see happy people running on a beach, hearing the sound of waves lapping on the shore. People having fun, people walking dogs, people in a park playing. You seem to see many memories and thoughts and ideas from people through time and space. And that person had said that you'll learn from this experience here. And you watch then begin to feel a sense of positive emotion as you connect with the learning, as that starts taking hold within you, learning what different images, different movies playing out around you mean, how they relate to being. And you feel that that somehow connecting deep within you and then growing and welling from within you to fill your body like the healing elixir. And then almost as quickly as it had appeared, the room went dark, the cave went dark. And you knew that deep inside you, that wisdom has planted, like planting a seed in a garden, and then watering that seed, giving that seed some nutrients, and then just looking after that seed and nurturing that seed, and giving it space and time to grow and heal and become what it becomes. And as you leave that cave, that person near the entrance says you've learned what you came here to learn, even if you don't realize it just yet. And you head back out into the snow and you don't yet know how you're going to find your way back to the lighthouse. And when you get back to the cave, you find that just around the side of the cave is a slight glowing humming sound, and you realize there's a portal round the side of the cave and you enter that portal and you find yourself on a small island and you can see a storm disappearing off into the distance silent lightning striking in the clouds way off in the distance 
and you can see on the horizon a light from a lighthouse sweeping across the ocean. You then see a long shadow of someone standing in front of the light and you realize that that was you when you were up in that lighthouse and that you're now in the location of that distant light or flash you saw when you stood up there in that lighthouse. And you notice that as that storm continues to pass, and move further away, so the ocean continues to calm, and you see a rowboat on this little island, and there's a message in a bottle resting on this beach. You open the bottle, you take that message out, and it just says, row. And so you put that message back in the bottle and back on the beach. You push that rowboat down to the shore and just into the water. You climb into the rowboat, push off the shore with the oars and you begin to row towards that lighthouse in the distance. And you bob up and down over the water near the shore. And then the waves get larger, but smoother, as you move a bit further out and you head towards that beacon in the distance. And after some time, you reach that shoreline. You pull up that boat at the foot of the cliffs. You climb up the cliffs following a path And up on top of the cliff, you see that wise person from the cave sitting on a bench. You walk over and sit on the bench next to them. They tell you, you found what you came here for. And you'll learn that and you'll discover that. And then they stand up from beside you and they walk off. Then you stand up and you head home. And at home, you feel like you've had such a long day. You feel like you've had such a strange experience. You feel that it's a lot to process. And so you head to bed, wrap up warm, you settle down, and you drift and float, comfortably and relaxed, soundly asleep. Just take a moment to Allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to relax, I'm just going to tell this sleep meditation in the background. And while I tell this sleep meditation in the background, I don't know whether you'll drift asleep faster to the sound of my words or to the spaces between my words. And as you begin to comfortably fall asleep, you can have a sense of a woman out walking one day. 
and she's walking along the edge of a river. There's tall grass, bees, butterflies, and other insects flying among wildflowers. She can smell the smell from all the different flowers, noticing different distinct smells as she passes those different coloured flowers, catching a scent of certain flowers as a gust of wind blows gently across the meadow. And she can hear that flowing water on one side of her as it bubbles and trickles. Off the other side of the meadow she can hear the rustling of the leaves of some nearby woods. She can notice the sounds of birds in the trees and notice how as she walks along the birds seem to start and stop as if they know her position. That just as she thinks she's getting closer to birds she can hear singing, those birds quieten down. And as they quieten down, so she begins to hear more birds behind her and becomes more aware of the birds she's approaching. But as she continues to approach, so those birds quieten down, as if they don't want to reveal their exact location. And she's just calmly walking along the edge of this river. She can smell that slight watery smell in the air. She can notice that freshness, almost as if that water is purifying the air near this river. And she follows that river all the way towards a cliff edge. And near that cliff, she can see out miles around looking out over a vast vista of trees, meadow, all that wildlife down there. She can see deer. She can see in the distance a fox walking through the tall grass. She can see a hovering bird of prey. And from her vantage point, she's looking down on the top of that hovering bird of prey. And she can hear that river as it tumbles over the edge of the cliff. And down below the cliff she can see that waterfall, she can see the water spraying up, filling a small lake which feeds into, narrowing down to be another river, continuing that river on. And the river seems to be sparkling and shining in the sunlight as it weaves through the landscape, off towards the horizon. And the sun is just reaching that perfect point in the sky, that golden hour, where it's at just the right angle to illuminate everything with the most beauty. And she sits down near the edge of this cliff, and gazes out over that view. And she can feel that comfortable breeze on her skin. She can hear the sounds behind her, and she wants to find a way down before it's dark. 
but she also wants to just sit a moment, take in the view. She stands up, she follows that cliff, along, away from the river. She heads over towards the trees, and the trees end near the top of the cliff. She ties a rope around one of the trunks of a tree. She pulls on that rope, checks that it's secure. And then calmly and comfortably she walks over to the cliff edge. She wraps the rope carefully around her waist in such a way that she can lower herself down gently. She turns with her back to the cliff, holding that rope tight and taut. And she backs up gently and carefully, glancing behind her, checking where she is, holding the rope with one hand behind her back, the rope with the other hand in front of her, carefully feeding that rope around her. And she backs up so that the heels of her feet are over the edge of the cliff. And then she holds her feet steady, knees slightly bent, and very carefully she loosens and feeds that rope through from the back to the front. As she gently, comfortably and confidently tips herself over the edge of that cliff until her back is facing towards the ground. And then she calmly and relaxed, begins to walk down the side of that cliff. And as she descends that cliff, so the sounds from the top of the cliff begin to fade away. And she can hear the increasing sound of that water splashing down at the bottom of the waterfall. She can feel that rope as it passes through her hands, as it moves around her body. She can feel the tension in that rope as she so calmly, so gently lowers herself down and descends and just walks all the way down that cliff. And then when she's about a leg's distance from the bottom, she steps off the cliff with one foot and puts the foot flat on the ground, straightens her body up while lowering the other foot to the ground. and then removes the rope from around her body, loops it up and just places it neatly at the foot of this cliff. And she knows she can always climb back up this way when she returns. And she walks back to the lake and begins to walk around that lake. And she follows the lake round all the way, all the way to where the river continues, the other side of the lake. And the sun now is almost fully set over the horizon. The sky in one direction is dark blue where she can just notice a few of those stars beginning to appear in the sky. The other direction 
the shades of oranges, yellows, and a lighter blue as it transitions somewhere in the middle of the sky with the occasional wispy cloud almost hanging in the sky and a slight rainbow in some of those high up wispy clouds. And as the sun fully sets over the horizon and all that's left is the orange glow She stops on that piece of river. She moves a little bit away from the water's edge. Sets up a camp. Lights a fire. Settles down just inside the tent. She can feel the warmth of that fire on her hands, on her cheeks. She rests, just sitting, just inside that tent. She can hear the river behind the fire. That constant, steady, trickling, bubbling sound. And the fire crackling. The fire occasionally being blasted by little gusts of wind and making stronger sounds before calming again. And as that light dims, so the only light here is the light of the stars and the glow from the fire. And as she gazes at that dancing glow of the fire. She cooks herself something to eat. She can hear the movement of the sides of the tent with each blow of breeze. And she finds the experience, the ambience here so relaxing, that distant sound of crickets, the occasional chirp of birds settling down for the night in the trees, the occasional sound of flapping wings, of birds just moving around, finding just the perfect place to fall asleep. the occasional splosh in the water as observant fish pop their faces above the water to nab little bugs out the air before splashing back under the water again. And as the fire relaxes and burns down and just becomes a comfortable glow outside the tent. She backs up into the tent, having eaten her food. And for a little while, she decides just to rest back on a sleeping bag with the tent open for now, just letting some of that air in. Relaxing for a moment, rather than falling straight asleep. Just being able to look out of that tent. Out over that glowing fire and just enjoying the moment. Being able to breathe in that comfortable air from outside the tent. And then after a while, 
she decides it's time now to sleep. She sits up, zips the front of the tent up, lies back down, snuggles up into her sleeping bag, feeling how soft and padded that is, and begins to relax and drift and float comfortably asleep, and as she drifts and floats comfortably asleep. She finds her mind wandering. Finds her mind drifting to a strange world. She's walking down a footpath from her front door. Only her front door isn't on her house. It seems to be floating just above the footpath with nothing around it. There just seems to be a grey white in all directions, almost like looking into dense fog with just that door floating there. But she feels so comfortable. And she walks down that footpath to the end of the footpath. She goes to the mailbox at the end of the footpath. She opens that mailbox and finds a letter. And she takes that letter out. And it just has her name written on it. And she opens the envelope and begins to read that letter. And as she begins to read, so she notices that the ink that this is written in seems to sparkle and glow. It seems to be written in almost like a sparkly, glittery, purple ink. And she reads that glistening writing. And it tells her that as you read this, you're going to begin to go on a journey, a journey of inner discovery. And this journey of inner discovery will begin when the horse arrives and not a moment sooner. And the horse won't arrive until it's time. And it's not time yet. You'll know when it's time because the horse will be here. And don't try too hard to work all this out. Because if you try hard to work this out, you'll get lost in thought. You'll go round in wonder. You'll discover curiosity and find yourself losing your place while reading this letter. And while you read this letter, you may wonder about the waffle and whether the waffle is what you're reading, or what you ate for breakfast. And sometimes things can be curious, and sometimes they can get curiouser and curiouser, but you can keep reading, wondering and discovering, because the horse will arrive when it's time. And your journey of discovery will help you to discover harmony. 
and you'll learn balance and what that means to you. And you can brush up on some skills. All the best, Dan. And she folded the letter up and could hear some clipping and clopping down the street. But in every direction she looked was just a grey, foggy look. She placed that letter back in the envelope and put that envelope into a pocket. She had a sense of confusion as a horse appeared, almost glowing and white, out of the fog. As if the only space that exists is the path and a short distance from the path and the mailbox. And this horse has somehow magically just come into existence here and the horse stops in front of the path lets out a breath she walks over gently touches the neck of the horse with her hand she can feel the side of the neck of the horse she can feel the warmth the softness the firmness, that smell of the horse. She climbed onto the horse's back and it began to trot away from the path. And as it did, so the fog began to clear and the path and the mailbox disappeared. And as the fog cleared, she found herself trotting through some woodland on a beautiful spring day. Sounds of birds coming from all directions. Light dancing through the leaves on the path in front of her sound of the rustling of the leaves. As she bobbed up and down while the horse trotted through this woodland. And she didn't have any reins and didn't feel that she had any control over the horse. The horse seemed to just know where it was going. And so she just sat on that horse and felt that the experience was so calming, so comfortable and such a beautiful experience, such beautiful environment. She didn't mind not knowing where the horse was going. She didn't mind not understanding what was going on. And as that horse continued, it eventually turned off this path and turned down a narrower path. And she followed that narrower path on that horse. And she could notice that there was a clearing up ahead. And as the horse reached the clearing, she could see a cottage And there was someone sitting, swinging on a rocking chair outside that cottage. Just enjoying, relaxing in this weather. And the most unusual weather vane on top of the cottage
and the horse pulled up at the cottage and then stopped. And the woman assumed this is where she had to dismount. So she got off of the horse and walked towards that cottage. And she went over to the person sat outside this cottage who stopped rocking had a beaming smile and gestured for her to sit on the seat opposite so she sat down on the seat opposite And they said that they're going to play a game. And the woman was curious about this game, about why someone would want to play a game. And she got out what looked like a chessboard, only instead of chess pieces. Each piece looked like a different mushroom. There were short, squat mushrooms at the front. There were tall mushrooms at the sides. There was a mushroom that had a bright red top with some white spots in the middle and next to that was a tall and slender mushroom that was very similar in colour and beside that were some small black mushrooms that when you picked them up and looked had the softest undersides that if you gently tapped them seemed to leave the finest powder on the board and the woman asked what are we playing and the person said that they were playing their version of chess and so they began and then this person took one of the small front mushrooms and instead of just putting it out of play they ate it And the woman was confused. And they said, each mushroom you take of the opponent, you eat. There's nothing confusing in that. You're playing with edible pieces. And so the woman carried on playing. And to start with, she felt that she was losing. But then there was something about the experience that helped her to begin to have this sense that she learned the patterns and the play style of her opponent. She'd been paying attention. And now she started winning. But she realized that there was a problem with starting to win. That as you start to win, so you eat more of the opponent's mushrooms. And the more of the opponent's mushrooms she was eating, the more this environment began to change. She first noticed the sky beginning to turn into multiple different colours swirling around like paint on water
and those colours began to get more and more vivid. And then she noticed as she carried on that the trees began to pulse and move. And that everything began to look almost like she was inside a painting. And eventually she won. But at the point that she'd won, the only thing left that wasn't moving was one space of taking steps. So she found that she could walk steady perfectly fine. And she walked into that black hole and discovered that it was a long tunnel, almost like a deep cave inside a painting. And as she walked in, it got darker and darker. And then after a while, as her eyes began to adjust, she noticed a slight glow. She could hear a slight dripping. And it was a slight, almost like an electric blue glow. And she walked towards that electric blue glow and found the softest, most incredible looking moss. She reached down, touched it with her fingertips, could feel that damp, soft carpet of moss that seemed to be glowing with a slight electric blue glow. And she gathered up a large handful of that moss. And she used that moss as a way of lighting her way while she continued her journey through this tunnel. And this moss in her hand gave a soft, comfortable blue glow to the sides of the cave, lighting it just enough for her to find her way through. And as she walked along, she saw what looked like a damp piece of wood lying on the ground, almost like a plank just lying there. And she only saw it because the glow from the moss illuminated the damp surface on that wood. And she walked comfortably across that plank to the other side. And she could see in the distance a light, just the tiniest light of the exit of this tunnel, the exit of this cave. She could feel the coolness, the calmness in this cave. And then she saw a sign that just said, perception is everything. And then there was a space. And then it said, turn around. And she turned around. And she saw that from this angle, that that plank was over an incredibly deep drop. And she stepped back slightly. And she looked down at that drop. And she realized that she walked across that plank perfectly fine.
but was unsure whether she would be able to walk back across that plank. Now she knows there's a massive drop beneath it. And she understood the sign. And she turned around and carried on. And as she reached the exit of the cave, she placed that moss down, wiped her hands on her legs to dry them off, and headed out into the sunlight. And as she headed out into the sunlight, she was surprised to see a beautiful valley, distant mountains. She could see the snow on the top of those mountains. She could see the way clouds were bashing into the mountains and rising up being stopped by those mountains. And she wondered where she was. She could see down there in this valley a herd of zebra She could see a pool of water and wild animals gathered around that pool, drinking and then walking away to carry on their own journeys. And when the time was right, she walked down to that pool of water herself. And when she got down to that water, she had a drink of some of that water. And she looked around herself. And she was aware of how solid everything was here. How real everything was here compared to where she walked in. And as she was drinking that water, so she could feel the warmth of the water. And so she decided to go in that water for a little swim. She almost just felt a compulsion to take this moment to relax. And she walked into that water up to her waist and then lowered herself into the warm water and pushed herself through the water, turned onto her back and just floated on that water. And she could feel the warmth of the sun on her face. And as she felt that warmth of the sun. So she allowed her eyes to close. And while she floated there, she felt almost like she was just floating in space. Floating, weightless, resting on that water. And while she rested there, floating on the water, she wondered what all this meant, what the purpose of this journey has been. She's aware that she's dreaming, but it's curious what her mind is trying to teach her about harmony, healing, about balance. and how this all relates to her real life journey. And 
then after a while of resting there, she hears the gentle, very distant rumble of thunder. So she takes time to swim back to the shore. She can see that the storm's way off in the distance, over near the mountains. But where she is, it's still sunny. And she sits there for a while, drying off in the sun, wondering why she's been led to here. And after drying off in the sun, she looks around herself see if there's any clues. And she sees off in the distance, near the trees, something glistening. She walks over to that location. And at that location, she has this sense of something talking to her, almost talking straight to her mind, telling her to open the small box that's by the tree. And it's the stones on the box that are glistening in the light. And so she reaches down, lifts the lid on that box. And inside the box, she finds what looks like just a simple stone. There doesn't seem to be anything particularly special about it other than its softness. Almost like it's been polished and looked after and wrapped around that stone is a piece of red material tied into a bow and tucked into that bow is a rolled up thin piece of paper and so she opens the bow She gets that paper, she opens the paper, she reads what it says on that paper. It just says, my gift to you, keep this on you, always. And she doesn't know whether it actually is a gift to her or not. But no one else has received this. No one else has been here. And her experience has led her here. So she takes that stone, puts it in her pocket, puts everything else back in the box and closes the lid. And as she closes the lid, So everything around her begins to turn white again. Almost like a fog has set in around her again. And she finds herself stood on a path next to the mailbox. She turns around and can see her floating front door. She wonders whether she's supposed to walk inside. And she walks towards that door. Reaches the door handle. Opens the door. 
and everything just looks dark the other side of the door. But she steps through that door. And as she does, she becomes aware of the sound of rain on the tent. And aware that she's in that half asleep, half awake state in the tent. Just feeling so deeply relaxed, listening to that rain. And then she hears the occasional chirping of a bird. And she hasn't opened her eyes yet. She just listens. And she wonders whether perhaps morning is approaching. And because she hasn't opened her eyes, and she's still drifting in her mind in a half-awake, half-asleep state, she doesn't notice how much time has passed when she becomes aware that there's a slight glow coming through the tent, that it's getting lighter and lighter outside the tent. And then she hears that the rain has passed. She exits the tent to the most beautiful morning. She can smell that smell, that it's rained on the grass, that it's rained after hot, sunny weather. She stretches, takes some deep breaths of the fresh air. She has a drink of some water, has some food before carrying on her journey, and then notices in her pocket is a stone, and she looks at that stone and feels the stone, and wonders how it got there, because the stone matches the stone in her dream. And she packs her tent away, carrying on her journey. And while she's walking along, she's continuing to wonder about that stone. Wondering how it got there from her dream. Wondering whether, perhaps, she'd picked it up and got no memory of it the day before whether maybe it fell in her pocket at some point. And as she continues her journey, she can see some magpies flying up into the sky from the meadow. is the sound of a distant crow. You can hear the sounds of robins and songbirds in the trees. Watches the butterflies, the bees. And finds the whole experience deeply relaxing. And yet a part of her mind keeps coming back to wondering about the stone. And she keeps handling that stone, taking the stone out of her pocket, walking along while she's looking at the stone, feeling its softness in her fingertips, and wondering about the experience that she'd had in her dream. And she keeps telling herself the two aren't connected, that the stone must have got in her pocket some other way. And as 
she reaches her destination. She decides to let it go. She puts the stone in her pocket and decides to keep it anyway. Something to remember her trip by. And at her destination, she sets up a camera. And it's the most beautiful valley location. Mountains off in the distance. And she's trekked all the way here to get a photo of tonight's lunar eclipse. She knows that at the point the lunar eclipse happens, the moon will be perfectly positioned between two of the mountains. And she's hoping that with the right exposure, she can get some photos, perhaps having the eclipse mirrored in the river. And even if it isn't, she's hoping to get a whole range of photos of the night and of that eclipse. And from this location, she can zoom in to make it so that that moon looks so much larger in the image compared to the foreground. And she knows that part way up the mountains, there are still trees. And for part of the eclipse, the moon will begin to go behind those trees. And zooming right in will make it look like a really large moon next to those trees. And she's been planning this for a long time. And once she set her camera up on the location the moon will be, and she knows she'll take other photos. She then sets her tent up. And she doesn't do a campfire. She doesn't want the additional light. And as the sun sets, she begins to get some photos of the way the light shifts and changes and how that changes the environment how things look different when they're illuminated blue to when they're illuminated oranges and reds to when everything's just dark and then when the moon is illuminating everything with a silvery light and then she takes photos as the Earth's shadow gently moves across the moon, first barely noticing, and then gradually taking more and more of a bite out of that moon, until eventually there's just the thinnest slither of silvery moonlight left. And then the moon begins to glow red. And as that red moon hangs in the sky, she continues taking photos. And there's about 20 minutes when the moon is totally red. She tries multiple different exposures, getting as many photos as she can. Feeling a sense of wonder, of calmness, of excitement at what she's doing. And then zooms in on the moon to get the photos 
as the moon begins to set behind one of the mountains. Getting the photos of the trees in front of the moon. And that setting moon carries on for some time. As the eclipse carries on. And a silver slither of moon appears again, growing larger and larger. Until when half the moon is uncovered. The covered half the moon is behind the mountain. And so now all she can do is keep taking photos of that moon as it disappears from view. And once the moon is out of sight, and the night's sky is plunged into even more darkness, she zooms back out, and starts taking photos of the stars, taking multiple photos of the night sky. And despite it getting later and later, there's something about the experience that helps her feel so deeply relaxed and at one with nature and in awe of the scale of the world around her. And of all the effort she went to, the trekking, abseiling and travelling all the way here where the only way to reach here is on foot. And all the months of planning to try and find the perfect location for the photos that she wanted to take. And now she's got those photos. And after many, many hours, She takes her camera into the tent, zips up the tent as the air begins to cool, and she settles down in the tent, looking through the photos that she's taken, before settling down and falling asleep. And the next morning, she awakens, feeling full of energy, feeling so refreshed. And she begins her journey back the way she came. She hikes all the way back to where she camped the previous day. She realises that she might be able to make it all the way in one journey all in one day. She hikes to where she abseiled and she pulls on that rope, tests the strength of that rope and then walks up that cliff and decides that it's easier to have come down the cliff than to be pulling yourself back up the cliff. And at the top, she unties her rope, gathers her rope up, puts that into her backpack, carries on her journey back to her car. And it's beginning to get late so she decides to have a short break, just sleeping in her car for a moment, just a couple of hours, to recharge, refresh, to revitalise. She rests back in the car seat, in the comfort of that car. And while she's sleeping, so it begins to rain lightly and she can hear that rain on the windscreen 
on the roof of the car. And she finds that that rain sound on the car is making it harder for her to want to wake up. She's wanting to relax even deeper into the experience. And so she ends up sleeping longer than expected. But when she awakens, she feels so refreshed and ready for a drive home. And it's still raining slightly, so as she drives home, she's got the window wound down a little, she can smell the rainy air outside the car. She can hear the sound of that rain on the car, on the road. The windscreen wipers moving left and right, left and right. The sound of the windscreen wipers motor moving left and right. And she carries on driving home. And as she nears her home, so she enters a more built up area. You can see the way the overhead street lights have their light reflecting on the car, almost like beams of light moving along the car, passing over the car as the car moves. The sound of the tires on the wet road. Finding the whole driving experience so relaxing and calming and looking forward to arriving home. And on arrival home, she heads indoors and she sees a large parcel has been delivered for her. And on the parcel is a letter and she opens that letter and sees that this letter says it's for her eyes only. And she reads that letter, folds that letter up, puts it back in the envelope, recognizes it. Someone's always there for you. Even when you think there's no one there for you. Whether you interpret that as something external to you or just your inner guidance. There's always that voice that picks you up, that tells you you can do it, that reaches out a hand to you, that smiles at you when you need it. That joins you on your journey that's there for you, supporting you, that will motivate you and tell you, you can do this. Keep going. And somehow she understands this and understands this voice. And she places that painting above the fireplace. She sits down in a chair, gazing over at that painting. She then hears this sound from another room of her daughter practicing the harp. She closes her eyes, listening to that gentle music in the background. And sitting in that seat with her eyes closed, 
listening to that music, she suddenly feels a sense of deep peace and relaxation and decides to go to bed. She says good night to her daughter, tells her daughter how lovely the playing is, how proud she is of her daughter, how she looks forward to hearing more tomorrow. She heads to bed, gets into bed, puts that stone down next to the light on her bedside table. And drifts and floats, so comfortably asleep, knowing she'll awaken in the morning, feeling so full of energy, feeling revitalized knowing that overnight her mind will have gone through its own healing process of psychologically healing and her body will go through its process of physically healing so that she can awaken in the morning feeling refreshed and ready to carry on with the day and as she drifts and floats asleep she begins to drift into the most pleasant, most wonderful dreams of healing, of well-being, of pleasure and excitement and happiness and drifts to sleep with a smile on her face, sleeping and relaxing through the night. Okay, so just take a moment to close your eyes and allow yourself to get comfortable. And as you get comfortable, you can begin to drift off asleep. And I don't know whether you'll drift asleep faster to the sound of my voice or the spaces between my words. But as you continue to drift comfortably asleep, I'm just going to tell a story in the background. And this story is about two men going on a holiday, and ever since they first met, they've always shared that they've both always wanted to go on a safari. But in all the time that they've been together, it's just never happened that they've had enough money or the situation to allow themselves to do that. And now, after many years of being together, finally they're going on safari. And they've travelled out into the middle of nowhere, staying in a lodge that's miles and miles from the nearest town. And it took them a long time to get here, to travel to this country in a plane, to travel from the airport all the way out to this lodge. And they've arrived at this lodge late in the evening, and it's still incredibly warm. And they're aware that it will get colder as the night progresses. But currently it's still a very warm temperature. And they enter that lodge, they check in to their room, they put their luggage in the room before heading down to the restaurant to have something to eat. They sit in that restaurant. They can hear the background mumbling of people at other tables. The sounds of cutlery and crockery and glasses. And everything just feels so calm. The sounds are muted and relaxed. And they enjoy their meal together, talking quietly across the table to each other. And they can look out 
over the grounds of the lodge, seeing the trees sway, illuminated by moonlight, a pool out there, the silvery light dancing as the wind just gently blows across the surface. And they can hear the nighttime sounds. As they continue to eat their food and enjoy their first evening here. And after they finish their food, they go out for a walk around the grounds, making the most of a pleasant evening. Before heading to the lodge's spa, and going into the outdoor jacuzzi, and relaxing in that bubbling, warm water, listening to the sounds of the night, the occasional sound of bats flying over, sounds of crickets, the occasional sound of a bird, and the distant rustling of leaves of the trees as the wind blows a breeze. Just relaxing in that jacuzzi, feeling that bubbling water, massaging and tickling the body, that weightless feeling of the body in the water. Continuing to enjoy each other's company. Feeling like this jacuzzi is massaging away all the stresses, all the tension from the long flight and journey here. And as the night got later and later, so they went to bed and drifted comfortably asleep, falling asleep so quickly because of how tired they were from their journey. And the next day they go for breakfast at the lodge. And the breakfast is a self-service breakfast. So they go up, they help themselves to some food, some drink, enjoy that breakfast before going with others on a tour for the safari. And this is what they really wanted to do. This is what they came here for. And in the back of a four by four, the two of them and some others travel off from the lodge, initially following the road and then turning off onto a dirt track, following this dirt track, bouncing along, heading towards some woodland. And the men have their cameras out, always ready to take a photo of anything they might catch a glimpse of. They keep looking at each other and smiling as they think about the fact that they're here together on this journey, on this safari. 
and after a couple of hours of driving, the 4x4 four four pulls over, skids to a halt near the woodland, and they all get told to get out of the 4x4, four four, and that they're making the rest of this journey on foot, as they all head off deeper into that woodland, trekking their way through the woodland, and the terrain is difficult to walk on, so they understand why they wouldn't be able to get this way in a 4x4. Four four. There's not a lot of room between the trees. There doesn't seem to be any sign of a path that a vehicle could take. And they feel like they're walking uphill slightly, although being in dense woodland, it's difficult for them to tell. And then after a while of walking through the woodland, they notice the trees thinning, and there are more rocks and boulders, and they notice that they are getting higher. And then the guide gathers everyone together, says we're going to stop here for something to eat and drink. So the group stops, they enjoy something to eat and drink. They can feel the warmth of the day in this slight clearing and notice that sun overhead. And after eating and having something to drink, they continue to follow the guide until eventually they notice that they're at the top of a cliff. And it's not a particularly high cliff, but it's a cliff that looks down over a vast plain. They can see off in the distance what looks like some mountains or very high hills. In another direction they can notice some more dense trees. But they realise they're looking down over a vast plain. And the guide says that that's where we're going. We're going to be going down there to that plain. And the guide starts leading them down a narrow path that weaves left and right and left and right down the side of that cliff edge. And it's quite a narrow path. but reasonably easy to follow. And the guide jokes that later on we'll be heading back up this path. But getting down is the easy bit. And so they head all the way down to the plain. The men stop and they take photos of different animals they spot. They're really excited by their experience. Having this once in a lifetime experience they've waited years to have. And they've both got ideas of what it is they would love to photograph. And as they walk out into the plain. The guide says that. There's a truck out here waiting for them and that they'll be getting in the back of this truck to travel deeper into this area. And that being in the truck is obviously safer here than being on foot. And they reach the truck, or climb into the truck. As it then travels across that plain. 
and once it's travelled quite a distance, it pulls to a halt, giving them time to get their cameras, look out the windows, and take photos of the pride of lions, take photos of other animals, of zebra, and photos of animals drinking at a river. And they find it interesting that they're aware that these animals, some of them hunt the others, and yet down by the river, they'll be drinking side by side. And they took as many photos as they could of all the different animals they saw. And they took photos of eagles flying high in the sky. So gracefully circling, catching warm air rising up, circling up higher. Seemingly effortlessly. And then the truck would move on to another area travel some distance where they would get an opportunity to take some more photos and then it would move on somewhere else and they'd take more photos and then it arrived at what was like a mini lodge and the guide said that we'll be just staying here for the night and then in the morning you'll make your journey back. And they all disembarked and went into that lodge. They were all shown to rooms. And then after everyone had gone to bed, the two men were researching this area. and were talking about their photos, about the animals they'd seen, and were already sharing some of those photos online. And they were talking about how surprised they were that even in the middle of nowhere, you can manage to access online and share photos. And as they were researching the area, they found out that there are some ruins not that far away from here. So they decided, while everyone drifts and floats asleep, that they would just nip out. It's only a very short walk. And they'd walk to that location just to check out the ruins. And they felt like the location they were in was safe. It was all gated and fenced off. And it seemed like the ruins were within the fenced off section. But just in a deep area of woodland. And in that deep area of woodland. It looked like these ruins were ancient and had been there for a very long time. They didn't come here to explore ancient ruins, but they felt that this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. So they snuck out with some torches and they went exploring. They pushed deeper into that woodland searching for signs of those old ruins. And after a little while, they started noticing some stones on the ground that were heavily overgrown, but resembled broken walls. And they realised they must have arrived where the ruins are. 
and they shone their torches around and they explored those rooms. And then one of the men found an entrance and so the two of them went over to that entrance. They shone their torches in the entrance and the torchlight disappeared into the blackness. They realised that there were some steps down into this section. And this entrance wasn't highly visible. It's just that out here with torches, you can notice when the torchlight isn't shining on something when the torchlight seems to just disappear. And they descended those steps, going down into those ruins. They could hear a very slight dripping sound down here in the ruins, and realised that perhaps a stream off of that river must pass overhead somewhere near here and that water must just gradually filter through the ground so they could hear the way that dripping would just echo down here in the ruins and they thought to themselves that it makes sense that the ruins would be by a stream that was probably the path or a large part of a path of the river going back thousands of years and their footsteps echoed as they explored these ruins and after a little bit of searching they found a doorway, it was like a stone covering a gap, and they moved that stone aside, worked together to slide that over. They walked into this open space and realised it was a large chamber and in this chamber, their torches glistened and shone and reflected off of large amounts of gold around the walls. They noticed there was inscriptions writing around the walls, and incredibly intricate artwork and pictures. And they realised that the pictures seemed to be depicting a story a story about an ancient civilization that once existed here, that had to leave as times changed, as uncertainty set in, as the flow of water changed course and reduced, as the area stopped being sustainable for their civilization. And so gradually the civilization dwindled as members of this civilization went off to find new lives and they saw a chest at the back of this room they went over to that chest lifted the heavy lid and inside was a scroll they took that scroll out of the chest and as they unrolled it, so they began to both have this sense of inner wisdom. Like something on this scroll was communicating directly with them. And resonating within them. They felt this deep connection with each other with the world around them, with the environment, like everything's connected, they felt this was a profound experience, they put that scroll back, closed that chest, 
found their way back out of these ruins and headed back to the camp, headed back to that mini lodge. And as they lay in bed together, drifting off asleep, they just found themselves talking about the experience, about the experience they had individually, and how they had such a similar feeling, such a similar experience to each other, from going into those ruins, from looking at that scroll, and that somehow they both felt the same, that they should put the scroll back, and leave and not mention it. And they felt that they were taking away some learning from that experience. Learning from what had happened to the ancient civilization, what they learned about them. And they felt they'd both developed a greater sense of inner wisdom and they drifted off asleep. And the next day they got back in that truck. Travelled back. Across that plain. They took the opportunity to take more photos. And they enjoyed the different light. Taking these photos in the morning. Shortly after the sun had risen, contrasting to when they were taking photos in the afternoon towards when the sun was setting the day before. And they headed back and had to climb up that cliff. They climbed up the cliff took this last opportunity to take some photos from the top of that cliff over the plain. This last opportunity to enjoy the view. And the two of them just held each other, looking out over the view, taking that view in together. Holding these memories they'd been creating. They took a photo of themselves up here. With the plain in the background, those mountains off in the distance, the woodland, that river. Before walking through that woodland, back to the 4 by 4 then making their journey back to the main lodge. They'd been here a couple of days now, and the plan was to go out and do a few more things, a bit more exploring, over the week that they're here. They look forward to going on a hot air balloon ride one morning. They look forward to going to a nearby animal sanctuary and looking at the work that they do there on another day. They look forward to a couple of days of just enjoying, relaxing and chilling out. And then as their holiday draws to an end, they leave here, travel home. And once home, they get some of the photos printed up, some photos of them together on holiday, photos of them in a hot air balloon. They put those photos up at home before going to bed and drifting and floating comfortably and relaxed asleep knowing they've learned so much, drifting asleep, dreaming of their learnings, their time together, 
feeling a sense of inner well-being and serenity as they drift and relax and float asleep. So just take a moment to allow your eyes to close. And with your eyes closed, I'm just going to tell this sleep meditation in the background. And as I tell this sleep meditation, I don't know whether you'll drift deeper to the sound of my voice or to the spaces between my words. And while you begin to drift deeper and relax asleep, you can have a sense of driving down a really long road and you're heading on a road trip and you've been driving for many hours and around you out of the windows you just see forest passing you by and it all looks very similar almost like a pine forest and you can see how dense that looks as you travel down this incredibly straight road and the sun sets and you can see stars in the sky and you can notice a certain stillness outside of the car with just that breeze coming in the window if you open the window but noticing that there's a certain stillness that the trees seem very still the night outside the car seems very still and you've been driving for quite some time and after even longer You notice that the trees begin to thin out a little. And as they do, you can see a large open plain, a large open space, with the most beautiful view of the night sky. And as you pull over, just beyond the forest. You open the car door, exit the car, and you look around and you can't see a single light in any direction. And you're out in the middle of nowhere, miles from anywhere. And you lay back on the warm bonnet of your car, on a blanket. And you can feel that comfortable warmth of that bonnet, gently warming the blanket. And then the softness of that blanket under your back, your legs, as you gaze up at the sky. And after just a short while of gazing at the sky, your eyes begin to adapt to the dark. And you notice an increase in those twinkling stars. You begin to notice subtle colours in the sky. And you just relax back on that car bonnet feeling the warmth radiating up from beneath you and you see the occasional shooting star you notice what looks like tiny dots traveling rapidly across the night sky as satellites pass overhead and while your eyes continue to get used to the dark, you begin to see a comet in the sky. 
you see the most brilliant electric blue and a hazy electric blue tail. And you gaze at that comet. And although that comet seems to just be hovering in space, you're aware that it's actually traveling thousands of miles an hour. And while you gaze at that comet, you can feel your breathing beginning to relax. You can notice how you're breathing deeper and deeper in your stomach. How those arms are feeling heavier. Those legs are feeling heavier. Those eyelids are feeling heavier. And those eyes begin to comfortably close. And at first they just blink shut almost like an extended blink. But then after a while, when they blink shut, they remain shut as you begin to drift in your mind. And you can feel the warmth of that car beneath you and the comfort of the blanket and the silence around you just the subtle sounds of the wildlife in the forest and some subtle other sounds around you at night. As you drift deeper into your mind and while you drift deeper inside, you start to have this feeling like you're resting on the softest, warmest, most comfortable sand, lying back almost like on a cushion of sand. You have this feeling of that sand beneath your hands, moving your fingertips gently and feeling the loose sand between your fingertips. And as your fingertips move through that warm sand, Noticing that as they pass just beneath the surface of the sand, the sand is so much cooler than that sand on top. Feeling that movement and the softness of that sand through those fingertips. And then having a sense of scooping up some sand in one hand while still resting on your back with your eyes closed and lifting your hands slightly up off the ground and just letting that sand flow out of your hand, through your fingertips and back down to the ground and feeling the coolness of that on your palm and you start to have this sense that you're lying down at night time in a desert and that the sand is holding some of the warmth. And as you begin to open your eyes, you can see the most beautiful blue hue surrounding you. like the night sky is making everything multiple shades of blue with the almost black sky down to the slightly lighter blue sand and you stand up and some of that sand falls off onto the ground from your clothes and you begin to walk through this desert and you can see the shapes of sand dunes stretching out towards the horizon. You can notice the silvery moon low on the horizon in one direction 
and the way that's elongating those shadows and adding a slight silvery tip to the tops of the dunes and almost like millions of loose diamonds blowing in the breeze a small little sand particles blow around in that breeze and get caught in the silver light of the moon almost like diamonds blowing off the top of dunes and rolling down those dunes like dresses that when someone turns in a sparkly dress it just twinkles and catches the light and you have this instinctive feeling of the direction you should head and so you walk through this desert feeling each footstep as your feet step forward one at a time sinking into the sand pushing through the sand with a muted sliding sound of each footstep and you begin to ascend one of the sand dunes and as you reach the top you notice off in the distance a flickering orange glow and so you begin to head towards that flickering orange glow and as you get nearer to that glow so you notice that there's someone sitting almost in a meditative position by a campfire and you can see that dancing glowing light of the fire illuminating the golden sand near the fire and stretching out dancing shadows and you can smell that smell of the campfire and hear the crackling and the popping of the campfire and as you near that person you begin to see what they look like and you notice that they notice you and they look over at you with the friendliest of faces and they don't say a word they just look at a location and then give a gesture as if to say to sit and join them and you sit down and you sit in a similar position to them and they put themselves back into the position they were in and they close their eyes again and so you close your eyes and then you hear them say that you're here to go on a deep and spiritual journey and that they're here to be a guide to help you on that journey And you have this sense of connection with them, almost like somehow you're breathing the same. You're beginning to synchronize without saying a word. And you feel this deepening of your breathing. You feel the sense of your muscles relaxing, of your shoulders lowering down of the muscles around your face softening and almost a feeling of losing feeling of your body and just being a mind floating in space by this fire 
starting to hear that crackling sound of the fire, starting to notice through your eyelids the flickering of the flame and feeling a cool breeze occasionally on your cheeks, mixed with the warm breeze as the wind changes direction and blows past the fire and becoming almost hyper-attuned to picking up on the sensations of the experience of sitting by that fire motionless, just focusing on being in the moment. Still aware that you feel almost like there's a connection between you and this guide. And then you have this sense that the guide has just taken a deep breath in and a long breath out. And that as you have that sense, so you notice that your body has done the same, that your body has taken a deep breath in and a long breath out. As you relax deeper into the experience, And then you hear the guide telling you to go to the beach. And you just hear those words almost in your mind's eye, go to the beach. And you don't know what they mean, go to the beach. You don't know what beach, but you start to have this sense of hearing the ocean just softly bubbling and rolling in along a sandy beach. That kind of ocean that each wave rolls very shallow and in a long way before slowing down and then drawing back out again. And you have the sense of those waves rolling in and out. Almost like each breath that you're taking, rolling in and out again. And you notice that on this beach, as it begins to form in your mind's eye, that it's still night time. There's still a low moon. But now that moon is creating silver, dancing light across the ocean. Those stars are twinkling overhead. The sand is still soft. There's still a campfire here. And this guide is still sat with you. But this sand is now the sand of a beach. And you're up on the beach, on the soft sand. Noticing that closer to the water's edge, the sand firms up. And the guide stands up and tells you to stand up. And tells you to walk with them. And to walk mindfully to be aware of each step that you take, to be in the moment taking those steps, not having your mind focusing on other things and other thoughts, but paying all of your attention to the process and the experience of walking toward the seashore. And together you walk down towards that sea, feeling your bare feet walking through warm, soft sand, sinking into that sand with each step, the sound of each step, the feeling, that tickling of the dry sand on the toes around your feet, the movement of that sand through your toes as you raise your foot, move your foot and your leg forward, 
and place your foot back down again in the sand. And then the gradual firming up of that sand as you get closer to the shore. And then being able to sense through the soles of your feet the slight dampness to that sand. And as you continue walking, noticing the wetness of the sand and how with each step you create a slight puddle as your foot pushes into the sand and squeezes some of that water away from underneath your foot. And then the guide tells you to stop. And they crouch down and they tell you to crouch down. And they reveal in their hand that they're holding a crystal ball. And they tell you to watch that crystal ball. And as a wave is rolling in on the shore, bubbling its way along that shallow sandy area. They wait until that wave is almost next to you. And then they roll that crystal ball towards the water. And you notice, while watching the crystal ball as you are told to do, the way the moon glistens and manages to catch some of the imperfections in that crystal ball, some of the air bubbles in that crystal ball, almost making small little flashes of silver light. The way the white water at the front edge of that rolling in wave meets the crystal ball, wraps its way around the crystal ball, pulls itself up the middle and over the top of the crystal ball, as that ball rolls through the water, passing through the waves, and your eyes follow that crystal, seeing a path of white water left behind the crystal. And as you watch that, so you hear the guide say, now. And as they say now, something strange happens. That crystal ball begins to look like a comet in space. Like a spinning ball of dirty ice almost like a grey whitey colour, surrounded by a blue gas that looks a bit like the white water bubbling behind that crystal ball. And you suddenly notice that the ocean seems to have gone quiet and disappeared. That you suddenly can't feel the ground beneath you. And that you seem to just be a mind in space. Watching this comet. Almost fizzing and popping and passing through the solar system. And as a mind, you seem to be almost keeping up with this comet. Keeping a fixed distance from it. And you have this sense that the mind of the guide is here with you. As you follow this comet. And as you look around you. You notice the different planets. You can see the blue marble of Earth, the grey moon. You can see the sun shining brightly. And even though you know 
There's no sound here in space. You have this sense of the crackling and popping and sounds from this comet. And that comet passes the planets and begins to leave the solar system. And you have this sense the guide remains with you on this journey. And as the comet takes one course, so your minds together take a different course. And you have this almost psychic sense of this guide telling you that as just part of the universe, almost like part of a universal consciousness which flows with the universe outside of space and time, with the fabric of the universe, you're going to be travelling beyond the solar system. And they almost psychically help you to set a course towards a tiny pinprick of light in the distance. You have this sense of travelling towards that light and accelerating faster and faster and stars around you passing by faster and faster until they almost become streaks of light with just that point of light in front of you gradually getting larger and larger in your field of view until you almost grind to a halt in an instant and psychically hear the voice of the guide telling you that we're heading to one of the planets here and you spot the planet you're heading towards and approach that planet and find yourself entering the planet's atmosphere and you realise this planet resembles Earth. You can imagine this being somewhere on Earth and you head down to a beach and as you reach this shore of an alien world you land with a physical body and the guide tells you the physical body is an illusion. It's just here to help you feel more comfortable with the experience. To help you to be able to move around in a way that makes more sense to you. And they stand up. And they begin to walk away from the seashore. And head up over a bank and down the other side of the bank and they begin to walk towards what looks like a green lagoon and they can notice certain animals drinking an animal that looks like an elephant An animal that looks like a giraffe. And you can see plants of different sizes. And you realise that different animals will have adapted to take advantage of the different plants around here. And to all carve out their specific niche, just like anywhere else. And so you end up not surprised at a familiarity of animals.
and off in the distance. You can see flashes on the horizon, like there's a storm somewhere just over the horizon. And it's so distant, you can't hear any thunder. You can just notice those flashes in the sky from time to time. And something about it feels comforting. But you can smell the smell of that storm off in the distance. You can see what looks like grass surrounding this area, almost like wide bladed grass. And you reach down with your fingertips and you run your fingers through this grass to see what it feels like. And notice that it feels very much like a mix between grass and feathers. That it's got a certain consistency of grass, but a softness like feathers that almost tickles your palm as you run your hands through that and you can feel the slight dampness like the storm perhaps was here a little while ago and as you continue to walk through that so you walk over towards those animals and this guide tells you to observe, to open your mind to these animals. And so you get closer to those animals. You have this sense of almost connecting with the animals, as if you're falling into a synchronization with them. Where what you do, they begin to do, and what they do, you copy. Almost like you start to understand them on a deep and meaningful level. And you begin to notice a connection between yourself and everything around you. And realize that you are the universe. That you're not like a fish in water where the fish isn't the water. The fish is in the water. It's a bit like you're in water and you are water. You're just like a conscious bit of water. And that there's no separating you from the universe. And you begin to have this insight and begin to explore the meaning of realizing that there's a universal consciousness that connects all things. That if you can just get on the right frequency, you can channel that. And this guide continues to help you to keep focused, keep learning, keep studying these animals. And they take you from this place. And you walk away, you head over another hill. And you find what looks like some ruins. Almost like some ancient civilization once lived here. And you realize these ruins seem to have been built out of some kind of shiny black stone. And that black stone has worn down through time, but you can still notice something about that stone, the way it was worked. You 
can touch it and notice that it feels like touching highly polished stone. And then you see what looks like the tip of a black pyramid sticking out of the ground. And the guide explains that the civilization was here so long ago that these buildings are just the tip of the iceberg and that the way in is to go down deeper. And they tell you that because you are the universe, there is no you and the ground. You're just a concept. And that most of what's around you is nothing. Most of what makes up you is nothing. And that it's only the forces that make your nothing not pass through that nothing. And as they explain this, they begin to have you breathe in a deep and comfortable way. And while you breathe deeply and comfortably, with each out-breath being longer than each in-breath, you almost have this slight light-headed feeling as you drift deeper and deeper into the experience and have this feeling of passing through the ground and then finding yourself stood inside the pyramid and your eyes are closed and you know you're in the pyramid because of the way your breathing seems to now be echoing and bouncing off the walls of the pyramid. And you open your eyes. And the guide holds their hand out. And above their hand, a pure white light appears almost like an orb of flame. And that illuminates the inside of this pyramid. And you notice how smooth the inside of this pyramid is. And you touch that smooth black stone with your fingertips. And you notice what look like hieroglyphics that you recognize as being very similar to Egyptian hieroglyphics. And as you run your fingers over them, so you can feel the way they were carved into the stone. And you have this sense of the fact you're touching something that was carved thousands of years in the past. And you don't understand it but you explore it with your fingertips. You try to make sense of it. And the guide seems to know what they're doing, where they're going. And they march off through the pyramid. Footsteps echoing, almost sounding like the footsteps are coming from behind you as they walk forward and you follow them, now with your footsteps echoing and sounding like they're coming from behind you. And then almost like a few seconds later, those footsteps seem to sound like they're coming from above you as the sound of them reaches the top of the pyramid and then echoes and bounces back down towards you. And you find this an unusual experience and a curious experience. 
and you arrive at a wall that seems to have nothing on it, just incredibly smooth, no hieroglyphics, no markings at all. And the guide pulls out a metal stick that shines and looks solid gold and they tap with that metallic tap on that black wall and then you hear the sound of rock moving and sliding and that wall slides open and you walk into this room that seems to be sparkling as if there's millions of diamonds surrounding the walls and now catching the light from the guide's hand. And beams of light reflect and dance off all of the walls and send sparkling light across the floor as that guide walks in and in the middle of this room is a plinth and on that plinth is a little black box and the guide tells you to open that box so you walk over to the box you carefully lift the lid of that box and inside that box you see a gold ring with what looks like diamonds surrounding that ring and the diamonds are just small but there's many of them making it so that with the slightest bit of light that gold ring sparkles and shines and they tell you to take that ring hold that ring in your hand wrap your fingers around that ring close your eyes And think of peace, think of comfort. And as you put that ring in your hand, close your hand round that ring, close your eyes and think of peace and comfort. So your mind begins to drift off somewhere else you suddenly have this feeling of galloping along on a white horse a white horse that's such a brilliant white it almost glows almost as if it's emitting light and this white horse is galloping through the most brilliant green meadows with a backdrop of the most beautiful blue sky, the sound of each step of that horse, the wind in your face, that feeling of powering along through this meadow, and then arriving by a lake, and you dismount by this lake and you walk to that lake you put your hand in the water feel the temperature of the lake the feeling of that water around your fingertips and you see a little island in the middle of the lake with a few trees on that island and a rowboat 
and you get into the rowboat. You push off from the shore and start heading toward that island. And as you row towards that island, you can smell the water, that fresh lake smell. Feel the breeze of the air. You can see that white horse eating some of that grass on the edge of the lake. And you arrive at that island. And as you get closer to the island, so you smell the sweetest peach smell. And you arrive at the island, push the boat a little way up the shore, climb out of that boat, walk among the trees, noticing that incredibly sweet peach smell from this island. And you see what looks like a treasure chest in the middle of the island. You open that, and inside you find a book. And you're surprised to discover that you can read this book. And that this book is a book of magic. And it describes itself as a book of natural magic. And as you read through, you notice that it's telling you ways to connect with nature, to be one with nature, to be able to access the healing power of nature and to be able to share that and channel the healing power of nature through you to others. And it talks about requiring a talisman, requiring an object, that you have on you that becomes associated with the magic, associated with your ability to carry out that magic. And while you read through this book, so you begin to hear the distant sound of songbirds chirping. You begin to feel a deep sense of serenity and comfort as you connect deeper with the world around you with the fundamental nature of nature and you're curious about this idea of a talisman and you read that the talisman is everlasting and then at the bottom of the book on the last page is just drawn a circle and lots of stars and you realize that the talisman is the ring that's the thing that's eternal that connects you with this world and you notice that the guide hasn't been around here and you take that book, you row back from the island, you mount that horse, you ride back towards the way you came, but you don't know where you're heading, because you don't know how you ended up here, but as you continue, so you suddenly find yourself back in that pyramid. But as you come to in the pyramid, you realize you have the book in your hand and the ring in your other hand. And the guide tells you they led you to where they needed to lead you. You found what you needed to find. You had to make the end of the journey yourself. And you had to discover the end of this journey for yourself. And then they close that black box. 
they tell you to think about being back up on the surface. And so you think about being back up on the surface and you find yourself back up on the surface by the ruins. And you walk back towards the beach. And then you find your way back through space from this place all the way back to Earth. You find your way to that desert. And then the guide tells you it's time to go. And you head out of that desert. Walking back to where you initially lied down. And as you sit down there, so you find yourself coming to on your car bonnet and looking up at the stars. And you're curious about the experience you just had, wondering whether it was just a dream. And as you sit up, so you notice that there's a book beside you. And you notice that there's some sand on the blanket, there's some sand on the book. And sitting right in the centre on that book is that ring. And you sit up, you pick up that ring. You try that ring on, see if it fits on your finger. You put it on one of your fingers. And then you start looking through the book. And as you look through the book, so you realize the whole experience must have happened to you. And while looking through the book, so you start to have this sense, almost like there's an energy coming out of you and connecting with the world around you. Almost like your senses heighten to those sounds of birds, to the sounds of other animals. Almost like a part of your awareness flows with the wind, twinkles with the stars. Almost like you have a bubble of awareness that spreads out from you wider and wider. And while you have this sense of your awareness spreading wider and wider, you notice fireflies flying from the forest. You watch as they dance around in the sky. And then you see one heading down towards you. And as it gets close, you notice that it's a small fairy. That tells you that you've connected with this world. And that with practice and meditation. And giving time to allow yourself to be still. You can be still and almost slide yourself into all realities where you can then travel through realities. And they explain that there is no past, no present, no future. There's just now, everywhere, is just now. And when you master this to that extent that you realize everywhere is just now, and that physical reality is stuck in a specific time, 
but reality itself is timeless. You'll be able to travel in the past, the present, the future, and through realities. And you tell this fairy that you don't believe that. Until you saw them, you didn't even believe in fairies. And they told you that when there's universe as large as this, when there are multiple universes, everything that's possible is somewhere. And that even things you think are impossible are often very possible. And they tell you they can give you an example of this connection. And they hover in front of you, just above eye level. And they say, just watch me. Keep looking at my glow. And while you look at my glow, I'm just going to count back from ten. And with each count, you can begin to drift inside deeper. Almost like making time stand still. And that with each count, your head can relax, your shoulders, your arms, your body, your chest, and your legs. All the way down through your body. Your breathing can deepen and time can stand still. And when time stands still, you can be separate from the universe, separate from this moment to access the universal now. And you can travel through time. And you can learn to do this for yourself, but for now, I'll guide you. Ten, nine, eight, deeper and deeper, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And you can notice the way the fairy's wings slow down to a halt. Notice the way the breeze stops, sound stops. The twinkling of the stars stops. Time stops. And as time stops, you're aware that despite physically you being incredibly still, as time for you physically has stopped, you're thinking mentally And you find that you start thinking about a specific time. And while you think about a specific time, so a gentle mist seems to begin forming around you. And as that mist forms, so the reality around you fades, turns white, and disappears. And then you find yourself sitting on a blanket as a child, with a teddy bear in front of you. You reach over, you pick up that teddy bear. And you realize you've traveled way back in the past. And you can feel that teddy bear, the weight of the teddy bear, the softness 
you can squidge it slightly with your fingers and thumb. You can feel its arms hanging over the tops of your hands, that slight tickling of the fur of the teddy bear. The slight weight change as its head nods backwards and forwards as you move it. That smell of the teddy bear that seems to bring such comfort to your mind. And you put that teddy bear down and you stand up and you walk around. And a puppy runs over to you wagging its tail and it jumps up and seems excited to meet you and you stroke that puppy's fur you pet that puppy you pick up a tennis ball you throw that the puppy chases after it brings it back you have this feeling of these being memories of pleasant times in the past You have a memory of sitting down, lost in thought, as a cat climbs up on your lap and it turns itself around and slumps down in your lap and you instinctively begin to stroke that cat and you can feel that gentle vibration of the cat as it purrs, you can hear that purring of the cat and feel that purring that something about the frequency of that purring seems to be transmitting some kind of healing to you helping you feel better helping you somehow ease discomfort And you almost get lost in thought with the petting of that cat. And then you find yourself having this sense of walking along a beach, walking along a shore on a beautiful sunny day. That water rolling in across your feet and then rolling back out again. Then you have a sense of walking through the woods, climbing over logs and fallen down tree trunks. Feeling the face smiling. You have this sense that you seem to be passing through memories through pleasant times but you don't feel that these are all your memories and then you find yourself drifting back you see the fairy's wings moving very slowly and then that slow movement accelerating that fairy begins to explain to you about the experience you've just had about what it means to be connected to a universal consciousness that's timeless and spaceless to help give you motivation to achieve what it is you want to achieve give you motivation to continue practicing and learning to connect with the world in a meaningful way and to appreciate the world in a meaningful way through that connection and they explain that the ring will guide you 
at any time you're lost and want to find yourself, you can just touch that ring and it'll remind you of your experiences, of your learnings. And just touching the ring on your finger can bring a deep sense of peace, of calm and comfort. Can bring a clear mind, clear thinking. And seem to slow time down and give you time to think and find the path forward. And the book will guide and educate your learning. And then that fairy disappears back off among the fireflies as they disappear off back into the forest. You set up a camp in the meadow. You relax back in a tent. You know you've got more exploring to do, more learning to do. And feeling a deep sense of peace. You snuggle up on a blanket in a sleeping bag with the smell of the inside of that tent relaxing you. That sound of the breeze on the walls of the tent helping you drift and float comfortably and relax to sleep. And you drift and float so peacefully, so comfortably asleep, knowing you'll awaken, feeling so motivated in the morning to crack on with your day, almost instinctively motivated and driven in the morning as you drift and float peacefully asleep. So as you listen to this sleep story and you begin to relax, you can just let your eyes close and allow yourself to get comfortable. And I don't know whether you'll drift deeper asleep with the sound of my voice or whether you'll drift deeper asleep with the spaces between my words. And as you begin to drift and float asleep, I'll just tell this story in the background. And you can find yourself watching TV. And you're sitting on a sofa, and TV's on in the background. And although you're watching it, you're not really paying a huge amount of attention to what's on that TV. And it's late in the evening, and the TV is just casting a glow through the room. And you can notice shadows dancing in the room from the light of that TV. You can notice that TV glow, where the volume's low you're not really paying too much attention to it. You're just relaxing back, feeling a bit tired and sleepy, relaxing back on a sofa, an incredibly comfortable sofa, feeling your back sinking comfortably into the sofa, feeling your breathing relaxing, as you just gaze into your room towards that TV. And while you gaze at that TV, not really paying attention to what's on the TV, so your mind begins to wander. And as your mind begins to wander, so your eyes begin to close. Your breathing begins to relax. 
and you begin to drift inside your mind, drifting inside your mind into a reverie, drifting, relaxing, floating deeper and deeper into your thoughts. And as you relax and float deeper into your mind, so you begin to have this sense of perhaps almost hearing cutlery, the sounds of a restaurant, and discovering yourself sat at a table across from someone you love, enjoying a meal together and noticing that it's your favourite meal, smelling the smell of that, the feel of eating that meal, of cutting the food, the weight of picking an item of food up with your fork, the feeling of putting that food in your mouth, of chewing that food, salivating, of eating that food while gazing over at the person you love, engaging in conversation with them, sometimes just listening, other times doing the talking, and throughout eating some food, and maybe having a drink with that food, and feeling the sensation of that drink as it passes down from your mouth, through your throat, towards your stomach. And the background sounds around you here, in this restaurant, that mumbling murmur of people talking, the sight of movement out the corner of your eye, of staff walking around and people moving around, the smell of the food, of your food, of the food of the person you're with, the smell of food you're not going to be eating, as staff carry it past you, and engaging in the most pleasant evening. And after the meal, yourself and the person you're with leave the restaurant. And you take a journey down to a seafront. And you walk down onto the sand on the most beautiful evening, noticing the way the footsteps change as you walk onto the sand and your feet start sinking into the sand with each step, and the way that the closer you get to the seashore, as the sand becomes more wet, so it feels different under your feet, and standing on a moonlit night with the person you love. As waves gently roll in on the shore, hearing the sound of those waves, as they lap onto the shore and roll in, and reach the shore at different points, and pull back out again to sea, noticing perhaps stars in the sky, being able to breathe in the fresh air, and enjoying being in the moment here, and perhaps the moon's out, and you can notice the way the moon lights the ocean surface and dances with the waves. A 
as you enjoy being in the moment. And then the two of you stroll in synchronization with each other along the seafront. And a little way down, just enjoying the evening, you discover a secret tunnel. And you decide that you want to explore this secret tunnel. And so the two of you walk into that secret tunnel. You illuminate the tunnel with a torch. Noticing way the light bounces around the walls. Walking deeper and deeper into this tunnel. Hearing the way your footsteps echo through the tunnel. And after a while, the tunnel curves around a corner and you continue following that tunnel. curious where it's leading you, and then you discover a ladder, you follow that ladder up and find an exit from the tunnel, and you exit the tunnel, and you realise that you're in a secret section of a nearby castle, and so the two of you begin to explore this castle. You wonder who knows about this tunnel. And you know that you've visited this castle before and have never seen this room. And you leave the room and explore along a corridor. And there's no lights on in this section of the castle. So you're just using torchlight to explore. And you find rooms with the most beautiful beds. You find rooms with the most beautiful furniture the most comfortable looking seats. And so you continue exploring. And then you find a spiral staircase. And so you ascend that spiral staircase. And at the top of the spiral staircase is a door. But this door just seems to have almost like a button to push rather than a lever to pull. And so you push on that button and the door swings open and light enters. And you realise you're in the main part of the castle now. And the two of you walk through that door, close the door behind you and realise the door just looks like a part of the bookcase. And you try and figure out how to open the door from this side. And after a little while you figure it out. You figure that you just have to partially lift one of the shelves and the door pops open. And you realise that what you've found is an entire floor of this castle that it seems no one presently knows about. That there seems to be an entire floor of this castle only accessible through this secret door and that it's probably been untouched for centuries. 
and the two of you walk around the castle a bit, and this is lit up. And you assume there's no one around in this area currently. But you know that some of the castle lights are often left on so that when people look from further away from the castle, even at night time, they can notice there's a castle there, that the window lights just help to define that something is there. And the two of you decide to go back downstairs in this castle. You go back through that secret door, close it behind you, descend the spiral staircase all the way to the bottom and start to explore the secret rooms. And the first thing you notice is that there are no windows down here, that this secret part of the castle seems to have no windows. And so that would be why no one's ever really discovered it, because unless you discovered the secret tunnel on the beach, or unless you'd accidentally triggered the secret door. There's no real way you would know that there's this level underneath the castle. Almost like a secret basement to the castle. And the two of you go into the most comfortable looking room sitting down on the most comfortable looking chair. And you reminisce and chat and enjoy each other's company, sitting in this quiet room, feeling peaceful and calm. And then without any real thought, the two of you feel so comfortable, you just begin to drift off asleep. And as you drift off asleep, so you find yourself walking through a meadow with long grass, beautiful flowers, smells of a meadow, trees dotted through the meadow, the most beautiful sky. A slight breeze catching your face, so you can breathe in and notice that slight coolness with each breath. As you walk through this meadow, feeling that grass against your legs, and then you see what looks like a rabbit hole across the meadow. And you walk towards that rabbit hole. And you go and sit down next to that rabbit hole. Curious about whether any rabbits will come in or out of that hole. But doubtful of that happening while you're sat there. And while you're sat next to that rabbit hole. You run your fingers through the grass in the meadow feeling that tickle-touch feeling of the grass on the palm of your hands and between the fingers, picking a dandelion and blowing across the top of that dandelion 
and then you think you see something just inside the rabbit hole. A slight green glow. And so you reach in. But as you reach in, so you begin to shrink. And yet with the experience you continue. And so you reach in further, and you continue to shrink further, to the point where you're the size that fits perfectly in that rabbit hole. Finding this a curious and interesting experience. And you walk into that rabbit hole. Noticing what the mud looks like on this scale. And the roots of the grass. That penetrate the walls of the rabbit hole. And your eyes seem to adapt. To the light inside the rabbit hole. And at the back of the rabbit hole. Is a very ordinary looking wooden door. The extraordinary thing about the ordinary door is that it's inside a rabbit hole. And you open that door and walk through into a light marbled room, noticing how your footsteps change as you go from walking on mud in a rabbit hole to walking on marble that echoes. And someone comes over and asks you to wipe your feet because or else you'll make this marble dirty. And they direct you to a mat and you go to the mat and you wipe your feet. And you feel that this experience is just becoming more curious. And they then say, come on, you've got to hurry. You've got somewhere to be. And they hurry you along. And someone else then comes over and says that their role is to make sure you're dressed correctly. And they measure you up, measuring your legs your waist, your shoulders, measuring you up, and then going behind a blind and coming out with some clothes they've managed to create specifically for you. And you change into those clothes, And then get asked to follow that first person again. Following them down a corridor. Through a more elaborate door. Out into a land that feels like you're in the garden of a vast palace. with highly manicured trees, shrubs, the most beautiful colours of flowers, and people dressed for a party. And you walk down the steps, following the person down those steps, from the exit down to the main garden. And you walk all the way down those steps and then out to the garden. And people greet you as if they know you. And you greet them back in kind. And head through the garden. And get told you've got to go to the grand oak tree. So you walk all the way through the garden, all the way to the back of the garden, 
to the grand oak tree you can see standing at the back of that garden. And the person walks with you to that grand oak tree. And at the oak tree, they ask you to gently run your fingers around the side of the tree. And so you gently run your fingers around the side of the tree. And a door pops open. And you walk into that door. Descend down in that tree. Deeper and deeper underground. And you find that your hand here just seems to glow and light the way. As if you're following yourself deeper into this tree. Going down deeper and deeper underground. And at the bottom of the stairs under the tree, you find another door. You pass through that door. You find yourself in a room, and in that room is a chair, and you feel compelled to go and sit and relax in that chair. So you relax down in that chair, rest your arms on the side, and allow a sense of relaxation to spread through your body. And as you sit down and relax in that chair, and you allow your eyes to close. So you begin to experience the sensation of a comfortably warm beam of light passing down from the top of your head down through your eyes, your face, your cheeks, down your neck, seeming to comfort and relax you as that light spreads down through you, relaxing the neck muscles, the shoulders, the arms, the hands, the back, the chest, Relaxing down to the stomach as the breathing becomes deeper and more relaxed. Relaxing down the legs all the way down to your feet. And then feeling so deeply relaxed. And in this relaxed state, having a sense of being in a different time and place, of opening your eyes and seeing someone sat there who explains that they're like a guide, that their job is to encourage someone through curiosity to find them here where they can communicate and let them know that they're on the right track to help them to understand what to focus on what path to take To help them to understand some of the deeper learnings in life. About how to get the most from life. And they engage in conversation through curiosity for a while before the person has a sense of closing their eyes again 
and the light fading, and then opening their eyes, will they leave that room, find their way back up to the tree, leaving the tree going through the party, finding their way through the palace, out of the rabbit hole, and they gradually find their way back, to resting on that seat in that castle, and then they find their way out of the castle, and find their way back, to the beach, through that secret tunnel, and gradually the experience fades away and you find yourself resting on a sofa in front of the TV, with the TV just lighting the room, not really paying much attention to what's on the TV, but having a curiosity about whether what's on the TV could have influence the dreams, the experience, and the curiosity about what else might influence, what kinds of thoughts you have, what kinds of experiences you have, where your mind focuses its attention without you realising, then you turn the TV off, And you go off to bed and relax down in bed and allow yourself to drift and flow to sleep, curious about the learnings you've had and how those learnings will help with each day as you drift and float and relax deeper asleep. Just take a moment to relax yourself down and close your eyes. And with your eyes closed, you can just listen along to me telling this story in the background. And as you listen along to this story in the background, I don't know whether you'll drift, sleep to the sound of my voice, or drift off to sleep to the spaces between my words. And as you begin to drift asleep, so I'll tell this story in the background. And it's a story about a young girl who's walking out into a fairground. She's visiting a fair that's down by a pier. And she walks onto that pier and can hear that fairground music, see the lights of the fairground. In the background she can hear the sounds of the waves crashing on the shore and the sun's beginning to set and as the sun sets so she notices that the lights really stand out and sometimes they seem to streak on the different rides that spin and move and she can hear that fairground music, different music from different rides. And as she walks along the pier to the fairground, she can glimpse the sea below through the slats in the pier. And she can hear the sound of her footsteps 
as she walks along, and the sounds of other people milling around, playing different fairground rides and games. And she's heading to one specific ride, a ride she goes on every time this fair's in town. And it's an old-fashioned merry-go-round. And as she walks towards that ride, so she notices that there's no one else on the ride. It's going around, the horses are going up and down, the music's playing, lights are flashing, different colours. The operator is operating that ride, and yet no one's riding it. And she goes over to where the queue should be and waits for the ride to stop. And as she gets let on, she asks why no one's riding it. And the operator explains that she's the only person really who ever turns up and rides this ride. That people want all the computer games inside. People want the Games where you can win something. People want to ram into each other on bumper cars. They want to go on roller coasters. No one wants to go on a merry-go-round anymore. And she walks around that merry-go-round to find her favourite horse. The one she sits on every year. And she climbs onto that horse. Holds on to the metal bar. And the ride begins. And moves up and down and the music plays. And she watches as the world goes by. And while she spins around on that merry-go-round, going up and down, enjoying that ride, drifting with the music, drifting into the experience, almost becoming one with the experience, she finds that there's something different this time. That while she's thinking about how no one wants to ride this ride anymore, her mind begins to wander and reality begins to change. And as she spins, so everything becomes blurry, a bit like spreading paint across a canvas and smudging that paint. And then a new reality begins to form. And she looks the other side, and she can see that all the horses around her are becoming real. And as she looks around, she notices that it's about the middle of the day, and she's trotting on a horse through woodland with other horses just following along and keeping up. And then she looks down and realises that this isn't just any old horse. She notices she's on the back of a pure white unicorn. And she can feel the warmth from the body of the unicorn. She can feel the softness of the side of its neck. And she strokes its hair, stroking its long mane, feeling that in her fingers. As they all ride, 
through the woodland. And something about the experience just feels perfectly natural to her, despite the fact that she was on a merry-go-round moments ago. And she feels like this is the place to be, like she's supposed to learn something from this experience. And as that unicorn separates from the rest of those horses and travels deeper into the woods, so it slows down to a walk. And she can hear that thudding of its footsteps, just gently on the mud, the occasional cracking of twigs. The sounds of the rustling leaves overhead as the wind blows a breeze. The occasional dancing shards of light shining down from above on the path in front of her. And she doesn't know why she's on this journey, what she's supposed to experience. She's just aware that it feels as real as it did being on the pier. It doesn't feel like something being imagined. And after a while, that unicorn finds a clearing. The unicorn stops in the clearing, drinks from a stream. The girl dismounts. And is surprised when the unicorn talks to her and explains to her that perhaps she's the one destined to bring a bit of magic back into people's lives. That people have forgotten the magic in simple things, in finding enjoyment. And she didn't know how she was going to do this. And so the unicorn asked her to sit down by a tree and to close her eyes and said that if she's willing, then they can join mine. And the unicorn can take her on a journey, a journey of discovery. And she likes this idea, thinks it sounds interesting. She sits down under the tree, closes her eyes. And the unicorn tells her to just count along, back from twenty to one. And then the minds will be connected and she'll be able to join them on that journey. And the unicorn begins to count backwards and the girl begins to count backwards following that. From twenty to 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, connecting deeper and deeper with each other, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, Six, five, four, three, two, one. And then the girl feels a sparkly lightheadedness, almost like there are stars twinkling around her, around the unicorn. And then this flash of rainbow light 
emanating out from that unicorn, encapsulating her. And even with her eyes closed, she can sense that light as it passes across her eyes, sensing the different colours. She can feel the warmth of that through her body. And then she notices her consciousness rising out of her body, travelling over and joining that unicorn. And she settles into that unicorn. She couldn't describe how she settles into the unicorn, but her consciousness settles in like going and settling in to a comfortable place, to somewhere that feels so peaceful and calming to be, somewhere that on first arrival you just think this is a nice place to visit. And the unicorn checks that she's okay. And the unicorn can do that telepathically. The unicorn just thinks it. And because they're connected, she thinks back that she is okay. And they can just communicate in that way. And then the unicorn closes its eyes, nods its head ever so slightly while focusing on a destination. And then, in a flash of rainbow light, the unicorn vanishes. And then as the unicorn opens its eyes, so it's walking through dense forest. And the girl has no idea where this is. It's nothing like the woodland they've come from. And the unicorn says that they're off to meet an old friend. They're off to meet the green fairy. And the girl had always loved the idea of fairies. So she was really excited to be able to meet a green fairy. She'd drawn green fairies before, in her school books, and when doodling at home. But she never thought she'd actually ever meet one. And the unicorn walked through that forest, the sounds of the forest around them, sounds of monkeys off in the distance, Sounds of birds the girl had never heard before. And then that unicorn found a clearing and started walking out into that clearing. And the girl was curious where this fairy would be and why this fairy would be here. And that unicorn started walking over towards a small lake. Then started walking along the edge of that lake, where the mud was slightly squelchy. And had a drink in the heat of this day. And then continued walking. towards a herd of elephants and said the green fairy's just over there and the girl was looking trying to find out where trying to catch a glimpse of this green fairy and as the unicorn neared those elephants The girl could feel the vibrations through the ground as the elephants stomped around. 
she was surprised at how large these elephants were, so much larger than the unicorn. And then something surprised her even more. One of the elephants seemed to just so lightly jump up into the air and fly. And then it landed down near the unicorn. So gracefully it barely made a sound. And the unicorn said hello to the green fairy. And the girl was confused. And then the girl noticed the tiniest wings on the back of that elephant. And the wings shimmered in the sunlight. And had multiple different colours to them, greens, purples, as they moved. And the girl was deeply confused. And the unicorn explained that the elephant's name is Green and the elephant is a fairy. And asked, were you expecting something different? And the girl said that they were expecting probably a tiny woman in a dress with wings. And the unicorn found this amusing. That this girl had obtained this rigid thinking. This one way of looking at the world. That things are as you expect. And the unicorn explained that Fairies come in many different shapes and sizes. Some are male, some are female. Some look human. Some look like elephants. Some look like cats. Fairies just look different. They're not all just one thing. And the unicorn asked the green fairy to help them to find something. And the girl didn't know what. The girl didn't know what was going to be found. But the unicorn explained that they used to actually have two horns, not one. And they used to also have wings. And that they've still maintained their ability to transcend space and time. But if they can find their horn, the missing horn, then they can help that girl to understand something, to learn and have something to take back, to be able to spread magic through the normal world. And the girl wondered whether a unicorn would be called a unicorn if it had two horns, or whether its name changed at some point. And the fairy used its trunk to hand over a tiny glass bottle with some bright blue liquid and a tiny cork in the top and said to the unicorn, if you take that, You'll be guided to your horn. 
and the unicorn, carefully with its lips, popped off the cork, drunk the blue liquid. And then after a few moments, could see some sparkling in front of it. And that sparkling worked from in front of it, off, way off into the future, way off into the distance. Travelling through space and time, creating a path to follow. And this path would be followed through different lands and different times to find that horn. And the unicorn explained that they won't be able to find it as themselves for the whole journey. Because different parts of the journey require different skills. that all they can do is now follow that path. And the unicorn thanked the green fairy. The green fairy went and joined the rest of the elephant. And that unicorn then closed its eyes, moved its head, and then travelled through space and time in a flash of rainbow colours, finding themselves in the middle of a desert. And that unicorn walked through the desert, still following that sparkling, twinkling path, heading towards a man who was sat by some ruins. And the man seemed to be resting, dozing, and trying to keep out of the sun overhead. And the unicorn quietly walked over and said to the girl, We're going to have to become him next. And so the unicorn rested down by that man and then matched the breathing of that man and then started counting back from 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, and as the unicorn counted back, so the consciousness of themselves and the girl began to move into that man. Five, four, three, two, one, and their consciousness was inside that man's head. And the man was unaware of this. They're essentially just hitching a ride. The unicorn explained that they'll just give an idea. But this man hunts for lost artefacts. And they've obviously just been here in the desert at this ruins to find something. And so the unicorn said that they'll plant the idea for their horn being a lost artefact to be found. And the man awoke, 
climbed on his motorbike and just had this compelling feeling to travel out of the desert and to travel towards some mountains and had quite a long journey to make and they enjoyed speeding over the sand dunes skidding down dunes finding their way back to the road speeding along with the wind in their hair the feeling of being on that motorbike taking turns and feeling that it's a vehicle to have a close connection with the world around you. Almost like they could feel part of the world around them through the tires touching the ground. And the mountains were so far away. This man had to stop halfway there. As night started to fall. they popped up a tent and a campfire. They made themselves some food. They could smell that food. They could notice their mouth watering from the smell of that food. And they ate the food as the sun set. And the stars shone in the sky. And they gazed up at those stars. Looking at all the different constellations. Curious about how each one got its name. And curious about the times that each one got their name. And how much or how little they've changed in those times. And then they rested back in their tent. And just listening to the gentle sounds around them. They drifted and floated comfortably asleep. And they slept well all night. And while they drifted and floated asleep, so the girl and the unicorn drifted and floated asleep. Almost like their consciousness was connected in a way that meant there was no need to be conscious while the person was sleeping. So they joined them in that sleep. And they joined them in waking up the next day. And the man had something to eat before packing away his tent. And getting back on his motorbike. And continuing his journey. And after a while he entered a small town filled up his motorbike to make the rest of that journey and then headed up towards the mountains and as he approached the foot of the mountains so he noticed the task at hand he noticed that there wasn't really much of a road and he would barely call it a track. But he enjoyed adventures, he enjoyed the thrill of riding a motorbike off-road like this. So he revved that motorbike, got it moving. The back wheel spun. 
and he shot off up that mountain. And as he went higher and higher up the mountain, so the weather got colder and colder. And then after some time, he noticed that there was snow forming, there was ice, and he realised he was going to have to make the rest of this journey on foot. And so he parked up his motorbike and continued this journey on foot. And the girl was glad that she wasn't having to do this, that she was just an observer. And the unicorn acknowledged that they're glad as well, that they wouldn't want to get their hooves up here. And for some parts of the climb, the man had to almost rock climb, had to pull himself up, get up over some large rocks. But he continued that climb. And while he climbed, so he began to notice high up there near the top of the mountain was what looked like some ruins of a building, perhaps ruins of a temple. And he continued to climb that mountain towards that temple. And to help him climb, he just focused on his breathing, focused on controlling his breathing, And he used his breathing as a way of keeping his attention on task. And as he neared the summit and neared that temple, so he noticed a kite. He could see the string going down towards the temple and the kite flying in the sky. And the kite had a symbol on it. And as he got nearer, so he noticed what looked like a monk sat on a wall that was partially overhanging the edge of the mountain with his legs crossed, looking very underdressed for the weather. and yet seeming so peaceful and calm, just gently holding the string of that kite. And he didn't know whether to go and talk to that person, but he was curious about what they were doing. And he went over and he got their attention, and he asked them what they were doing and who they were. And they explained that they're being in the moment. And they're being responsive to the moment. They're responding with the tiniest of movements to keep that kite in the air while they're letting the rest of their body deeply relax. And they're controlling the temperature of their body. They're focusing on being warm and comfortable. And they're not allowing themselves to be distracted by anything external. Until this man had arrived. And they thought that was important enough, an unusual enough an event, to take a few moments to talk with them. And this monk explained that they're the guardian of this temple. 
that people are allowed to come here, but they just watch over them. And this person, the man explained that they came here for something, that there's a treasure here to be found. And the monk said that you're not here alone. The owner of the treasure has come along to find it. And they're going to have to go through some tests. before they can have it. And the man looked around and couldn't see anyone else and didn't realise that this monk was talking to the unicorn and the girl. And the monk said, did you want to take a healing bath? You look exhausted from your travels. And the man expected the worst and thought it would probably be an ice bath somewhere up here. But the monk pointed them in the direction of what looked like the warmest, most comfortable water. And they went over to that outside bath that was just outside the entrance to the temple. And they climbed into that water. And as they climbed in, so the water started glowing bright blue. They started feeling warm and fuzzy inside. Feeling so comfortable. And they could feel that healing passing through them as that warmth passed through them. They could feel their aching muscles relaxing. They could feel the aching passing. They could feel their muscles softening, their shoulders relaxing, their neck muscles relaxing, their breathing calming and relaxing. The muscles around their eyes, their face relaxing, down their arms relaxing, the muscles through their back relaxing, and the muscles through their stomach, their legs, down to their feet, all relaxing and healing. And they relaxed back, rested their head on the side closed their eyes and found that the airways felt so clear breathing in the steam from this bath. Just enjoying that relaxing in that bath. And they quite liked that difference between the cold air on their face and the warmth of the water. And after a while they got out of that bath, quickly dried themselves off, got dressed. And then the monk said they could head into the temple. And they pushed open the large wooden door and walked into the echoey temple, hearing their footsteps echo and reverberate around the walls. And the unicorn could notice that that glowing, floating light, that sparkling light, was stronger here. And they knew they were close to finding what they've came for. And then the monk explained, while looking at that man, but talking through that man, 
that you're going to have to do some challenges first. And the man said they didn't understand what challenges. And the monk said, not you. But you, you have to do those challenges. And the man was confused. And the monk explained to the man to go and sit down in a chair, to close their eyes. And they sat down in the chair, closed their eyes. And the monk said, just focus on the sound of the bell. And then that monk tapped a bell. And that bell reverberated and rang with a deep reverberation that seemed to pass through the body of that man. And as that man focused on that reverberating bell, he almost felt like he could see the sound wave, just as he could feel those sound waves. He almost felt like he was riding those sound waves deeper into an experience. And the monk wanted that man to follow those sound waves deep into an experience. So that the unicorn could do what they need to do. And as that man relaxed deep, and further away from that conscious part of their mind. So the unicorn was able to communicate freely with the monk. And despite being magic, the unicorn was still surprised that this monk seemed to know they were there, that this monk seemed to be able to communicate with them, because the monk didn't seem like they were from a magic realm. They didn't seem to be magic like the unicorn, like the fairy. And they explained that they stand between worlds, that they're able to communicate with beings from multiple realms, and can communicate with any of those beings here in whatever form they take. That they've raised their consciousness up enough to be able to connect on multiple levels like that and to see more to reality than people realise is there. And so the unicorn wonders what their task is. And they're told that all they have to do is enter a room and then follow their nose. And so as a consciousness, looking just like some floating light, the unicorn drifts out that man's body, out of their mind, and floats into another room. And as this floating light in this other room, they notice that the room has diamonds all around the walls, and that light is shining in to this room and reflecting off all those diamonds, creating an almost lattice work, rainbow pattern throughout the room. And the unicorns told that they have to follow the rainbow. And so they start to absorb themselves into that light. And they start to follow that rainbow around the room, from one diamond to another. 
And as they do that, so the room turns dark. With just rainbow lights, no walls, nothing solid. And then they discover themselves, almost as if they're in space, flying among the constellations. flying from one star to another. And they have to find their constellation. And they know what constellation that is. And so they just have to explore space. And in their mind they're trying to work out what it looks like from Earth. Because in space it's all in 3D. And that out here, when you don't have the same perspective, the constellations look different. And so they realize they have to find Earth to find the constellation. And so they follow rainbow light. Searching for the right star. And there are so many stars to search. They begin to feel a sense of frustration. And they know it's unusual for them to feel a sense of frustration. But they also know that that's part of this challenge. That they wouldn't have to undergo a challenge if it was easy. And they've seen the night sky so often from Earth. They try and work out which stars they know are nearer to Earth. And try and triangulate and figure out a way to the planet. And after some time they eventually find their way they notice that it isn't so much about what you can see, but what you can hear. And they can hear which star is the one to head toward. But they can only hear that when they get nearer to that star. And as a consciousness they head in to the solar system. They pass Pluto, Neptune, Uranus. And they head in, eventually passing Saturn, Jupiter. And then seeing the most beautiful dot in the sky. Just a pale blue dot hanging there in the blackness of space. And they head towards that pale blue dot. And then as a consciousness they turn and look up and can see their constellation. And they fly themselves up in line with that constellation from that perspective. And then find themselves back in that room. And then the monk enters. And says this man can now take. What's in that chest. And the unicorn travels back to that man, re-enters that man psychically, and the man awakens, feeling so calm and comfortable, like they've had the most pleasant sleep. And the monk shows them into the room, and says, is this 
what you were looking for. And the man opens the chest and sees a glowing horn inside that chest. And the man picks that up and can feel it almost pulsating energy in their hand. They put it into their backpack. They thank the monk for letting them take it. And the monk explains that they've been looking after it for thousands of years. Until the right person came along. And the man then travels back down that mountain, down to their motorbike, and heads back off on their motorbike. And part way along their journey, they pull over at a town. They decide to sleep in a comfortable bed. And so they go to the bed. They relax in the bed and they drift off asleep. But as they drift off asleep, so the consciousness of the unicorn and the girl leave that man. The unicorn goes over to the horn. And the horn seems to disappear and sparkle out of existence as it merges with that consciousness of the unicorn. And then the unicorn and the girl find the way back to the unicorn's body. And as they absorb back into the unicorn's body, the unicorn sparkles and shines and shimmers. Light emanates brightly from all over the body of that unicorn. As a second smaller horn appears on the unicorn's head. And the most beautiful wings emerge from the side of the unicorn's body near the top of its back. And the girl has a sense of this happening, but from inside the unicorn can't see it. And the unicorn explains that they're back looking how they used to look before they had their second horn removed. And the girl wants to see So the unicorn closes its eyes, lowers its head, moves its head, and in a flash of light, the unicorn finds its way back to that woodland, to where that girl is resting under that tree. And her consciousness goes over and back into herself there. And she opens her eyes. And she can see that unicorn. Standing there looking so tall and graceful. With the most beautiful wings. The most pure white. Almost glowing look to them. And the unicorn explains that they're Pegasus. And that now they're back as they're meant to be. And the girl climbs onto the back of Pegasus. As Pegasus rides up into the air. And she can hear the flapping of Pegasus' wings. She can look down on the woodland, on a stream, down to a small lake. 
and Pegasus swoops around, lands back down so gently, so perfectly, and trots back into that woodland, and trots back through the wood. And the girl notices that even when Pegasus goes through muddy areas, the mud just doesn't stick. Pegasus just remains so pure and white. And then Pegasus exits the woodland and finds those other horses. And they all begin to trot back the direction they came. And as they trot back in the direction they came, so the girl begins to hear the funfair music, feel the metal pole she's holding, and almost like a painting, being smudged, the experience begins to fade away and smudge away, and she begins to see that fairground, seeing the flashing lights, people on other rides, playing at the different games. And then that merry-go-round comes to a halt. She climbs off of it and heads around and the operator says, you seem to have almost zoned out a bit there. Are you okay? And she says that she's fine. And she walks away from that ride a little bit lost in thought, curious about the experience, wondering what had just happened. And then she leaves that fairground, leaves the pier, begins to head home. And as she heads home, so she puts her hand into her pocket and is surprised to find that there's something in there. And then she takes her hand out of her pocket, taking out that item. She notices that it's an origami unicorn and written on the side of that origami unicorn are the words spread a little magic. And then on the other side is just the name Pegasus. And she holds that tightly in her hand. She feels some tears in her eyes of happiness, of that connection with that experience, with whatever has just happened. And she knows that she's going to go through life, trying to spread a little happiness, trying to spread some magic, and bring some joy to people. And when she gets home, her parents ask how the fair is. And she says it's okay, and heads up to bed. She gets into bed and begins to drift and flow to sleep. And as she drifts and floats asleep, so she begins to dream about the experience. She has this sense of riding 
on Pegasus, on flying over the roofs, on sprinkling a rainbow of magic, a rainbow of light across her hometown. And then expanding that out. And she starts to think how she can begin to spread some magic to those around you. And she drifts and floats so comfortably and relaxed. Asleep, knowing she's going to sleep so well and wake feeling so refreshed in the morning, and she drifts and falls asleep. So just take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to relax, so I'm just going to tell the sleep meditation in the background. And I don't know whether you'll drift asleep faster to the sound of my voice or whether it'll be to the spaces between my words. And as you continue to drift asleep, you can listen along to this meditation in the background. And it's a meditation about a couple who are celebrating their 25 year wedding anniversary and as a celebration they'd always wanted to go on a train journey and the train journey takes them through mountains it takes them through long open plains and it takes them all the way to a distant coast they've always wanted to make this long train journey. And the train that the journey is on is a special train. It's one of the rare times that a steam train makes this journey. And so for the journey they can hear the chk 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 of the steam train. They can hear the whistle as the steam train heads into tunnels, cutting through mountains, as the steam train passes by different spaces and stations. They can smell that smoke as it pumps along the side of the carriages. And the carriages are done up nicely with lace net curtains over the windows, with a table between the seats where they can enjoy fine dining. And those making this journey get their own section of carriage to sleep in, like their own little compartment. And this couple set off from an ordinary station and have a sense of excitement, of wonder of what the journey is going to entail. And as that train gets going, so they look out the window and they can see the landscape changing. They can see distant mountains getting closer and closer feeling the rocking of that train on the track as it accelerates. They sit and drink a cup of tea with each other, sharing that experience. And as they begin to head to the mountains, so that train begins to ascend and pass through tunnels through the mountains, those tunnels getting longer and longer. And they can look down over grasslands and meadows, they can see deer 
and other animals down there. They can see bird of prey flying in the sky, hovering overhead. Noticing the way the sun glistens on the snowy mountains and shimmers on the grass in the fields. And this journey doesn't pull in to very many stations. Most of it is traveling through scenery, just enjoying the views with set meals at certain times. And by the end of the first day, as the sun is setting, so that train is now traveling around the outsides of a large mountain range. As they look out the window, they can see the sunset in one direction and the twinkling stars appearing in the other direction. As they continue to head towards those twinkling stars, so the sun sinks further behind the horizon. And after a while, they decide to settle down for the night. And so they head back to their cabin. They snuggle up in the bed and in a loving embrace they drift and flow to sleep. And while they drift asleep, one of them begins to dream. He dreams about his wedding day, dreams about looking out over the wedding venue, seeing all of his friends and family, seeing all of his partner's friends and family. And then that emotional moment where he sees his partner walking down the aisle, his dad walking along with him, walking him to the front, standing side by side, and having that moment where it's almost like no one else was there, but the two of them, as they looked into each other's eyes and spoke about devoting their lives to each other, And he was dreaming about how now, 25 years later, he still as devoted to his husband as he was back then. And that they're on this long train journey, this dream journey they've saved every year. They've saved a little every year with the dream that on their 25th anniversary they'll be able to have afforded to make this journey. And as he's dreaming that, so he wakes up just ever so slightly, hugs his husband tighter, snuggles up a little bit more, feels the warmth of his body, notices his husband just grab hold of his hand slightly while being hugged and then drifts comfortably and deeply asleep. And the next morning they awaken. They take a look at where they're at now. They can see that They've moved well on through the night, that they're now out into a more hilly area, just at the edge of the mountain range, where everything outside the windows is greener, where if they look back towards the mountains, they can see the white tops of those mountains, 
but generally everything's greener and lush. That there appears to be a lot of water around here, probably rains a lot. And they head through to the main carriage. They have themselves some breakfast. They talk about how well they slept, the pleasant dreams that they'd had. They wished each other a happy anniversary. They looked forward to the rest of this day. And the train was due to stop at a station later on in the day. And while the train is stopped and being restocked with food and refueled and having more water put on the train, they get a chance to go and stretch their legs and explore. And the train will be in the station for six hours before they continue their journey. And after a while, the train arrives at the station, pulls into that station, and the couple get off the train, stretch their legs on the platform, feeling the warmth of the air here, surprised how warm it is, when just five or six hours earlier they could see mountains. And as they go and explore the surrounding area, They walk into an area of tall grass. And while they're walking through this area of tall grass, they suddenly hear this loud boom, followed by a second boom. And they have this sense that they just saw something like a flash of light across the sky. And then they feel a shockwave pushed them back onto the grass. They can see that wave travel across the grass and travel through the trees. And as they sit up in the grass, they look around themselves to try and see what it was. And they notice this silver object hovering in the distance. And then in a blink of an eye, it appeared somewhere else, having disappeared where it was. And in a blink of an eye, it was somewhere else. And then in another blink of an eye, it was virtually over the top of them, lowering itself down into the tall grass. And they were surprised at how silent this giant silver object was as it settled down into that grass. And they watched as the side of it opened. And out walked some short and thin aliens that were barely taller than the grass. They watched as those aliens walked out into the grass, seemed to be looking at objects in their hands. And they explored the grass, seeming to scan the surroundings, before getting back on to that ship, door closing behind them, and in a blink, that ship shot off again. And they didn't know what to think about this. The couple was silent for a while, not looking at each other, not talking to each other, just staring at the location of what they had just seen. And then after a little while, they turned to each other and they began talking about how incredible that was, how no one would believe them, how they never managed to get a camera out 
get their mobile phones out, to take any photos. They were so shocked and stunned, they couldn't move. They just watched. And then one of them noticed that about four hours had passed. And that somehow time had disappeared. It didn't feel like more than a couple of seconds when those aliens came out of the ship, scanned and looked around, got back on the ship and left. And yet they could see on their watches that four hours had passed and they had to rush to get back to their train. So they rushed back to their train, boarded that train. And as the train set off, continued that journey, they talked about this alien encounter. They tried to wonder where the four hours went, how that time could have disappeared. And one of them said that they would try hypnosis, see if they can use hypnosis to uncover what happened during that period of time. And so one of them leaned over, lifted up their partner's arm, started touching gently on that arm, told their partner to gaze at the back of their hand. And as you gaze at the back of your hand, I'm going to just tap gently on the arm. And as I do, that arm can just float there relaxed in space, and while that arm relaxes and floats in space, you can drift deeper and more comfortably into the experience, but don't let that arm begin to lower down any faster than you drift back to that moment in the field. You drift back to that moment in the tall grass, And as the arm began to lower down, so they began to drift back in their mind to that moment in the tall grass. And as their arm reached the table and relaxed down, they were asked, so where are you? I'm in the tall grass, they responded. When are you at? We've just arrived in the tall grass. We've just heard the loud booms. We've just watched that craft dart unimaginably fast from place to place. And now it's landing in front of us. And tell me, slowly and gently, what happens next? The aliens have come out of their craft. They're scanning around. A purple pulse of light has come from the scanner they're using and passed us by. And my eyes flicker slightly as that purple pulse of light reaches me. And I'm walking towards the aliens, and you're walking along with me. And the aliens are watching us head to them. And the aliens guide us onto the ship. And I can see the inside of the ship. And the aliens scan us with different items. And they measure us. They seem to weigh us. They take a close look at us. They wipe something on our skin. As if to be gathering a bit of our dead skin.
And they're doing this just slowly, gently. They seem to be so calm and relaxed around us. And we are stood there so calmly, so relaxed. And now they're showing us off the craft. They're showing us back out to where we were in the grass. And I can see a slight hazy purple outline in the two locations that we were in the grass. And those aliens seem to put us back just into those purple outlines. And then they head back to their place. And they press a button and that purple light begins to fade. And just as the purple light fades back to their scanners, they press a button on the scanner. And then they turn and they head back into the craft and it shoots off. And the person realises that more happened in that time that felt like a few seconds than they'd realised. And they brought their partner out of hypnosis. And the partner and themselves talked about that experience. The partner now with a memory of the whole experience. Shared what had happened. Being inquisitive about what they might have been after. Fascinated and excited by the experience they had just had. And so fascinated and so excited that much of the rest of the day's journey was missed through them talking to each other about encountering aliens. And as they went to bed that night, they settled down, fell asleep, slept incredibly well, knowing that this is the best 25 year anniversary present that you could possibly have. Not only getting this train trip, they'd saved 25 years for, but also meeting aliens and having an encounter that very few others will have had, and knowing that this is something that your partner knows, and so you can share this with each other, and you know that you believe each other, that you've got this shared experience, but knowing that it's something that will be just your experience, no one else would believe you, and so you've always got this experience that's just yours, that's private to the two of them. And the next day they continue on their journey. And the train stops again for another six hour stopover. And they head out into a sparse open space. They can see deer in the distance, and they take some photos, they have this feeling almost like they're on a safari, taking photos of deer, taking photos of wild horses, taking photos of bird of prey circling overhead. Before boarding the train again for the last leg, and the train travels along, they sleep overnight, one more night. The next day, arriving at the coast. And as they arrive at the coast, then they disembark the train, they head to their luxury hotel. They've booked as part of this journey. And they'll be following that train journey back 
the next day. And they enjoy their time in the hotel. They enjoy going and exploring this town. They enjoy a walk along the seafront at night, seeing the moon over the sea way it glistens and sparkles almost magically on the tips of the waves. And listening to those waves lapping onto the shore. Before heading back to the hotel, settling down for the night. Knowing they've got their journey home to look forward to. And the next day they wake up and they set off on their journey home. They enjoy their journey back, stopping at those same places on the way home. Only this time they had no alien encounter. And the timings were slightly different. And so this time they got to enjoy more of the mountains. They got to enjoy more of the bits that they passed through at night time before, that this time they were passing through at daytime. And at the end of their journey, they made their way back home. They relaxed down, they looked at the photographs they'd taken, they laughed, they reminisced, they hugged while watching video clips and photos. And they celebrated their 25 year anniversary and said they look forward to 25 more years and seeing what they get up to on their 50th anniversary. And that night, they went to bed, settled down in bed and drifted and floated so peacefully and comfortably asleep, having had the experience of a lifetime And while dreaming and relaxing about that experience and all that it entailed, they drifted and floated so deeply asleep, knowing that that experience and the peace and calm that it's brought and the feelings of love will seep into each coming day, bringing a smile to their face as they go about their daily business. And they drift and float so peacefully and comfortably asleep. Just take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to Begin to relax. And as you begin to comfortably drift asleep, I don't know whether you'll drift asleep faster to the sound of my words, or whether it'll be to the spaces between my words. And while you begin to drift comfortably asleep, I'm just going to tell a story in the background. And it's a story about a woman who lives in a really nice country house and she's sitting in her back garden admiring the views down that garden drinking a drink feeling the warmth of the sun on her face and just feeling a sense of peace calm and relaxation and she's watching as the bees flying in and out of the 
roses on the trellis at the back of the garden. The kind of arches around a path. She watches as butterflies land on the flowers down the side of the garden and admires the different types of butterflies. And she can see the colourful birds landing in trees, singing so beautifully. And the way all the plants just gently sway in the breeze. And as she just sits and watches, she starts gazing up towards the sky noticing whether there's any clouds up there, thinking about how some clouds can look like different shapes, different animals, and sometimes it's the spaces between the clouds that create the shapes or animals. And as she gazes at the sky, so she begins to feel herself relaxing even deeper, listening to the songbirds, feeling the slightest breeze on her cheeks, and that warmth of the sun, and the wafts of the smell from the flowers. And while relaxing deeper and deeper into the experience, she lets her eyes gently close. And as her eyes gently close, so she has this feeling of drifting out of her body and beginning to float up into the sky. And she can see her house down there. And she feels so light and free and feels a sense of peace and calm. And that pleasant floating feeling, almost like lying on your back in water and floating on your back where you can see above you and you feel weightless and relaxed. She notices how her breathing is slowing and relaxing. And as she continues to float higher and higher and further and further from her home, she sees off in the distance a larger cloud and she begins to get closer and closer to that larger cloud that looks almost like a giant crumpled up ball of cotton wool that looks so soft or a crumpled up ball of silk. And as she gets nearer and nearer, she realises there's the most perfectly white palace on this cloud. And she lands on that cloud so easily and effortlessly, landing on her feet. and walks along that soft cloud with each footstep barely making a sound and the cloud comfortably resisting her feet like walking on a lawn with short grass but there's just a little bit of resistance 
a little bit of sponginess. But at the same time, there's a certain firmness to that ground. But unlike a lawn, there's almost no sound from each footstep. And she walks toward the palace. And as she nears that palace, so she notices a road or a path beginning to form in front of her. That looks like it's made out of pure white stone. But as she walks on it, she notices that it feels more like it's somehow a condensed version of the cloud. And she follows that path. And finds her way to a bridge. And notices that it's a drawbridge. And that drawbridge gets lowered over what looks like a sparkling silver river flowing across the cloud. And she walks across that bridge, noticing a slight clippity-clop of her feet on the wood before carrying on to an almost noiseless steps the other side. And she heads up and into the palace, knocking on the door of the palace, opening that door, feeling invited as she walks in being aware of how light and airy the palace seems. As light shines in through stained glass windows, illuminating areas of the floor with the most beautiful colours, and other windows higher up, shining pure white light down into the space below. And then mirrors around different pillars and in different locations, reflecting that light around and spreading that light out, reflecting onto the white walls then having it reflecting off the white walls, softening that light, creating the most beautiful glow inside this palace. And she walks through the enormous hallway area, thinking to herself how this one space would be large enough to use like a ballroom. And she heads through another door, into another chamber. And this chamber is far more cosy. Unlike the section she just came from, where the floor looked like marble, but barely made a sound. This floor looks almost like it's carpeted. And although it also barely makes a sound, the slight sound that it does make has a duller tone to it. And that dull tone barely echoes within this room. And she notices that around the walls of the room, 
enormous numbers of books stacked higher than you could reach all around those walls. And sitting at the far end of the room in an armchair is what looks like a princess reading a book. And she doesn't look up, doesn't flinch, doesn't acknowledge that you've entered the room, as if she's totally engrossed in that book, and just turning those pages. And as the woman walks towards her, so she begins to get curious about what this book must be that's so absorbing. And just as she's almost upon this princess, the princess closes the book, puts it down beside her, and looks up, and then gestures to the comfortable seat behind her. And the woman sits down in that comfortable seat, almost feeling like she's sitting down deeper than she sat down before, as if somehow there was some kind of magical property to this comfortable seat. And the princess starts talking to her, and telling her that she's going to go on a journey. She's going to go on a bit of an adventure of discovery. And that there's something she's going to learn from this. Something she'll gain inside herself. But there's something that she needs to take with her. And the princess stands up, walks over to the bookshelves, slides a ladder along the bookshelves, climbs up that ladder all the way to the top, grabs a small box, climbs back down again, moves that ladder back over again, and sits back down, lifting the lid of the box revealing a pocket watch. And she pops open that pocket watch. And as she does, the woman can hear the ticking from the pocket watch. And she gl glances over at that pocket watch. and notices that it seems to be keeping good time. And on the inside of the lid is the most beautiful gold that looks so pristine and carved into that is an elaborate pattern of shapes that are all interlocking and behind the hands of that pocket watch she can see the cogs moving and behind the cogs she can notice the way the light seems to be reflecting off that back deep inside the watch and then back out again as if somehow there's depth to this watch like there's more back there than she realises and the princess tells her that this watch will stop and when the watch stops, the time that it stops at is the time she needs to know. 
so she needs to keep an eye on this watch, check it regularly. And the stop the and the watch will continue once that time comes around at the right time. And that'll let her know that that moment is the right time. And there'll be a sense of connection. And the woman's a little confused by this. She feels it's a little vague. But she gets handed that pocket watch. She feels the weight of that in her hand. She closes the lid. And the princess doesn't give her the box. She just closes that box, puts it down beside her. And the woman puts that pocket watch into her pocket. And the princess ushers her to leave. And so she finds her way back through the palace. Back out of that palace. Back over that bridge. walks along the cloud and with just a simple thought she floats up from that cloud and begins to float and drift back down towards herself and as she does she gazes back and she can see a sheet of rain gently falling from that cloud and recognises that the location it's falling out the bottom of the cloud is in line with that river that seemed to be passing across in front of the palace. And she wonders whether that river has a leak in the bottom of it somehow. And she floats down towards herself, arrives back at her property, drifts inside herself, and then feels herself move a little bit and drift back in that garden. And as she drifts back in that garden, she wonders whether that was just a dream and then she fills her pocket, puts her hand in her pocket, and discovers that pocket watch. And she thinks that that's an unusual experience to have had, wondering how it could even be possible. And yet the pocket watch proves that she had had that experience. And after having another drink and relaxing in this garden, while the sun is beginning to set, she decides to walk inside her house a moment to think about what this all means. And she sits inside and to keep comfortable inside. She sits by her fire. Because although it's warm during the day, she's aware it gets cooler at night. And while sitting by the fire, her cat Pickles jumps up on her lap, curls around, and then slumps down on her lap. And she gently strokes Pickles on its back, behind its ear. And with each stroke she notices that purring. And can feel the purring through her hand. 
and something about pickles lying there purring, and the sensation of the weight of pickles resting there brings a sense of peace, of calmness and comfort to her, almost as if somehow the purring of pickles slows her breathing, helps her muscles relax. And helps her just drift and float peacefully with the experience. And she's aware that she's going to go out for the evening. She wants to begin to just drive around and try and work out what this all means. And she feels that if she can drive around a little bit, maybe it'll make sense. And with pickles on her lap, she looks at that pocket watch. She opens the pocket watch. She can hear it ticking away. And she closes that pocket watch, puts pickles down on the ground, and decides to go out for a drive for a little bit, to see if anything will stimulate her mind and give her an idea of what this all means. And she gets into a farm truck, that belongs to a neighbour of hers that lets her drive it around this area and she drives across the fields she drives over the muddy tracks she drives all the way to a distant lake many miles from her home, parks up the truck, and from in the truck she gazes out the windscreen over the lake, watches as the moon rises in the sky, the way that full moon illuminates the water. like dancing splinters of silver on the water. She leaves the truck, closes that door behind her, walks down to the water's edge, and sits by the water's edge, just resting her feet into that cool water. And as she rests there, gazing up at the sky, hearing that incredibly gentle lapping on the shore, that slight tickling around her legs as that water rolls in and out, looking as the finest clouds pass in front of the moon, creating a rainbow in the sky from the moonlight. Noticing the twinkling of those stars, the occasional shooting star. She takes out that pocket watch, flips open the lid, And to try and see the time, she tilts the watch towards the moon. And as she does, she notices a rainbow jump out of the watch. And split apart and shine up in the sky. 
and she realises somewhere deep inside that watch is some kind of a prism that seems so sensitive that it's able to take that moonlight and as well as splitting it into the colours of the rainbow it seems to be able to amplify that light and as she moves her hand she notices that rainbow disappear and then she moves her hand back and notices it appear again Then she looks at where that rainbow's going at where that multicoloured light seems to be reflecting she wonders if this has anything to do with what's supposed to happen and as she looks at the hands she sees that the different hands are passing through different colours and that the lights seem to be colouring the different parts of the internal part of this watch with those different colours and then she notices that the two hands stop and the ticking stops and she looks at what that time is and she looks at the colours that the hands are shining through and she shakes that watch a little bit to see if it'll start that ticking again she puts it to her ear can't hear any ticking so she clicks that lid shut and she has this strangest sense, almost like she just shut a lid on a rainbow. As if perhaps, as long as she doesn't open it and look, that that rainbow will be trapped in there and exists. But she worries that if she pops it open, that bit of rainbow she's trapped, will escape and be gone forever and so she keeps that pocket watch closed puts it in her pocket can hear the occasional noise of the evening animals and then decides to go back to the truck and make her journey back home again and once home she goes to bed drifts off asleep still wondering what this all means she now has a time and she knows something will happen at that time but she doesn't know when that time will happen she knows she just has to look out for a time that that clock starts ticking again and she goes to bed and she begins to comfortably drift asleep in bed and she can hear the gentle ticking of a clock in her room as she relaxes and drifts asleep And the next morning, she wakes up early. She has some breakfast. And she's planning on going to the beach. But it's a long drive to the beach. So she gathers herself up some food, a packed lunch for the journey says goodbye to Pickles 
and watches as Pickles initially seems interested. And she thinks, oh, Pickles is going to miss me. Before Pickles jumps up in her chair, turns around, slumps down, rests its head on its paws, and seems to just fall asleep where it is. And she closes the front door and starts her drive to the beach. And as she drives to the beach, so the sun begins to rise. And she looks at the colours of the sky, and how those colours change as her journey continues. And after many hours she stops off, at a meadow on the way, sits in that meadow, eats her packed lunch, enjoys watching the wildlife around her, and then continues her journey to that beach. And at the beach, she takes her shoes off, walks along the most beautiful white sand and can feel that sand through her toes noticing the way her feet sink into the sand by the water and the way the sand tickles her feet when she's walking away from the water in that dry and dusty sand And she can hear that water gently lapping and rolling onto the shore and then rolling back out to sea. And while walking along, she sees a rowboat and she decides to take that rowboat out to an island a little way offshore. And when she makes this trip, she quite likes rowing out, or perhaps even sometimes swimming out to the island, because most people don't go to that kind of effort. And so it's always deserted. It's always a place of peace and calm, somewhere that she can gather her thoughts. And so she rows out towards that island, arrives at the island, climbs out of the boat, drags it up just onto the shore, and then sits down under the most beautiful palm trees that were just enough shelter from the sun so that she could relax and just take in the environment listening to the way the water rolls onto the shore hearing the sound of leaves moving in the breeze 